Introduction of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pete Milan. Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre Introduction Those who have read Ashton Kirk, Investigator, will recall references to several affairs in which the United States government found the investigator's unusual powers of inestimable service. In such matters, tremendous interests often stand dangerously balanced, and the most delicate touch is required if they are not to be sent toppling. As Ashton Kirk has said, when a crisis arises between two of the giant modern nations, with their vast armies, their swift fleets, their dreadful engines of war, the hands which control their affairs must be steady, secret, and sure. Otherwise, an unthinkable horror might be brought about. It frequently happens that such a crisis arises, the issue is joined and fought out to the bitter end, and the watchful public press never gets even a hint of it. Indeed, if the secret archives of the nations were thrown open for inspection, a long series of appalling dangers would be shown to have been passed by each, dangers arising from small and apparently remote things, but capable of swift and deadly growth. Experience, steady courage, and sure talent are required in dealing with such things. And these qualities Ashton Kirk possesses in abundance. To be sure, the departments of the government have the secret service at their hand, but the specialist is called in when the general practitioner is at a loss, and he is as much a part of the structure as his regularly employed colleague. The adventure of the present story is only one of many to be told of Ashton Kirk. End of Introduction Chapter One of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter One Some Peculiar Circumstances. Fuller studied the heavy, decided signature at the bottom of the typed page. Then he laid the letter upon the table. One who judges character by handwriting, said he, would probably think the secretary a strong man. Ashton Kirk took the stem of the long German pipe from between his lips. From your tone, said he, you do not so consider him. Fuller was looking down at the letter. With that looking me in the face, how can I? Here is a matter of tremendous importance. One of the most guarded secrets of the government is endangered. Yesterday, in what was undoubtedly a panic, he wired you begging help. Then, almost immediately after, he weakens and writes, requesting you to do nothing. Thick clouds arose from the Koblenz. The smoker snuggled down into the big chair luxuriously. And from these things, said he, you draw that he lacks force? Yes. He quit before even catching a glimpse of the end. There was a moment's silence. And then 
the secret agent spoke. There are times, remarked he, when it is not altogether desirable to catch that glimpse. He blew out a veil of smoke and watched it idly for a moment. It is possible in pushing a thing to the end, he added, to force an entirely unexpected result. Take, for example, the case of the Molyneux chaplet, some little time since. Could there have been more fire, more determination, than that exhibited by old Colonel Molyneux in this room when he brought the matter to our attention? And yet, when I showed him that his own daughter was the thief, he instantly subsided. Fuller regarded his employer with questioning eyes. You think, then, that someone concerned in the government has been found out as... But the other stopped him. Sometimes, said he, we are even more anxious to spare an enemy than a friend. And the reason usually is that we do not care to force the said enemy into such a position that his only resource would be... An open blow. Ah! Fuller's eyes widened. They hesitate because they fear to bring about a war. He looked at the secret agent, the question in his face growing. But with whom? Ashton Kirk put aside the pipe and got up. For years, said he, the specialists of the Navy Department have been secretly working upon a gun designed to throw a tremendous explosive. That it was delicate work was shown by the quality of the men employed upon it, and that it was dangerous was proven by the lives lost from time to time in the experiments. Six months ago, the invention was completed. The news leaked out, and naturally the powers were interested. Then, to the dismay of the heads of the department, it was learned that a most formidable plan to obtain possession of the secret had been balked by the merest chance. The agents of the government were at once put to work. Not satisfied with this, the secretary wired me to come to Washington at once. But I was in no haste to do so, because I foresaw what would happen. The questioning look in Fuller's eyes increased. I knew that the agents of a foreign government laid the plan, proceeded Ashton Kirk. Who else would desire information upon such a point? And at this time, there is but one government sufficiently interested in us to go so far. You mean... Ashton Kirk yawned widely, and then asked, Have you seen the morning papers? Yes. Perhaps you noticed a speech by Crosby, the Californian, in Congress. Rather a slashing affair. He continues to demand a permanent fleet for the Pacific, and increased coast defenses. The windows were open. The high-pitched complaint from the mean street drifted up and into the room. A bar of sunlight shot between two uprearing brick bulks across the way. It glittered among the racks of polished instruments, slipped along the shelves of books, and entered at the door of the laboratory. Here the very-colored chemicals sparkled in their round-bellied prisons. The grotesque retorts gleamed in swollen satisfaction. A knock came upon the door, and Stumpf, Ashton Kirk's grave-faced manservant, entered with a card. It is the gentleman who called yesterday while you were out, said Stumpf. The secret agent took the card and read, Mr. Philip Warwick. He asked me to say, proceeded Stumpf, that his business is urgent and important. Let him come up. 
Stumpf went out. Fuller began fingering a packet of documents which he took from the table. I suppose, said he, that I may as well file these Schofield Dempster papers away. Yes, the matter is finished, so far as we are concerned. It was interesting at first, but I'm rather glad to be rid of it. The piquancy of the situation was lost when the forgeries were found to have been no forgeries at all. And the family despair is a trifle trying. Mr. Philip Vorvik, said the low voice of Stumpf, a few moments later. A big, square-shouldered young man entered the room. He had thick, light-colored hair and wide-open blue eyes. That he was an Englishman was unmistakable. For a moment, he seemed in doubt as to whom he should address. But Fuller indicated his employer, and the caller bowed his thanks. Sir, said he, if I am intruding, I ask your pardon. I was directed to you by Professor Hutchinson of Hampton College, with whom I have become acquainted through our mutual interest in the Oriental languages. Ah, yes. Hutchinson is a very old friend of mine, a splendid fellow, and a fine judge of tobacco. Will you sit down? Thank you. Mr. Philip Warwick sat down and looked very big and strong and ill at ease. There was a perplexed expression upon his handsome face, but he said, quietly enough, I take this occasion, Mr. Ashton Kirk, to express my appreciation of your book upon the Lithuanian language. I spent some years in the Baltic provinces, and am fairly familiar with the tongue. Ashton Kirk smiled, well pleased. A number of people have been good enough to notice that little book, said he. Though when I wrote it, I did not expect it to get beyond my own circle. You see, the Lithuanians have grown rather thick in this section of the city and the great similarity between their language and the Sanskrit interested me. The work, said the young Englishman, is very complete. But, and his voice lowered a trifle, much as I am delighted with it, that is not why I have ventured to call upon you. No? The secret agent settled himself in the big chair, his singular eyes studied the visitor with interest. Fuller, having finished with the papers at the table, now asked, Will you need me? Perhaps. The assistant thereupon sat down, took out a pencil, and laid a pad of paper upon his knee. Philip Warwick shifted uneasily in his chair. His powerful fingers clasped and unclasped, nervously. Professor Hutchinson informs me, said he, that you take an interest in those problems which spring up unexpectedly and confound the inexperienced. Have I been correctly informed? The secret agent nodded. Am I to understand that you have brought me such a problem? He asked. The visitor bent forward a trifle. Perhaps, he said, it will prove no problem to you. It may be to some extent that our imaginations have been playing tricks upon us. But however that may be, the whole matter is utterly beyond our comprehension. I have done what I can to get to the bottom of it, and failed. If you will be kind enough to hear and advise me, I shall be profoundly grateful. Ashton Kirk gestured for him to go on. The affair, began the young Englishman, is not my own, but that of my employer, Dr. Simon Morse. He caught the look in the eyes of the secret agent, and added, No doubt you have heard of him. His theories attracted wide attention some time ago. I recall him very well, said Ashton Kirk. 
a sort of scientific anarchist, if I'm not mistaken. He had many daring ideas and considerable hardihood in their expression. Any sort of government, human or divine, has in him an outspoken enemy, said Warwick. I know him to be a man of great learning and splendid ability, but somewhere in his brain there is a something which nullifies it all. You say the matter regarding which you came to see me is that of Dr. Morse. Did he ask you to come? No, no. Young Warwick held up his hand hastily. He knows nothing of it, and I much prefer that he should not. You see, he is a man of peculiar temperament. He is very silent and secretive regarding his private affairs. Also, he has, dryly, a somewhat violent temper. You picture a rather unpleasant character. But I do him no injustice, protested the young Englishman. Frankly, he is not at all my sort, and I should not remain with him a day, were it not for Stella, Miss Corbin. I see. She is his niece, the only child of a younger sister, and the things which I am about to relate have caused her much alarm. She fears that some strange danger threatens him. He has always been kind to her, and she is very much attached to him. Dr. Morse is an Englishman and a graduate in medicine. But, having large means, has given but little time to the practice of his profession. As his published works have shown, he detests all governments. However, that of Russia has always been his pet aversion. He has declared it the most corrupt system extant, and maintained that not a patriotic pulse was to be found among the ruling class throughout the vast empire. Its mighty army, he predicted, would crumble before the first determined foe. When the war broke out between Japan and Russia, Dr. Morse at once placed his niece in safe hands. Then he disappeared for more than a year. Upon his return, it was learned that he had, somehow, managed to have himself enrolled upon the medical staff of the Russian army, and had witnessed most of the operations in Manchuria. Though he came back rather worn, and with a slow healing wound, he seemed much elated. I now have the direct proof which I desired, he said. The Muscovite army reeks with chicanery, and the book that I am going to write will set the whole world talking. But before beginning the book, he determined to have a long rest. He took a fine old house, just outside Sharsdale, in Kent. And with him were his niece, and an old French woman servant who had been in the family for many years. They lived very snugly there for some three months. Then... There began a most singular train of incidents. Of these I have but a slight personal knowledge, for, as I have said, Dr. Morse is a secretive man. But, little by little, Stella and I gathered up the fragments and put them together. The result was rather an alarming whole. Odd happenings became of daily occurrence. A peculiar, nameless something seemed hovering about the place, a vague agency was felt in the commonest things. The household began to live in the expectation of some indefinite calamity. Pardon me. You were at Sharsdale at the time, I take it. Yes, stopping at the village inn. My excuse was that I was doing some sketching, but, with great simplicity, as a matter of fact, I was there in order to be near Stella Corbin. I see. Please go on. Gradually we came to know, from the doctor's manner more than anything else, that he fancied himself watched. Indeed, more than once I personally noted traces of what I can call mysterious visitations, and twice within as many months the house was broken into and ransacked from top to bottom. A moment ago, said Ashton Kirk, you spoke of odd happenings. Just what were the nature of these? 
What I consider the first, answered Warwick, was the visit of Karkowski. He drove up one morning in a high-seated pony cart, a round-bellied, fresh-faced, smiling little man, with eyes that stared as innocently as a child's. He seemed in most urgent haste, gave his name, said that he was a Pole, and gave as his business that of confidential adviser, in those delicate matters which one hesitates to bring to the attention of a solicitor. I was with Dr. Morse at the time, and I recall that Karkowski's manner was most important, and his time apparently of much value. But, queerly enough, his methods were singularly futile. They led in no particular direction. Several times Morse hinted concerning the nature of his errand, but he avoided the subject. Finally he arose, and I fancy that he wore a disappointed look. And upon taking his leave, gave the doctor his card bearing a London address, and begged that he be communicated with should his services ever be needed. On the night following this visit, Dr. Morse dined with me at the inn. Stella was away from home, and the old Frenchwoman was with her. About nine o'clock, I walked with the doctor to his garden gate. Just as we were saying good night, we noticed a dim light shine in his study window. As we stood surprisedly watching, it disappeared. A moment later, however, it returned, a faint, fluttering sort of light, which maintained itself with difficulty. Again it disappeared, and once more returned. And then we understood. Someone was lighting his way about the room with matches. At first we thought it must be Stella returned unexpectedly, but instantly we knew that this could not be, for she would have turned on the lights had she had occasion to visit the room. We entered and softly ascended the stairs, but all was dark and still. We searched everywhere, but found no one. A week later, Stella and the servant having returned, they all awoke one morning some hours later than usual. The bedrooms were heavy with the fumes of a drug. Locks had been broken, chests, desks, and cupboards had been opened, and their contents strewed the floors. But, strange to say, nothing had been stolen. Two nights after this, Dr. Morse was struck down in a lane. He was found by some workmen and brought home. Of this incident he refused to speak, other than that he had not been robbed. Stella now became frightened. At night she saw shadows flitting in the garden. That these were not fancies was proven by the strange footprints which I found in the soft mold. The dog died of poison. Another was procured, a savage, crafty creature, but she went the way of the first. One day, and at broad noon, the doctor arose from his desk and went into an adjoining room for a book. He was not gone above a minute, but upon returning he found a loaded revolver lying upon the tablet upon which he had been writing. This apparently drove him frantic, for he seized the weapon and rushed through the house. But there was no one save Stella and old Nanon. Then, once again, they were drugged, and the house ransacked. But this time the attention of the intruders seemed directed toward Dr. Morse's papers only. They showed every indication of having been exhaustively examined. But nothing was missing. As these things continued, the tension began to tell. The face of Stella's uncle became drawn, and his eyes quick and feverish. At the least sound he would start and it became almost as much as one's life was worth to approach him from behind. Then, suddenly, and secretly, he made up his mind to come to America. At the last moment he made me an offer to accompany them as his secretary. "'The work upon my proposed book will be heavy,' he said, "'and I shall require aid.' Here young Warwick nodded and smiled. Nothing could have fallen in better with my desires than this, he said. 
And so, of course, I accepted the proposal. This was three years ago. At first we occupied apartments in the city here, but some five months back Dr. Morse took a house on Fordham Road, Eastbury, and there the work upon the book, the idea of which had greatly expanded, went on without a halt. But, and the young man gestured oddly, after the fashion of one curiously impressed, Though the doctor had crossed the sea, he had not traveled beyond the reach of his mysterious persecutor. The happenings at Eastbury are every bit as queer as those at Sharsdale, and they began in the same way. As the doctor and I sat working in the library one day, a taxicab stopped, and Karkowski, as cheerful, red-cheeked, and comfortable as before, alighted. And, as before, he seemed in great haste. Apparently, Dr. Morse had never marked, as I had done, Karkowski's first visit as the beginning of his strange troubles. At any rate, he showed no resentment, but merely seemed surprised at so unexpected a visitor. The Pole talked volubly about the new country and of his prospects. The delicate matters, so he said, which it was his business to handle, were vastly greater in number in America and I noted that he kept to this point, no matter what unexpected turn was given the conversation. He always came back to it. And all the time he kept his eyes fixed eagerly upon the doctor. But at the end of a half hour he arose. Again I sensed that he was disappointed, but he said nothing, merely handing my employer another card and begging that he be summoned any time his services were needed. Then he took his departure. It was next morning that I entered the library rather quietly, and found Dr. Morse with a heap of mail before him. In his hand he held a square of white paper at which he looked fixedly. Upon this was a roughly drawn device done in brown crayon. I could make nothing of it. When he discovered me looking over his shoulder, he uttered an impatient exclamation, tore the sheet into strips, and tossed them into the waste-basket. That same day I opened some mail matter, as was my habit when the doctor was not about. And in one of the envelopes, I came upon a duplicate of the drawing that I had seen in my employer's hands. When I handed this to him a little later, I fancied that I caught a gleam of the old haunted look which I had so often noted at Sharsdale. "'Have you by any chance one of these drawings?' asked Ashton Kirk. "'I have.' Philip Warwick took out a wallet, and from it selected a paper. "'It is the third that came, and in every respect, like the other two. The secret agent looked at the paper carefully. It bore a rough, hurried tracing done with a brown material, and looked much like this, a white rectangle with a shaded square on either end. Attentively, Ashton Kirk examined the drawing, but if it bore any meaning for him, he gave no indication of it. For placing the paper upon the table, he said, Go on. As I had suspected upon sight of Karkowski, resumed Warwick, the persecution of Dr. Morse was resumed, but, so it seemed, the matter had entered into a new phase. There was no more mysterious prowling, waylaying, and housebreaking. The mail only was used. But, so far as I know, duplicates of this drawing, pointing to the one which the secret agent had just laid down, were the only things sent up to yesterday. The outline of the thing never varied, but, oddly enough, the color has. Ah. At first the design was always in brown. Then, finally, one came in light blue, and for a space they were all of that color. The next change was to black, then to red, and finally to white, drawn upon neutral tinted paper. But yesterday, 
And once more the young Englishman opened the wallet and took out a paper. This came. Ashton Kirk took the sheet and glanced at it. In the same brown material that had been used in making the other drawing, he found the picture of a woman. Apparently meant to represent a person of some consequence, he said. There is a sort of tiara or coronet upon the head. He laid the drawing upon the table with the other. Was there never any accompanying writing with these? None that I ever heard of. Have you any of the envelopes in which they came? No. Ashton Kirk arose and took a few turns up and down the long room. Then, pausing at a stand, he opened a case of heavy-looking cigars, one of which he offered Warwick. Thank you, no, said the young man. The secret agent, however, selected one, lighted it, and resumed his pacing. That is about all I can tell you, said Warwick. And now, if you can offer any explanation of it all, I beg that you do so. I shall be perfectly frank and say that I am not greatly interested in the matter beyond natural curiosity. But... And here the strong fingers began to intertwine once more. Miss Corbin is filled with fear, and it is for her sake that I appeal to you. Ashton Kirk shot a quick look at him. Your personal regard for Dr. Morris's possible safety is not very great, then. I wish him no harm. But there is no warm feeling between us. If you knew him, you would understand the reason for this readily enough. He paused for a moment, and then went on. Perhaps, he said, the matter, as I said it before you, seems absurd. But to Miss Corbin, it is a continuous menace, a thing which throws its shadow across her uncle's daily path. To her, it is impossible that what has happened and is happening has not a deep significance. The apparent resolution behind it inspires her with awe. It is her firm conviction that if something is not done soon, unspeakable things will happen. Ashton Kirk paused by the table. The smoke from the heavy cigar curled pungently upward. What address did Mr. Karkowski's card bear? He inquired. It is in the Polish section, Corinth Avenue and 4th Street. Do you know whether Dr. Morse has called upon him? I do not. But I am inclined to think that he has not done so. However, I have taken it upon myself to pay the man a visit. He lodges upon a third floor, over a harness-maker, and when I entered he received me eagerly and with delight. But when I began to question him, he grew enraged and ordered me from the place. You have never repeated the visit? No. The secret agent drew softly upon the cigar. Its spicy aroma filled the room. Coming into personal contact, so to speak, with this matter, said he, it is but natural to suppose that you have formed some opinion as to the cause of it. The young Englishman nodded. Yes, he said, I have. It is my opinion that the Russian government is behind it all. They have heard of the proposed book. But Ashton Kirk shook his head. The Russian government, smiled he, is charged with a great number of things, and the foundations of most of them are as light as this. According to your story, Dr. Morse's papers were once examined very minutely. Were the notes for the book among them? Yes. That, then, places Russia outside the probabilities. If that government had been sufficiently interested in Morse to have done the housebreaking, rest assured that the notes, if considered harmful, would have disappeared. I have thought of that, 
said Warwick. But, with a shake of the head, St. Petersburg being denied me, I am at a loss. There are two common causes for most things of a criminal nature, said Ashton Kirk. These are robbery and revenge. The fact that nothing is known to have been stolen in either of the nightly visits to the house at Sharsdale seems to eliminate the first of these. And that Morse was twice drugged and once waylaid and still not seriously injured does away with the other. It would seem to. There was another pause. The secret agent regarded Warwick intently. Think carefully before answering the question I am now about to ask. What is there in the doctor's possession that you have seen, or have even heard hinted at, that is in any way remarkable or unique? Warwick pondered, but finally shook his head. Take your time, think deliberately. What does he own that would excite the cupidity of persons of much power and great wealth? I know of nothing, replied the young man. It would scarcely be a thing to be measured by a money value, encouraged the secret agent. It might be, and the fact that the doctor's papers were once searched seems to indicate it rather strongly, a document. Again, Warwick shook his head. As I have said, Morse is not of a confiding nature. He keeps his affairs to himself. Ashton Kirk laid his half-burned cigar upon a bronze shell. And as he did so, his eyes fell once more upon the drawing of the crowned woman. A sudden tightening about his mouth showed a fresh interest. Taking up the drawing, he examined it with eager attention. At length, he said, Previous to the first visit of Karkowski at Sharsdale, Morse had never experienced any of the things of which you told me? No. You are sure of this? Positive. Old Nanon would have been sure to have heard of them. She has been with him since he was a child. You have mentioned that Dr. Morse is possessed of means. Did he inherit this, or did he accumulate it himself? He inherited it from his father. Have you ever heard anything uncommon of the father, any of the sort of things which you have just mentioned? No. According to Nanon, he was an extraordinarily gentle and simple-minded man. Has Dr. Morse ever traveled in the East? In Egypt and the Holy Lands, when a young man, seeking material for his anti-religious lectures, then, of course, there was the war in Manchuria. Have you ever heard him express any opinion as to Orientals? Only that they were intelligent and in many ways capable. The Japanese he only came within musket shot of, but, with a smile, he thinks them very competent fighters. Ashton Kirk joined in the smile. A remarkable race, he said, and one of whom the last word has not yet been spoken. Here Warwick arose, and Ashton Kirk pressed the bell for Stumpf. This, said the secret agent, promises to be a very interesting matter, and, it so happens, one that falls in with my inclinations at this time. You will undertake it, then, eagerly. With pleasure. Stumpf held open the door, that the caller might depart. In behalf of Miss Corbin, said Warwick earnestly, I thank you. He hesitated a moment, and then said, Before making a definite start in the matter, I suppose it will be necessary for you to visit us at Eastbury. I confess that rather puzzles me. You see, I would not have Dr. Morse... Rest easy as to that, Ashton Kirk assured him. We need tell him nothing. 
When will you come? Tonight. Philip Warwick smiled. You are prompt, said he. But Miss Corbin will be delighted. And with that, he took his departure. End of chapter one. Chapter Two of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent, by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter Two Ashton Kirk Goes to Eastbury. Ashton Kirk turned to Fuller. Read what you have taken down, he directed. Fuller did so, and while he read, the secret agent stood by the window, listening. When the assistant finished, the other did not speak. He remained gazing down at the shabby hordes which eddied and murmured in the street. There was a strange look upon the keen, dark face of the watcher. The eyes were full of singular speculation. At last he spoke. Queer things come out of the East, he said. Even these people below, who have merely lived upon the western fringe of the Orient, are tinged with its mystery. Every now and then, an occidental eye gets a flash of something among them, for which we have no explanation. I have felt that frequently, said Fuller, but never gave much thought to it. Orientals, somehow, have always impressed me uncomfortably. They seem, so to put it, to have something in reserve. It is as though they had a trick or two up their sleeves, which they have never shown us. Ashton Kirk nodded. A strange and interesting people, said he. He crossed to the bookshelves and took down a thin folio. Placing it upon the table, he began to rapidly turn the leaves. A series of Japanese prints fluttered before Fuller's eyes. There are numberless things which are held as marking the line of division between the races of the East and West, remarked Ashton Kirk. But, with a smile, I have an idea that food and the cooking thereof have more to do with it than anything else. The mental and physical differences are the results of this. And in nothing does the Japanese, for example, show the result of his nourishment, as in the matter of art. His hand in a drawing is unmistakable. He closed the volume of prints, and from a stand took a telephone book and opened it at Eastbury. This was a boom suburb, and as yet had no great population. Down the list of subscribers ran the inquiring finger. At length it paused, and a slight hissing intake of the breath told of a discovery. Good, said he. Tossing the book to Fuller, he added, Find Dr. Morse's number in Fordham Road. While the deft fingers of his assistant ran through the pages, Ashton Kirk turned to a sort of rack, Throwing open one of the huge rolls which it contained, he displayed a section of a marvelously complete map of the city and suburbs. It was done by hand, and in variously colored inks. Every street, avenue, court, and alley were clearly traced. Each house and number was microscopically set down. This map was the growth of years. Each month, 
it was altered in some small way as the city expanded. The care taken with it was the same as that which a business house gave its ledgers. Again, the long, inquiring finger began to move. Ah, Fordham Road is the first street east of Berkeley. Dr. Morse's address is 2979, said Fuller, looking up from the directory. The same block, cried Ashton Kirk, his finger searching among the lines. Then he burst into a laugh and allowed the spring to whisk the map out of view. Their houses stand back to back, said he. Fuller's expression indicated curiosity, but he had been with Ashton Kirk a number of years and had grown to know that his utterances were not always meant to be heard. The secret agent took up a bit of brown rice paper and a bulging pinch of tobacco. As he delicately manipulated these, he said to Fuller, Do you recall the name of Okiu? It seems familiar replied the assistant after a moment's thought then suddenly wasn't he one of look in the cabinet said ashton kirk fuller went to the filing system and pulled open the drawer marked okay after a search of a few moments he turned yes said he eagerly here he is, and underscored in red. The details are in Volume X. Ashton Kirk touched one of a row of bells. A buzzer made reply. Through a tube, the secret agent said, Bring up Volume X at once. He threw himself into the big chair, stretched his legs contentedly, and drew at the cigarette. In a little while, Stumpf entered, bearing a huge canvas-covered book. This he laid upon a small table, which he then pushed toward his employer. The latter looked at his watch. I'm not to be disturbed again today, said he, and I'll dine earlier, at five o'clock. Anything more? asked Fuller, when Stumpf had left the room. Look up the train stopping at Eastbury after seven o'clock, and stand ready to go with me. I may need you. Fuller went out, and Ashton Kirk, with a cloud of blue smoke hovering about his head, opened the canvas-covered volume, found the name he sought, and at once plunged into the finely written pages. The minutes went by, and the hours followed. Cigar succeeded cigarette, and pipe followed cigar. The table became littered with burnt matches, ash, and impossibly short ends. When Stumpf finally knocked to announce dinner, he found tottering mountains of books maps, and newspaper cuttings everywhere. And in the midst of them was the investigator, lying back in his chair with closed eyes, the only indication that he was awake being that a thin column of smoke was ascending from the pipe. At 7.20 that evening, a local paused at Eastbury Station, and among those who got off, were Ashton Kirk and the brisk-looking Fuller. The station lamps were lighted, but were pale as yet, for deep splashes of reddish gold piled high on the horizon line, and long, shaking lines of light shot down the sparsely built streets. Fordham Road was one of the newest of these latter, its asphalted length showed hardly a trace of travel, and its grating was as level as that of a billiard table. The buildings were even fewer here than elsewhere in the suburb, 
and upon the vacant spaces huge signs reared themselves, announcing the sale of choice sites. Number 2979 was a brick and brownstone house with a wide veranda and a smooth lawn which ran all around it. Skirting the lawn was a hedge fence, and a cemented path led to the front door. A tall, angular old woman opened this in answer to the ring. Her eyes were sharp and gray. Her face was severe, crossed and recrossed by a thousand minute wrinkles. Her hands were large, and the veins were blue and swollen. Is Mr. Warwick at home? asked Ashton Kirk. The sharp gray eyes seemed to become partly veiled. The thin lips only moved a trifle when she spoke. You would see him? Ashton Kirk nodded, and as the old woman admitted them, he said, You are not English, then? For an instant, she seemed to bristle with indignation. Her eyes, wide open now, snapped. English? No. I am a Frenchwoman, thank God. She showed them into a somberly furnished, but spotlessly kept sitting room. A single window overlooked that portion of the lawn which lay behind the house. If you will sit down, she said, I will speak to Mr. Warwick. Ashton Kirk, whose first glance had been through the window, said, You have Japanese for neighbors, I see. The woman's eyes also went to the window. There was a long, narrow stretch of lawn between the house and the one behind it, and this was divided in the center by a hedge fence. Upon the opposite side of the ladder, engaged in uprooting the encroaching weeds, was a small, dark man with spectacles and grayish hair. At sight of him, the old woman made a gesture of aversion. The good God hates all pagans, she said resolutely, and went out. The secret agent smiled. I think I should have known her for a zealot even without that he said. The type is perfectly expressed in her. She has no love for the Japs at all events, said Fuller, as he went to the window. The man clipping the hedge, said Ashton Kirk, is a member of the household of whom Warwick neglected to speak. Fuller looked at the person indicated. He was upon the Morse side of the fence, and wielded a huge pair of shears diligently. In spite of the mildness of the evening, he had a heavy coat buttoned to the chin. Near him frolicked a small terrier. He may be a gardener called in to do the trimming, suggested the assistant. I think we'll find that he belongs here, said Ashton Kirk. That is a Scottish terrier running about there. And that breed is never friendly with strangers. There was a piano being played somewhere in the house. The touch was sure and soft, the air mournful and full of minors. They had listened but a moment, however, when Warwick entered the room. There was a flush in his cheeks and an excited sparkle in his eyes. As he spoke, his voice shook a little, as though not perfectly under control. Thank you, he said eagerly, as he shook hands. I am glad that you have come. Something has happened. Yes, a special delivery letter came for Dr. Morse about an hour ago. A few moments after receiving it, I heard him shouting aloud in the library, and apparently smashing things in his rage. Did you go to him? No. When he is that way, we have found it a better plan to leave him alone. 
After venting his rage in the way I have just mentioned, he rushed from the place. Ashton Kirk did not immediately comment upon this. His eyes were upon the man clipping the hedge. Who is that? asked he. Warwick followed his glance. Oh, a young fellow whom the doctor employs about the place. He is a Pole, and came about a month ago. He seems very intelligent, and I know he is hard up. Morse knew his father somewhere, I believe. I see. The speaker turned from the window. You were saying that Dr. Morse rushed from the house in a passion. Yes, and I went at once into the library. Upon his desk I found this, which was, more than likely, the cause of the outburst. He handed Ashton Kirk a sheet of paper. In the center was a cross, the only peculiarity of which was that the downstroke was red, and the other was blue. This the secret agent inspected with interest. I believe you said that he cried aloud in the library. Did you catch any words? No, but Miss Corbin did. She told me that... Wait! Ashton Kirk halted him. I would like to speak to Miss Corbin personally. Ah, yes, I suppose it would be best. Warwick left the room. Instantly, Ashton Kirk was at the window, and after a glance, he laughed softly. Fuller, said he, if you saw a man weeding a garden, and another man clipping a hedge nearby, and if you noticed that they gradually and almost imperceptibly worked toward each other, what should you think? Fuller looked out at the two stooping figures. The terrier had stopped his capering and lay gnawing one of the cuttings from the hedge, which he held between his paws. They are nearer to each other, said Fuller. And look, they never exchange a glance. It seems to me, in the low, rapid tone of one to whom an idea has just occurred, that they desire to speak to each other but would rather not be observed. Before the secret agent could reply to this, Warwick re-entered, and with him was a girl. She was slight and dark, and dressed in white. Her most remarkable feature was her eyes. They were big and black and wonderful. Her manner was hushed and fearful. Her voice, when she spoke, was sunk almost to a whisper. Philip tells me that you are a very gifted man, she said, after Warwick had spoken the words of presentation. He says that hidden things are plain to you. I do not understand how or why this is, but nevertheless, I am glad that you have come. And I only hope... Here, one of the slim, white hands trembled upon his sleeve. That you have come in time. I think, said Ashton Kirk, quietly, that you had better make an effort to control yourself. You are cold with fear. It is necessary that you answer a few questions. So try and calm yourself, even if only for that reason. I can't. I can't. She made a despairing sort of gesture, the great eyes filled with a thrilling terror. How can I be calm when I read such things in his face? One hand was upon the arm of the secret agent, the other upon that of young Warwick. She looked first at one and then the other. Death is near to him, she said. It is very near to him. No, no, cried the young Englishman. I tell you, yes, 
and perhaps it is even nearer than I dream. It may be upon the very threshold. My dear girl, cried Warwick, have you been blind, Philip? she asked in the same whispering voice as before. Have you been blind that you have not seen? But no, her tone changing tenderly. It is not to be expected of you. He has not been a father to you. No, said Warwick, and somehow a second meaning seemed to lurk behind the words. He has not. The girl turned to Ashton Kirk. Never, she said, has anyone been better or kinder than Dr. Morse has been to me. Everything that I have, I owe to him. And so can you wonder that I have been quick to see? Quick to see what? The fear, she answered, the fear which has gradually taken possession of him. You have seen some of it, to Warwick, but not all. It is terror of the unseen, of the unknown. It is fear of a danger which he does not understand. You think, then, that Dr. Morse does not know the meaning of these grotesque messages which he has been receiving? I know that he does not. I have always known it, but just how I cannot say. This evening, upon opening the letter, he rushed out of the library. I happened to be passing the hall, and heard him cry out, Be plain. Who are you? What do you want? Is that all you heard? Yes, for with the last word he threw open the front door and was gone. Ashton Kirk glanced at the two-colored cross. Perhaps, said he, if we could find the envelope which this came in, it would tell us something. Will you come into the library? said Warwick. As they were moving toward the door, Ashton Kirk whispered a few quick words to Fuller. The latter nodded and took a seat by the window, partly screened by a hanging, and apparently much interested in the lawn. The library was a large, high-ceilinged room, darkly paneled and with a smoothly polished floor. The chairs were massive oak affairs, and there were two huge flat-topped desks. The bookcases were stuffed with serious, well-handled tomes. At one side was a highboy, the many drawers of which were furnished with glass knobs. Upon the top of this was a large English traveling bag, the strap of which was tightly buckled. From the floor near one of the desks, Warwick picked up a torn envelope. That is what the paper came in, said he. I know because it was I who handed it to him. Postmarked at three o'clock this afternoon at the central station, said Ashton Kirk. And the address was written on a typewriter. He threw the envelope upon the desk. We'll learn nothing from that, except perhaps that the sender is one who understands the value of keeping hidden. Just then, a door was heard to open and close heavily. At the sound, Ashton Kirk noted the girl go swiftly to Warwick's side and whisper something hurriedly. No, said he, and there was just a trace of sharpness in his tone. Of course not. Quick steps were heard in the hall. Then a man entered the room. Uncle said Stella Corbin. She went to him and put an arm about him, but his feverishly burning eyes singled out the stranger. It is a friend of Philip's, Mr. Ashton Kirk. He has been kind enough to visit us. There was a disagreeable smile about the thin lips of Dr. Morse, as he said, Kind indeed. 
We are charmed. Then to Warwick he added, It is not everyone, my dear Philip, who has the power of attracting friends. Dr. Morse was a tall man, with high, narrow shoulders and a long, pasty white face. There were deep, sour-looking lines about his mouth. The short black hair stood up on his head like bristles. To attract friends, said the secret agent, is rather an enviable knack. It denotes a perfect nature, I have no doubt, replied Dr. Morse, still with the disagreeable smile. And if such a knack exists, said Ashton Kirk, evenly, it argues the existence of a counter-condition, don't you think, in some others, that of attracting enemies. For a moment, there was a dead silence in the room. A look of consternation appeared in the face of the young Englishman. Dr. Moore smoothed back his short, stiff hair and sat down. The smile was still present, but his red-lidded eyes were narrowed in a way that was not at all pleasant. Perhaps you are right. Things are usually balanced in some such way. We all have our enemies, he added. I have read somewhere that the fewer the personal foes, the weaker the man. And since we must have them in order to prove our personality, with a laugh that sounded peculiarly unnatural, why, we can consider ourselves fortunate if they but stand out where we can see them. Your business-like enemy seldom fights in the open, commented Ashton Kirk, with the air of a man merely making talk. Our American politicians could teach you that fact. The physician nodded. The ambuscade is effective, he agreed. I learned its use in the Russo-Japanese War. So, the secret agent's brows went up. You served in that war, then? What regiment? The 47th Infantry. Siberians. It is peculiar how things come about, smiled Ashton Kirk. While waiting for Warwick, I noticed that the house in your rear is occupied by Japanese. Rather close quarters for old opponents, is it not? The Japanese, spoke Dr. Morse, were the opponents of Russia. I see. You are on good terms with your neighbors, then. No. They have been there almost as long as I have been here. But I have never spoken to one of them. Just then there came a tap upon the door. The old servant woman entered, but at the sight of those present she halted. I beg your pardon, Simon, she said to Morse. I did not know you were engaged. He looked at her coldly. Well, Nanon, said he, what is it now? Out again? There is no service at your church tonight. There was a jeer in his voice, but the old French woman paid no attention to it. That she addressed him by his first name indicated that she felt no sense of inferiority. Indeed, as Ashton Kirk regarded her, he detected a look of contempt upon her severe face. No, she answered. There is no service tonight, as you know very well. I came to speak of the Revenov. A peculiar look came into the eyes of the secret agent. It was as though he were groping about for something hidden away in his memory. Then, like a flash, recollection seemed to come. Well, what of him? asked Dr. Morse. He is no better. Even now, while he clips the hedges, he shakes with cold. Again he burns. The physician gestured impatiently. Arising, he went to a small cabinet, 
and took out a jar partly filled with whitish pills. While he was so engaged, Warwick whispered to Ashton Kirk, Don't wonder at Nanon's manner. You know I told you she'd been in the family for years, before the doctor was born. He has the bad taste to sneer at her religion, and I really think that she considers him somehow evilly possessed. It's a sort of truce between them. Dr. Morse placed some of the pellets in an envelope, upon which he scrawled some lines. Tell him to take these, he said, handing them to the old woman. The directions are on the envelope. I hope it is nothing serious, said his niece. He needs some quinine, that is all, returned the physician. Old Nanon moved toward the door. Her withered, large-veined right hand hung at her side. Ashton Kirk noted her dart a sidelong glance toward Morse. Then the bony forefinger made a rapid sign of the cross between them. And so the door closed behind her. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 3 An International Affair. Next morning, Ashton Kirk's car was drawn up at his door. In the hall, the secret agent pulled on a pair of gloves. At his side stood the alert Fuller. "'You carried out my instructions?' asked the former. "'Yes,' answered Fuller. "'I telegraphed the secretary that you would reach Washington by 11.40 and would call upon him at once. "'You urged him that the matter was possibly one of much importance. "'Yes,' The secret agent turned to Stumpf, who stood at the front door. "'Have Dixon meet every Washington train after dark,' said he. "'We shall be on one or the other of them.' Stumpf threw open the hall door, and then that of the car. The soft throb of the engine changed to a startled snort, and then the huge vehicle glided away. A little later, the two men sat facing each other upon the heavy limited. Ashton Kirk turned the pages of a magazine. For a time, Fuller was silent and thoughtful. But at length he said, Do you know, I don't just understand those two fellows behind the house last evening. The Jap, you know, and the one who acted as though he were cold. What are we to make of men who edge toward each other, apparently bent on some sort of a secret communication, and then, when they get within speaking distance, work away doggedly and at last depart without exchanging a word? You are quite sure that there was no message dropped across the hedge, or stuck among its branches? Positive. I did not take my eyes off them for a moment and later I made it my business to go out and look. That they exchanged signals is scarcely possible, unless they were remarkably ingenious ones. And then, had they desired to signal, they could have done so at a distance. It would have been unnecessary for them to risk attracting attention by drawing so closely together. Ashton Kirk did not reply and after another period spent in cogitation, Fuller spoke again. The feeling which you have spoken of as existing between old Nanon and her employer is rather queer, isn't it? Somewhat. But that she should remain with him, even accompany him to a new country, and all the time hate or fear him, is perplexing. Ashton Kirk nodded his eyes half-closed. Yes, 
he said. It is rather so. But, and he opened his eyes, don't forget that this woman is, by her trace of accent, a Breton, and the peasantry of that section have very rigorous notions as to duty. They must have, if she's born with his quips and sneers all these years. I can see very readily what Warwick meant when he said you'd not wonder at his lack of interest in Dr. Morse if you knew the man. When Warwick came into the room where you were awaiting him last evening, did you notice anything in his manner? He did seem rather agitated, now that I think of it. His face was flushed, and his voice trembled a bit, just as though he had been quarreling with someone. Again, the secret agent nodded. But with whom? said he. Not Miss Corbin, I feel sure, and scarcely the old servant woman. You think it was with Dr. Morse? Eagerly. I don't know. But when Morse was heard entering the house, the girl whispered something to Warwick, rather pleadingly, I thought, and he brusquely denied having any intention of doing whatever it was that she spoke of. Hmph, huh, said Fuller. After some hours, the train drew into the station at Washington. At once, they took a taxicab and whirled to a government building. Ashton Kirk was shown through a spacious suite and into a room where a handsome white-haired gentleman sat at a huge mahogany desk. "'It was kind of you, Mr. Secretary, to put yourself out,' said the secret agent. The white-haired gentleman arose and shook his hand cordially. "'I have had such telegrams from you before,' he said and they have never failed to be followed by matters of some interest. Ashton Kirk sat down. The secretary pushed a box of long, loosely wrapped cigars toward him. They are Puerto Ricos, said he. You may fancy their flavor. For a little time after lighting the cigars, they sat in silence, watching the smoke drift and enjoying the aroma. Then. Ashton Kirk spoke. Yesterday, said he, my attention was called to a rather interesting train of circumstances. If you class it as interesting, said the statesman, there is nothing more to be said. I recall several matters which you handled in a somewhat bored fashion, and yet to me they were in many ways really amazing. That is, perhaps, because you held on to the point of view of the spectator. There is a broad element of drama in most things of this sort, and as a looker-on, this appealed to you. But this present affair, leaning a trifle forward, may have a greatly increased interest for you, for the indications are that it will lead directly to your department." The secretary knocked a narrow rim of ash from his cigar. He examined the red end carefully, and then said, Indeed? All countries have had their secrets, said Ashton Kirk, after a pause. Some never see the light. Others are only made known after centuries. If the hidden archives of the nations were thrown open to the world, history, perhaps, would have to be rewritten. Of course, with a wave of one long finger, some governments have more of these state secrets than others. The Italian republics probably were in the lead. The United States, I should place almost last. You are very good, smiled the secretary. But still, we have some. Even in a democracy, it is not possible to make public all the details of government. Things are handed from one administration to another, which must await the time of ripening and fulfillment. The secretary smoked quietly, but he said nothing. These matters, continued Ashton Kirk, are not, of course, to be disclosed. They are scarcely to be hinted at. But the case which I bring to your attention perhaps involves a delicate point of international relationship. 
If my reasoning holds, I do not require you to make any admissions. That you consider the affair important and worth following out will be enough. Go on, said the official. Ashton Kirk reflected for a moment. Then, with a smile, he said, Don't be alarmed if I date the beginning of my story back quite a bit. I merely desire to glance at one or two facts which I consider of some importance. Then I will come as swiftly as I may to the present. There was another pause, but in a moment he resumed. Have you ever noticed that there are individuals who, without any great intimacy, seem to cherish a steady regard for each other? There are families which do the same thing, and there are nations. Now I'm going to take a running view of such a friendship between two countries. When George III was puzzled as to how he should put down the rebellion of England's American colonies in the year 1775, he turned to Russia and tried to borrow an army. Catherine was then Empress of Russia, and her answer to the request was a most biting one. And George growled that she was a barbarian and contented himself with Hessians and Brunswickers. When the Second War of Independence began, John Quincy Adams was United States Minister at St. Petersburg, and to him the Tsar expressed the keenest regrets. And he did not stop at this. Through his representative, Dashkuf, and by personal letters, the Tsar strove to bring the war to an end. He failed, but through no fault of his own. The friendly manner in which Russia ceded Alaska to the United States needs no comment. During the blackest period of the Civil War, when practically all Europe favored the Confederacy, and were upon the verge of giving it official recognition, when France had gone so far as to throw troops into Mexico in defiance of the Monroe Doctrine, Russia still stood our firm friend. To the wonder of the nations, she sent a fleet across the Atlantic. It entered our northern ports and lay grimly waiting. What the Admiral's orders were, only St. Petersburg and Washington knew. But that they warranted his stripping his ships for action in the event of certain conditions arising, I have no doubt. When the famine swept Russia a score of years ago, what people so quick to respond as our own? And when that same nation, because of geographical disadvantages, was outclassed in her war with Japan, it was the United States that stepped in and called a stay, which resulted in the Treaty of Portsmouth. There were some few moments of silence. The secretary leaned back in his chair, his fingers pattering upon its arms. That he was interested was shown by the quick little jets of smoke which rose above his head. Well, said he, we come now to the matter of present interest, said Ashton Kirk. The early defeats of Russia at the hands of Japan demonstrated her unpreparedness, and upon the heels of the news, the Russian Count Malikoff, with some military officers, came to Washington. At once a scarcely audible murmur ran through the more daring of the newspapers, but almost instantly died away. However, one with his ear to the ground could detect the falling into place of the ponderous parts of some international arrangement. But just what this arrangement was has not been made known. Well, said the secretary again. Slowly and with great care, the secret agent then began the story of Dr. Morse. Starting with the visit of Warwick, he related the queer happenings at Sharsdale. Then came the flight to America, and the grotesque messages which had so startled Stella Corbin. He proceeded. A second glance at the picture of the crowned woman handed me by Warwick, and my attention was caught. It was the work of a Japanese. Ah, said the secretary, 
and he sat a trifle more upright. It was a Japanese with a thoroughly Western training, but that his point of view was still Oriental was plain in the drawing. It then occurred to me that if a Japanese were vitally interested in Dr. Morse, he would be likely to live as near to him as he could. And the telephone directory informed me that the house directly behind that of Morse was occupied by one Okyu. The secretary laid down his cigar. Okyu, said he. I think I recall that name. And more than likely it is the same person, said Ashton Kirk, though as yet I am not assured of that fact. Well, said the official, expectantly, as you have seen, the persecution of Dr. Morris began only after his return from Manchuria, when he had served in the Russian army. This in itself seemed to tell something. But when I add to it that he had never before come into contact with Japanese, and that one of the race was plainly involved, you will see that I had a fairly good reason for supposing that the thing had its beginning in Manchuria. But what was the thing? Plainly it was not a personal matter, for his person and effects had been spared more than once. Then I got a faint gleam of light, for just about now the name of Drevenoff comes into the case. Drevenoff! The official repeated the name quietly. His ruddy face was entirely devoid of expression. It is the name of a young Pole who is employed by Morse as a sort of gardener. He is educated, and I understand capable of filling a much higher position in life. A few weeks ago, he came to Eastbury entirely destitute. I recalled that a Colonel Drevenoff made one of the party which bore Count Malikoff company upon the mysterious mission to Washington in the early days of the Russo-Japanese War. I remembered also that Philip Warwick had told me that Morse had known young Drevenoff's father. This suggested an amazing possibility. After leaving the house on Fordham Road, I consulted the files of a newspaper. From this I learned that Colonel Drevenoff had, some six months after leaving Washington, joined the army in Manchuria, and had been killed in battle. The secretary nodded. Well, said he, Morris told me in the brief talk that I had with him that he had been attached as surgeon to the 47th Siberian Infantry, and I learned from the newspaper file that Colonel Drevenoff had been commander of that very regiment. The official shifted his position. His face was still unreadable. His voice, when he spoke, was even. You appear to attach some significance to that, said he. Suppose, spoke Ashton Kirk, that Colonel Drevenoff were possessed of something of great value. When brought in, wounded, and dying, what more likely thing than that he should be attended by Dr. Morse? Also, it is not without the range of possibility that he should entrust this precious possession to the physician's keeping. You are not deficient in imagination. And as the secretary said this, he smiled. Imagination is a vital necessity in my work. Without it, I could make but little headway. And now I will venture still farther upon the same road. But remember, I am claiming nothing substantial for what I am about to say. I merely place it before you as what might have happened, and ask you to fit it to any facts of which you may be possessed. That Colonel Drevenoff was in the party of so eminent a diplomat as Count Malikoff shows him to have been a person of some standing. 
that he should so suddenly be packed off to the Orient to head a provincial regiment indicates a fall in favor. What was the cause of this? I have no means of knowing, but in view of what I do know, I can build up a structure which may be more or less composed of truths. Suppose, after Malikoff left Washington, he missed something. A document, perhaps, in the hand of some person high in this government. Suppose Drevenoff were suspected of taking it, but could not be charged with the act because of lack of proof. There we have a reason for his banishment. Now we will suppose that Drevenoff did actually take this paper. Why did he do so? In order that he should profit by it. In what way? The answer follows swiftly. By selling it to the Japanese government. The secretary arose and crossed to a window. It is rather close here, said he, but don't stop. Suppose the mission of Malikoff had already suggested the existence of this paper to Tokyo, but upon Drevenoff getting into communication with them, they learned, for the first time, of its reality. But before the matter could be closed, Drevenoff met his death. And after Dr. Morse returned to England, the enemies of Russia in some way discovered that he had been made the custodian of the secret. What followed has been in the nature of attempts to gain possession of the coveted thing. But if this is so, how do you account for the bizarre, almost nonsensical methods employed? And how do you account for the apparent ignorance of Dr. Morse as to the meaning behind this persecution of him? Ashton Kirk shook his head. I do not account for it, he said. That is a thing which I have not come to as yet. The secretary recrossed to his desk, took another cigar, and pushed the box toward his visitor. After he had the long roll burning freely, he began pacing up and down. After quite a space, he resumed his chair. As you said in the beginning, he spoke, there are things which cannot even be hinted at before the time of ripening and fulfillment. Therefore, I can say only this. Count Malikoff did lose a document of most tremendous importance. Colonel Drevenoff was suspected. The paper in question, should it fall into the hands of those unfriendly to this government, might cause a nasty diplomatic complication. That it has not done so as yet, we feel sure. Because the conditions are such that immediate and open steps would be taken. But official Washington has, so to speak, been living over a volcano for several years. This is all you can say? In an official way? Yes. But assuming the point of view of a mere spectator of which you lately accused me, and here the secretary smiled, I should say that this matter of Dr. Morse holds all the elements of an interesting case. I agree with you, said Ashton Kirk, as he arose to his feet and looked at his watch. And, as there is a train in another half hour, I think I shall return at once and take up the study of it. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter Four: The Taking Off of Dr. Morse. As it happened, Ashton Kirk was too late to get the train which he had mentioned. The next did not leave until 7.30, and even this was delayed on the way. 
so that it was rather an unusual hour when they stepped into the motor car which the waiting Dixon held ready for them. The mean street, with its high smells and grimy buildings, was strangely quiet. The vendors' carts along the curb were empty. The stands were shrouded, and the stores dim-looking. As the automobile stopped before the secret agent's door, a bell in a neighboring tower struck one. Hello, cried Fuller. What's Stumpf doing? The hall door stood open to the fullest extent. The light was switched on, and beneath it stood Stumpf with a roughly dressed man whom Ashton Kirk at once recognized as young Drevenoff. Stumpf, aroused out of his usual gravity, was gesticulating determinedly. Drevenoff seemed insisting upon something doggedly. As Fuller spoke, the two heard the car for the first time, and turned. "'Thank goodness, here he is now!' cried Stumpf. He dashed excitedly down the step. "'Here is a man who desires to see you, sir,' he said to Ashton Kirk. "'He would not leave, though I told him a dozen times that you were not at home.' The secret agent, followed by Fuller and the man, entered the hall and the door closed behind them. Well, asked the former of Drevenoff. You are Mr. Ashton Kirk? I am. I was sent to fetch you at once to Dr. Worse's place on Fordham Road, Eastbury. Who sent you? Miss Corbin. Ashton Kirk looked at the young man. His face was pale. His eyes were brilliant with excitement. Has anything happened? Dr. Morse has been murdered. Ashton Kirk turned to Stumpf. Tell Dixon to wait. Instantly the man opened the door. The chauffeur was upon the point of starting away, but halted upon hearing Stumpf's voice. What trains are there? asked Ashton Kirk of Drevenoff. No more tonight, answered the man. I had hoped to find you before the last one left. No matter, the motor will do. Followed by the others, he hastily reached the car. Fuller seated himself beside Dixon, and Drevenoff entered the tonneau with the secret agent. Fordham Road, Eastbury, directed Ashton Kirk. The number is 2979. The car wheeled in its own length under the skillful hand of Dixon. Then it went speeding away. "'When did this happen?' asked Ashton Kirk of Drevenoff. "'The murder?' "'Of course,' sharply. "'I don't know the hour. Sometime tonight.' "'How was it done?' "'He was shot through the chest.' "'Where?' "'In his library.' "'It is natural, under such circumstances, for an informant to become very voluble.' but not so Drevenoff. His answers were brief. His manner, too, was sullen and unwilling. "'Tell me what you know about it,' requested Ashton Kirk. "'I know very little,' said the man. "'This evening, about dark, I ate my dinner and looked at the evening paper. Then I went to my room, which is on the third floor. I go to bed early these nights. I am not well, you see.' It must have been about half-past ten when I heard the knocking at my door. It was Nanon, and she was crying out that Dr. Morse was dead. I dressed and hurried downstairs. Dr. Morse was sitting all huddled up in his chair. His face was smeared with blood. Miss Corbin was kneeling beside him. The old woman stood by the door. Is that all? Nanon told me to go for the police. But Miss Corbin got up at once and warned me not to. There was a train almost due. She told me to take that and go get you. I see. The big car rushed along at high speed through the silence of the night. In a surprisingly short time, Eastbury was reached, and they turned into Fordham Road. The residence of Dr. Morse was silent and dark. The blinds were closely drawn, 
not even a glimmer of light was to be seen around their edges. Ashton Kirk touched the bell. Almost instantly, the door opened, and through the darkness, a voice asked, Is that you, Drevenoff? Yes, replied the Pole. Have you brought the gentleman? Here he is. The light was switched on. They saw the seamed face of the old Breton woman, harsh and emotionless. She spoke to Ashton Kirk. Miss Corbin will see you at once, sir, if you please. The secret agent followed her down the hall. They passed the library door, which was closed, and the old servant paused at the room into which she had shown them the evening before. I will tell her that you are here, she said. Ashton Kirk entered the room. It was dim, for only one light was burning. The atmosphere was hushed and breathless. A sort of terror seemed to have settled over everything. He had waited but a few moments when he heard a light, hasty step. Then Stella Corbin came in. Her face was white and the great eyes were dry and dumb with fear. The corners of her mouth twitched. Silently, she held out both hands to the secret agent. They were deathly cold, and he felt them tremble. I came as soon as I could, said he. I called and called upon the telephone, but they told me that you were not at home. Then I sent driven off. She spoke in broken, sobbing sentences, and the fear in her eyes crept into her voice as she went on. You see, it is as I expected. He is dead. They have killed him. Are you quite strong enough to tell me what you know? He asked. It is important that we act quickly. The police will, of course, be in the house before long and they are sometimes disposed to stand in the way. The police! He felt the small, cold hands tighten convulsively, and, if possible, her face went still whiter. The police! Oh, I had forgotten them! He got her a chair, forced her to sit down, and then took another, directly facing her. The light fell dimly upon the dark, loosely coiled masses of her hair and brought out the clear perfection of the face. Her slight figure seemed almost childish in the long, enveloping robe which she wore. "'I have heard the manner of your uncle's death,' he said. "'When you entered the library, did you see any sort of firearms lying about near to his hand?' Instantly, she grasped the meaning behind the words. No, no, she said hastily. It was not suicide. Tried as he was, many would have resorted to that. But my uncle was not of that sort. He was murdered. There were no firearms, then? No. Who discovered the body? Nanon. If I may... I should like to ask her a question or two. The old servant was summoned. She entered, angular, severe, and sharp of eye. Miss Corbin tells me, said the secret agent, that it was you who discovered the body of Dr. Morse. It was. Would you mind telling me how you came to do so? When he worked that night, he always drank coffee to keep himself awake. I always made and took it to him. When I entered into the library tonight, I found him sitting in his chair, dead. You heard no shot? No. When did you last see the doctor alive? About half past nine. I had just finished locking all the windows and doors when he rang for me. Is it your custom to lock up every night? Yes. I have always done so at nine o'clock by the doctor's orders. He was so urgent about this, said Stella, that I have thought he feared a repetition of the entrances which occurred at Sharsdale. 
You had seen that everything was fast, then, said Ashton Kirk, looking at the old woman. Yes, every door and every window upon the lower floor, and every window overlooking the porch on the second floor. As there was no way by which the house could be entered by any of the other windows, we never bothered with them. You say Dr. Morse rang for you as you finished locking up. Yes, sir, and I answered. He was in the library, and I was surprised to see that he was dressed as though he meant to go out, perhaps upon a journey. He had on his hat, an overcoat lay across a chair, and he was trying to turn a key in the lock of his traveling bag. The key was bent, and he had rung for me that I might bring him something to straighten it with. But, as he was speaking to me, the lock turned, and he told me that I need not mind. You say he was dressed as though to go out. Did he do so? No, sir, I am sure of that, because I went to the hall door and sat upon the step for some time. It was a fine night. So, if he had gone out, I should have seen him. How long did you sit there? About ten minutes. Then I went to prepare the coffee. While you sat upon the step, did you see or hear anything? I heard Dr. Morse talking. With whom? I don't know. I heard the second voice, but not distinctly. I thought it must be Miss Stella or Mr. Warwick. Here the girl drew a deep, audible breath, and Ashton Kirk saw the old woman fix her sharp eyes upon her. But, resumed Nenel, Miss Stella tells me that it was not she. You went directly from the library to the hall door after speaking to Dr. Morse, you say? Yes, sir. Did you close the door while you sat upon the step? No, I left it open, thinking to hear if the doctor rang again. No one else was in the library when you spoke to the doctor regarding the key? No one. Was there a light in the hallway while you sat at the door? There was. Should you have seen anyone entering the library? I should. To go into that room, he would first have to come through the hall. There were no visitors in the house at any time during the evening? No, said Nanon. I should have heard them ring, even if someone else had admitted them. Ashton Kirk turned to the girl. It is necessary that I know everything that can be told me as to what took place in the house tonight. So you will pardon a question or two, I know. She inclined her head in answer to this, but her mouth twitched nervously, and her hands held tightly to the chair upon which she sat. Where were you when you learned that Dr. Morse was dead? proceeded Ashton Kirk. In my sitting room, where I had gone to read immediately after dinner. Who brought the news? Nanon. She stood at the foot of the back stairs and called to me. Where is your sitting room? On the second floor at the back. The door was open, and I heard her at once. Did you hear or see anything else previous to this? Very early in the evening I saw Drevenoff going to his room on the third floor. I sat facing the doorway and had a view of the stairs. He did not come down again? Not until Nanon called him. You are quite sure of that? Quite. I should have seen him had he come down. There was a pause of some length. The secret agent looked from one to the other of the two women, and finally he said to Nanon, You say that you are not sure that the second voice you heard in the library was Mr. Warwick's. Again came the quick, deep-drawn breath from the girl, and again the gray eyes of the old woman sought her face. At the same time, she replied, I hear the voice. Whose it was, I cannot say. There was another pause. Then he turned to Miss Corbin. At all events, said he, smoothly, I should like to speak to him. She arose, a trifle unsteady. I am sorry, she said in a low voice. 
But I am afraid that is impossible just now. Impossible? He is not here. He has gone away. Gone away? It was old Nanon's voice, and it was pitched a shade higher than usual. She took a step toward the girl, the thick gray brows bent over the sharp-sighted eyes. Where has he gone? Why did he go? The girl did not reply. She put her hands to her face, and the secret agent, as he looked at her, saw that she shivered as though struck with a chill. I do not know, she said. For a moment, the old woman stood looking at her, something like menace in her face. It seemed as though she were about to burst forth into a torrent of words. But Ashton Kirk rose. If you don't mind, said he calmly, I should like to go through the house. Slowly the stern eyes turned from the girl to the speaker. You will not see him? Indicating the direction of the library. Not until afterward. Without another word, she walked toward the door. Ashton Kirk followed her. As he was stepping into the hall, he looked back. Stella Corbin was standing erect, her hands clasped, her face white and drawn with what seemed suspense. And the great dark eyes, filled with terror, were fixed steadily upon him. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter Five The Hound Strikes the Trail. Old Nanon led the secret agent through the rear of the house and then up the stairs, from floor to floor, and room to room. His eyes seemed to take in everything, gauging, measuring, speculating. Now and then he asked a question, to which she returned a brief, illuminating answer. Finally, they descended, and Ashton Kirk examined the front door. Beside the ordinary spring lock, it had a heavy bolt. When you left the step and went back into the kitchen to prepare the coffee, did you close this door? He asked. I did, and bolted it. Did you look at it after the body was found? It was I who opened the door for Drevenov when he started after you. It was still bolted. Both Fuller and Drevenov stood in the hall, and as old Nanon paused at the library door, Ashton Kirk said to the Pole, How far away is the nearest police station? About half a dozen blocks, answered the other. I want you to go there at once and report what has occurred. I can call them upon the telephone, suggested Drevenov. I prefer that you go in person, said Ashton Kirk, smoothly. More than likely they will send a man or two. If so, please wait for and return with them. Nanon opened the library door, turned the switch which controlled the library lights, and then stepped back. He is there, she said, one lean finger pointing to the empty doorway. Will you not go in? Ashton Kirk looked at her keenly. No. She drew back further, and he noted her make the same furtive sign that he had caught upon his first visit. He has filled the world with evil, she went on, and you see the end of it. Who knows but what that room swarms with things that the soul should fear? With this, 
She turned and retraced her steps down the hall, and they saw her re-enter the room where the girl had been left. A queer sort of old party, commented Fuller, and one that seems to stick to her opinions. The two went into the library and closed the door behind them. The hideous thing which sat huddled in the desk chair compelled their instant attention. The head lay tipped back, and the face was caked with dry blood. From one thing to another, the secret agent swiftly turned his attention. His singular eyes were narrowed, his nostrils widened, like those of a hound searching for the scent. He was killed while he sat, said he to Fuller. His position in the chair is too natural for it to be otherwise. And from the size of the wound, I should say the weapon was a small one. The fact that no one, not even a woman seated just outside the door, heard a report, also indicates the same thing. Around the library went the secret agent. The side windows were tried, but were fast, as were those opening upon the porch. A raincoat lay upon the floor. Upon the top of the high boy rested a dark, soft hat. The bag, said Ashton Kirk, in a low voice. Was there a bag? asked Fuller. In a few words, the other related what old Nanon had said. Fuller whistled through his shut teeth as he searched the room with a glance. It's gone, said he and a hundred to one the thing we want is gone with it. Perhaps, said Ashton Kirk, quietly, but we are not at all sure of that. The person who is keyed up to the pitch of a desperate deed such as this seldom is in the state of mind to make an intelligent search. If the desired thing is at his hand, well and good. But if it is hidden, the chances are decidedly against him. Witness the attempt upon the rubies of Bostwick's wife, in which her butler lost his life. Also, the astonishing matter of the numismatist, Hume. A miscalculation spoiled the criminal's chances in the first case, and a misunderstanding with a confederate was fatal in the second. The beast in a man is uppermost when he can do murder. And even the most intelligent of beasts is not a reasoning thing. Footnote. For the details of the case of the numismatist Hume, see the first book of this series, Ashton Kirk, Investigator. That sounds like truth, said Fuller. But this is the way I look at it. Dr. Morse was clearly in a state of dread. All about him agreed that these queer things which were continually recurring had broken his nerve. A servant enters a room and finds him preparing for a journey. Yet apparently he has not mentioned his intentions in this regard even to his niece, to whom he is much attached. To my mind, this indicates that he was about to run off somewhere without saying anything to any one. He feared to remain, and he feared to tell that he was going, thinking it would, somehow, leak out. Well... And what next? The most natural thing for him to do under the circumstances, proceeded Fuller, would be to take with him the article which created all the fuss. It would be against human nature to leave it behind. He was about to put it into the bag, or he had already done so, when the servant saw him endeavoring to turn the key. That, smiled the secret agent, is rather well thought out. But you have overlooked one thing. That Dr. Morse intended doing as you state would necessitate his knowing definitely what his mysterious communicants desired. His own acts, and especially his own words, as overheard by his niece, indicate the reverse of this. And if he did not know what they wanted, with a twinkle in his eye, it is certain that he could not pack it away in a bag. Fuller looked perplexed, but nodded understandingly. 
"'That's so,' said he. "'I forgot for a moment that the case had that peculiar phase.' Again he looked all about. "'However,' he continued, "'the bag is not here. "'And if the murderer took it with him, "'you can bet that he had an excellent reason for so doing.' While Fuller was speaking, Ashton Kirk lifted the coat from the floor. Several of the pockets were pulled out. At once he examined the coat worn by the dead man. The inside pockets of this were also turned out, as were those upon the lower outside. There was a search, said he, but as before, when the house at Sharsdale was broken into, the personal valuables were not its object. Here is his watch in his fob pocket, and this, taking up a torn card case from the desk, lies just where the criminal flung it in his anger at not finding what he wanted. Its contents, pointing to a tightly wadded heap of bills also upon the desk, are there. Suppose, doubted Fuller, that the paper wanted was in this pocket case. The murderer would have taken it. As it stands, you do not know whether he found it or not. I think I do, replied Ashton Kirk. A man who has sought for a thing for a long time is delighted at finding it. The man who threw those bills upon the desk, holding up the tightly twisted lump, was angry. That is plain in the vehemence of the act. He stooped and pulled open drawer after drawer in the desk. Their contents were tumbled, showing that a rough and hasty hand had been plunged into them. Fuller was gazing in fascinated silence at the long, supple, inquiring fingers as they deftly ran through everything. Then, suddenly, he noted them halt. At once his glance went to the owner's face. Ashton Kirk, his eyes turned in a sidelong look toward a door at the rear of the room, stood in an attitude of listening. Fuller was about to speak but the other lifted his hand in a warning gesture. There was an instant silence, the secret agent listening as before. Then he bent toward Fuller and said softly, Switch off the lights. Stealthily, Fuller crossed the room and did so. Then he stood waiting. In a few moments, he heard a slight creak from the hall and a muffled sort of jar. A minute or two passed. He was then astonished to hear the voice of the secret agent speaking in an unconcerned tone of voice. Hello? muttered the young man. He is mighty cool about it, whatever it is. Turning off the lights to hold a conversation is rather new, I should say. Outside of a spiritualistic seance. A short time passed, then steps came along the darkened hall, and Ashton Kirk's voice said, Now, Fuller, the lights, if you please. Fuller turned on the lights once more, and again the two entered the library. I thought I heard you speaking to someone, said Fuller inquiringly. Over the telephone, said the other, quietly. There was a little matter that I desired information upon. Again he resumed his inspection of the room. The furniture, piece by piece, passed under his keen eye. The floors, the walls, the hangings, the books and writing materials, nothing escaped him. At length he came once more to the high boy, with its numerous drawers and glistening glass knobs. First one and then another of the drawers he pulled open. Like those of the desk, they told of the same hasty hand. However, this seemed to be all they had to tell, for the secret agent did not spend more than an instant over each. But as he was about to open the last but one, Fuller saw him pause and bend nearer. 
Then out came a Morocco case, and from this was produced a powerful magnifying glass. It was the knob up on the left-hand side of the drawer that had caught his attention. Putting the lens on this, it threw up a thick, dark splotch. Blood, said Ashton Kirk. Fuller bent forward with great interest. In searching the body after the shooting, said he, the fellow, whoever he was, probably came into contact with the flow from the wound, and in opening the drawer he transferred it to the knob. But Ashton Kirk shook his head. No, said he. It is his own blood. Look. And he ran the glass from knob to knob upon the other drawers. There are no marks here, and yet a man making a search would invariably start at the top, as I have done. Then the lens shifted back to the knob with the splotch. Mark this one closely, he added, and tell me what you see. The knob has been broken, said Fuller at the first glance. Exactly. All along its top there is a keen, ragged ridge. Probably seizing this to tear open the drawer, the criminal cut himself. For a moment, the speaker stood studying the broken knob with its particle of dried blood. Then, like a flash, he turned to Fuller, his singular eyes ablaze, and snapped, On the desk there is a paperweight. Get it. Fuller, astonished, did as he was bidden. What now? he inquired. Throw it through a bookcase door, was Ashton Kirk's astonishing reply. Fuller stood amazed. What? gasped he. Throw it through a bookcase door, repeated the secret agent, busy with his lens. Fuller stood for a moment, hesitating. The other arose impatiently, took the heavy paperweight from him, and sent it crashing through the door of the nearest case. The glass splintered and fell jingling to the floor. Ashton Kirk selected two small pieces and handed them to Fuller. In the kitchen you will find hot water and soap. Wash and dry these carefully. The assistant went hastily, and while he was gone, Ashton Kirk bent once more over the broken knob. With the thin blade of a pocket knife, he picked at the fragment of dried blood. Finally, he worked it loose and caught it upon a card as it fell. Carrying this to a small table above which hung a light, he examined it carefully. Then to Fuller, as the latter returned, he said, Are they ready? All ready, replied Fuller, and he placed the two pieces of glass ready to his employer's hand. Once more, Ashton Kirk looked at the blood clot. Selecting that portion of it which appeared to be thickest, he pressed the back of the knife blade carefully against it. Then, taking it up with the tip of his fingers, he carefully broke it in two at the exact place. Sharply, he brought the pieces under the light. Two crimson shining spots of uncongealed blood showed within the outer crust. Excellent, said the secret agent. I thought it possible, but scarcely dared hope for it. One after another, and with delicate care, he applied the newly exposed surfaces of the clot to one of the bits of glass. A fair-sized smear of red appeared upon the smooth glaze. Then he drew the second glass across the top of the first. The result was that he now possessed two distinct smears of the blood. With much satisfaction, he placed these upon the top of the high boy. Now we'll leave them to dry, said he. And in this place, they'll not be likely to be disturbed. Fuller was filled with curiosity as to the meaning of the foregoing performance. But the other had already resumed his prowling up and down. 
and the aide understood that this was no time for questions. After a little, Ashton Kirk opened the door at the back of the library, and they entered the rear room. There was a long window overlooking the lawn, and a door opening into the hallway. The room was scantily furnished, but upon the shelves were a stack of books in wrappers. Also, there were a number of filing cabinets. The secret agent looked at some of the books. Remnants of editions, he said. Morse was his own publisher, it seems. Fuller examined the window. All tight, said he. A Casper window holder. The door leading to the hall was fitted with a large old-fashioned lock, from which protruded a copper key. That looks safe enough, said Fuller, as he glanced at this. If it were fast, it might be, said the other, dryly. But I had occasion to use it while you had the lights out, and found it unlocked. Nanon was summoned, and Ashton Kirk met her in the hall. This door, said he, is it usually left unlocked? Never, she answered. Dr. Morse always had it fast from the inside. He kept his books and papers there, and did not care to have them disturbed. That will do, said Ashton Kirk. The old woman was just about to turn away when there came a loud peal at the doorbell. The police, said Fuller. Go and see, said Ashton Kirk to Nanon. Grimly she went along the hall, her spare, strong figure iron-like in its rigidity. Fuller's eyes followed her, and then, turning to the secret agent, he said, The thing looks queer, doesn't it? Everything tight as wax, but a very effective job done for all. Then, lowering his voice, he added, there were only four of them inside, and from my way of thinking, the thing rests between them. The front door had opened in the meantime. They heard the murmur of voices, and then it closed sharply. The old Breton woman hurried back to where they stood, and as she came, the hall lights showed that her lined face had gone a livid yellow. Her bony, large-veined hands were outstretched. "'Who is it?' asked Ashton Kirk. She pointed toward the door, quiveringly. "'The Japanese,' she answered. End of Chapter 5「Chapter Six of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter Six The Visit of Okiu. For a moment there was a silence. Then Fuller spoke. Japanese, exclaimed he, at this time of the night? They are original in their choice of hours, anyhow. Let them come in, said Ashton Kirk, quietly. The old woman turned her startled face toward him. Her hands went up rebelliously. No, she said, they must not come in. At this time above all others. The singular eyes of the secret agent fixed themselves upon her steadily. Show them into the room across from the library, said he in an even tone. It is necessary that I should speak to them. The stern gray eyes met the dark ones squarely. There was no sign of weakening in them. 
The yellow tinge left the old face. The hands fell at her side. Very well, she said, after a moment. But let it be understood that I lifted my voice against it. Again she went to the door. They heard the bolt shot, and a rush of air told them the door had opened. From where they stood, they had no view of the entrance, as the stairway shut it off. Again there came the voices, then footsteps, and once more the door closed. In a moment the old woman returned. She pointed down the hall. "'I have done what you ordered,' she said. Then, in an ominous tone, she added, "'And I trust no harm comes of it.' With that she went on, and they saw her enter the rear room once more. Ashton Kirk spoke quietly to Fuller. "'Stand in the hall and busy yourself somehow.' "'I understand,' said Fuller. Ashton Kirk approached the room into which the visitors had been shown, and went in. Two men arose upon the entrance of the secret agent. One was the small gray-haired man Ashton Kirk had seen weeding the lawn two days before. The other was larger in girth, and taller. His face was yellow, and as devoid of lines as that of an infant. It was the latter who spoke. "'Do I see Dr. Morse?' he inquired. The accent was perfect, the voice soft, smooth, and almost caressing. Ashton Kirk, as he looked at him, saw that the lineless face was singularly expressionless. However, a pair of jetty eyes looked out piercingly from between the drooping lids, and the chin protruded with much natural resolution. "'I am a friend of the family,' said the secret agent. "'If there is anything that I can do, I shall be pleased.' The Japanese smiled. "'You are very good,' said he. "'But it is Dr. Morse whom I wish to see.' The voice was soft and purring. It was as though he were speaking to a child. "'If you will be kind enough to call him,' suggested the speaker, "'I will be obliged to you.' "'That,' said Ashton Kirk, "'is a thing which I should readily do if it could have any effect. "'But it would not. "'Dr. Morse is dead.' There was complete silence for a moment. A tall clock ticked solemnly at one side. Its strokes now seemed to grow quicker and louder, like the heartbeats of a man fighting down an increasing excitement. Dead, said the small man, in a throaty voice. Not that, surely, spoke the other, and one hand went out, as though in protest. He is dead, said the secret agent. And more, he has been murdered. No, no, cried the small man. That is horrible. The other approached a step or two. Both hands were gesticulating as though he found it difficult to find words. And the hands were quite wonderful, slim and strong and beautifully shaped. Their color was a bright saffron. The fingers were long and as supple as those of a magician. Their tips were delicately pointed, the nails rounded and gleaming. This what you tell us, said he, is a frightful thing. Murdered. And by whom? Ashton Kirk shook his head. That, said he, is yet to be learned. But the police, they are not here? No. One of the wonderful hands touched the smaller man upon the shoulder. Humadi, said the gentle voice, murder has been done, and the police are not here. 
the eyes of the gray-haired Japanese sought those of his companion, and a look as rapid as lightning passed between them. The West prides itself on many things, said Humadi, but in Tokyo this would not be so. The officers will arrive in due course, said Ashton Kirk quietly. But in the meantime, if there is anything that I can do, I shall be, as I said before, much pleased. Will you permit me to sit down? asked the taller of the two. Thank you. And you will sit there, will you not? As he spoke, he smiled and pushed a chair toward the secret agent in such a way that it would bring his back toward the door if he sat in it. But Ashton Kirk took it readily, without a sign that he noticed anything studied in the act. My name, said the Japanese, as he seated himself facing Ashton Kirk, is Okiu. My house is on the next street. The back you can see from the rear windows of this. On the second floor, there is a room where I read and smoke and study. It is at the back, and there, with a wave of the hand, I sat tonight. Ashton Kirk nodded. It is in the blood of all lands, proceeded Okiu, to love its native literature. I have many quaint books and rare manuscripts. They are full of the, as you of the West call it, folklore of my people. I love it. The soft voice seemed to caress the subject on which it dwelt. I sit and smoke and dream for hours. The bright legends of the samurai sound like music to the mind, and forgotten heroes rise before me in all their ancient power. Here he laughed gently. You see, said he, how filled I am with the subject when I drift unconsciously into it at a time like this. Tonight I was so engaged. I was deep in a book lately sent me by a friend, a reprint of a precious writing that I had never before seen. I became lost in its pages. Two, three hours slipped by before I knew it. But when the clock struck ten, I got up and turned off the light, for I live very strictly. Smilingly, much as one of the recluses of the waste places of our own island. The night was beautiful, however, and I stood for a little looking out. The shadows fell in long lines, and finally, upon the edge of one of these, the shadow cast by this very house, I saw something stir. The last word had hardly left his lips when there came a sharp, swift rustle in the hall, an exclamation, and the sound of a closing door. "'What is that?' cried Okiu, as he came to his feet. "'I'm inclined to think it's your friend,' said Ashton Kirk, as he lounged back in his chair. I rather wondered why he went out into the hall. Humadi appeared in the doorway, his manner apologetic, but a heavy furrow between his eyes. Fuller glanced in over his shoulder. The gentleman made a mistake in the room, said he. If I startled him in putting him right, I'm sorry. It is my place to ask pardon, said Humari to Ashton Kirk. While you talked to my friend, I stepped into the hall thinking to observe something which might be of value to the police when they came. I thank you for your interest, said the secret agent. It is kind of you to trouble yourself. The door across the way leads to the room where the body lies, and it is as well that it be kept closed. It is for you to say, agreed Humadi, as he sat down, wearing a somewhat baffled look. Okiu laughed softly, and the wonderful hands gestured appreciation. You do not know Humadi, he said to Ashton Kirk. You do not know him, 
or you would not wonder at him for this. His is one of the helpful natures. Always is he desirous of being of assistance. To aid others is his one ambition. Ah, yes, to be sure. And Ashton Kirk's fine white teeth shone in a smile of understanding. One meets people of that sort now and then, but upon the whole such natures are rare. Rare, indeed. But the world, caressingly, would be greatly the better if there were more. There was an instant's pause. Then Okiu went on. As I was saying, while I stood at my window, I saw a stirring just upon the edge of the shadow cast by this house. It was not a very marked movement, and at first I thought it must be something waving in the breeze. But after a little I knew that this was not so. The movement was too intelligent. I felt that there was someone lurking about on the lawn. Then I called to Humadi. And when he came he said, What was it you said, Humadi? Turning to the gray-haired man. I said it must be men, said the other Japanese promptly. And I said that there were more than one, and that they appeared to be thieves. He has such excellent vision, said Okiu approvingly to Ashton Kirk. He is many years older than I, but his eyes are like those of a boy. Yes, he said that they must be thieves, and I agreed with him. We watched for some time, but the shadows were so dense that we could make out little or nothing. Then, suddenly, we saw a man emerge into the moonlight. A tall man, said Ashton Kirk, broad in the shoulders and carrying a leather bag. Both Japanese turned their eyes upon him with swift surprise. You saw him? cried Humadi. No, I merely fancied that it might be so. The surprise died quickly out of Okiu's eyes, and in its place came a look that was peculiarly speculative. From the beginning he had regarded Ashton Kirk with interest, but to this was now added surmise, and, perhaps, quickening dread. But when he spoke, his voice showed no trace of this. Your imagination is excellent, purred he, gently. Indeed, it amounts to something like second sight. You are quite right, sir. His glance running over Ashton Kirk. He was tall, and well set, and also young, judging by the ease with which he leaped over the fence. After this, as nothing more happened, I went to bed. But I could not sleep. I felt sure that something had occurred, and it troubled me. At last I got up, called to Humadi, and came here to speak to Dr. Morse. Here the Japanese arose. The smooth, chubby face expressed no emotion, but the eyes, the hands, the whole body showed evidences of shock. I thought said he, to tell of a mere robbery. But I find something more terrible. Then, as though a thought had occurred to him, but the others, the young lady, the young man, they meant with no harm. The secret agent shook his head. No, replied he. That is well. The other is a frightful calamity, but even that could be worse. He seemed to hesitate for a space, then added in another tone, You will express my sympathy to them. I will, said Ashton Kirk. I would not disturb them now, and Okiu gestured the idea from him. No, that would not do, but I will leave my sorrow with you. It is fitter that it should be mentioned by an old friend of the family like yourself. Again there was a slight pause. The speaker looked at Ashton Kirk inquiringly as he asked, 
Am I right in understanding you to say that you are an old friend of the family? A friend, yes, answered Ashton Kirk readily, but scarcely what could be called an old one. Ah, the drooping lids almost hid the searching black eyes. Then you have not known them long. For two days merely. Two days? Again the glances of the yellow men met, and again did a rapid intelligence pass between them. Two days, repeated Okiu softly. That is odd, is it not? Acquaintances must begin sometime, protested the secret agent. To be sure, but that your acquaintance with Dr. Morse should begin last night, and that he should die tonight. Well? The keen eyes of Ashton Kirk met the peering ones of Okiu inquiringly. Fate seemed determined that the friendship should not grow, answered the Japanese, gently. It is strange how things come about, is it not? Ashton Kirk also got upon his feet. Fate seldom consults us, he said dryly. If it did, perhaps things would happen differently. Just then there came the growing sound of voices without. The shuffle of feet was heard upon the walk, and then, more noisily, upon the porch. The bell rang in long streams of sound. The police, said Ashton Kirk, looking at his watch. Their methods are as distinguishable as their uniforms. Fuller looked in. The secret agent nodded, and the young man stepped briskly toward the hall door. In another moment, a thick-set man in a sergeant's dress entered the room, and with him were two patrolmen. "'How are you?' said the sergeant, nodding to the three men. "'Members of the family?' In a few moments, the status of the Japanese was explained. The sergeant listened to their story of the prowler with satisfaction. "'There's the party we want,' said he. "'Had a bag, did he?' Huh. <laughs> Full of swag, I'll bet. He then took Okiu's name and address. A headquarters man will go on this case, of course, continued the sergeant. And he'll want to hear you tell about that. And in the meantime, stuffing his notebook into his breast pocket, I'll have to ask you all to go. We've got to look things over and get the hang of it all. And you can see how too many people would be in the way. As Ashton Kirk and Fuller emerged from the house, they found the two Japanese standing by the gate. Dixon, who had been waiting all this time, threw on the power at sight of his employer, and the engine of the big French car began to hum in the silence. "'Good night,' said Okiu, gently, a smile upon his smooth face. "'I shall see you again, sir.' Ashton Kirk waved his hand in answer, and as the car started off, and he and Fuller settled themselves back, the latter said, Did you notice the way that fellow said that? It sounded to me much as though he had something against you, and meant to get square. Perhaps, returned Ashton Kirk quietly, that is what he meant. One can never tell. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent » by John Thomas McIntyre This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 7 – The Methylene Stain the following morning, the secret agent sat in his study, immersed in the newspapers. Each contained a circumstantial account of the murder of Dr. Morse, and each, according to its policy, commented thereon. Much was made of the mysterious happenings at Charsdale, 
and the equally mysterious communications at Eastbury. The police had gone to apprehend Karkowski at his lodgings, but he was missing. The Star, true to its enterprising spirit, contained front-page reproductions of the three drawings which young Warwick had shown Ashton Kirk. The pictures, said this newspaper, will, in the end, be found to contain the solution of the entire matter. What they mean and why the colors varied so is, just now, a puzzle. The crowned woman and the cross with the different colored strokes are, at this stage of the case, absolutely without meaning. But the police are working upon this phase of the affair with much interest and zeal, and any hour may bring forth amazing results. Osborne, a talented man from the central office, has the matter in hand. And judging from past performances, he should accomplish wonders. Well, there are worse than Osborne, commented Fuller, when his employer pointed out the latter passage. But he'll never set the earth to rocking at that. He has a healthy brain, said Ashton Kirk, but he seldom centers it properly. And if his mind is kept constantly between the narrow barriers of police procedure, its possessor cannot hope for moments of inspiration. The standard dwelt at great length upon the missing bag and the disappearance of Philip Warwick. The story of the two Japanese convinced this newspaper that with Warwick discovered, the case would end there and then. There can scarcely be any doubt that it was he who Messrs. Okiu and Humari saw leaping over the hedge fence in the moonlight, declared the standard. The leather bag which he carried was more than likely the same that Dr. Morse was fumbling with when the servant last saw him in the library. To be sure, the old woman does not definitely state that it was Warwick's voice which she heard later as she sat upon the step. But circumstances fail to point to any other possible person. The house was absolutely secure except for the street door, and the servant sat in front of that. It would have been impossible for anyone to have passed in and she not be aware of it. The young man, Drevenoff, was in his room from first to last. We are sure of this because Miss Corbin saw him go up the stairs before Dr. Morse sent for the servant about the key, and is absolutely certain that he did not come down until after the body was discovered. Warwick, therefore, is the only person unaccounted for, and the fact that a person answering his description, even if only vaguely, was seen stealing away shortly after the time the crime must have been committed seems almost convincing evidence of his guilt. And that this dimly seen person also carried a handbag, the only article learned to be missing, and that Warwick's present whereabouts is unknown almost clinches the supposition. Fuller nodded his head at this. They make a good case against him, said he. I'm also of the opinion that Warwick, when found, will tell a mighty illuminating story, if he has the mind. Ashton Kirk threw the papers from him with a yawn. As usual, said he, they grasp the obvious and apparently sensational features. The trouble with some of the journals and their staffs, however, is not lack of acuteness. It is the desire to get in on a good story before their rivals. To flame out into broad-faced type which will give the prospective purchaser a blow between the eyes as it lies upon the stand, or allow the newsboys a fine line to fill the streets with. But the real things are not brought forward with such a dramatic rush. They filter, gradually, through a mass of extraneous matter and their quality appears only to a person seeking an absolutely convincing result. He pulled off his coat and turned up his sleeves. Entering the laboratory, he opened the drawer of a stand and took out the two pieces of glass broken from the front of Dr. Morse's bookcase. Holding these up to the light, he said, We secured two very satisfactory blood smears under most unpromising conditions. That the clot was not altogether hard was fortunate, and that I was able to take advantage of the fact without accident was doubly so. Lighting a Bunsen burner, he passed the glass once through the flame. Then he took a shallow vessel and poured out a quantity of liquid. In this, he immersed one of the bits of glass 
with its dry stain. "'Some sort of a test?' inquired Fuller. "'Yes. This bath of alcohol will fix the smear.' "'I see.' Fuller's curiosity prompted him to inquire as to what would follow this fixation, but knowledge of the other's habits of mind forbade this. "'About all that is known of the parasite for which I am going to seek,' said Ashton Kirk as he stood by the tray, watch in hand, "'is due in the first place to a French army surgeon named Laveron. "'After him came the Italian, Marciafava, the German, Koch, and a number of others. There is a monograph upon the subject by Manneberg, which is most comprehensive. "'What sort of a little beast is it?' asked Fuller. "'A lively, wriggling atom, a unicellular organism, directly upon the borderland between the animal and vegetable kingdoms. "'That sounds very exact and scientific,' said the other, "'but it means little to me.' The young specimens of the plasmodia, as this particular germ is styled, develop in the red blood cells, and as they grow, they destroy their habitation. I could tell you of interesting changes of color in the blood corpuscles, of the active, joyous dancing of the parasite, and of its multiplication by sporulation. But not now. All this, however, is repeated again and again and each sporulation of the parasite is usually associated with marked symptoms in the person whose blood it inhabits. You speak as though you expected to find some such condition in this, and Fuller nodded toward the blood smear. I expect nothing. I am merely about to prove or disprove a suggestion. At the end of twenty minutes, Ashton Kirk took the bit of glass from the fixing bath, threw the alcohol into a waste pipe, and ran some water into the vessel. It will take some ten minutes for the sly to dry, said he, and in the meantime we shall prepare the next step in the process. He took down a bottle filled with a dark blue liquid. This he held up to the light that poured in from the window. Here, said he, is the bloodhound upon whom I depend to find and mark the parasite. It bears the rather formidable name, in its present state, of aqueous methylene blue, and is in a 2% solution. Combined with it is a 5% solution of borax. I had a druggist send it in this morning. This mixture he poured into the small vessel until the bottom was barely covered. Then he added water, until there was a layer of perhaps one centimeter in thickness, and the blue began to become transparent. The alcohol had dried off the bit of glass by this time, and Ashton Kirk took the fragment up with a pair of forceps and dipped it several times into the methylene stain. After this, he passed it through clear water, until the blue paled to a greenish tinge. Then he took up a white disk of filter paper. Placing this upon a stand, he laid the glass upon it and carefully dried both sides, much as one would blot ink from a letter sheet. This process is what is called staining, said Ashton Kirk, and the method I have used is one recommended by Koch. It is somewhat similar to the older one of Manneberg, but more rapid in result. Out of a tube, he dropped a single gem-like globule of cedar oil upon the blood smear. Then he covered it with a small square of glass. Upon this, in its turn, fell a second drop of the oil. The hole was then placed in position under a microscope and fastened. Then the secret agent brought out the lens. It glittered like a tiny diamond in a huge setting, and Fuller gazed at it, fascinated. How you can see anything through a glass as small as that I can't understand, said he. It looks like the point of an awl. It is a one-twelfth objective, 
replied the other, as he screwed the lens firmly down upon the cover glass, and thus embedded it, so to speak, in the globule of cedar oil. It is necessary, said he, that the specimen be observed through the oil, because the lens must be brought down directly upon the glass. Without the oil, the glass would be scratched, and the whole thing ruined. Then he set himself to the close study of what the tiny lens made plain. In a few moments, he lifted his head with an exclamation of triumph. "'I have it!' he cried. "'What have you found?' asked Fuller, eagerly. "'Evidence?' answered Ashton Kirk, triumphantly, that will enable me to lay my hand upon the person who searched the library and clothing of Dr. Morse. The murderer? Perhaps he is that also. Who knows? But, demanded Fuller, I don't quite understand. Ashton Kirk waved his hand toward the microscope, and Fuller applied his eye to it. What do you see? asked the secret agent. A pale green circle, answered the other, and it is crowded with irregularly shaped spots. Compare the circle with the dial of a watch, and look closely at the point where the six should be. Yes, said Fuller. What do you see at a very little distance from the edge? There are some small blue spots. Some are dark. The other is lighter and more intense. That last is my proof, said Ashton Kirk. Then, as Fuller turned upon him a still inquiring look, he added, The indications have been that some member of Dr. Morse's household had a hand in his death. The house was secure at all points. It was not possible for anyone to gain an entrance after the locking up. You might say, suppose the criminal had entered the house before the time for locking up, and remained concealed until he saw his opportunity. To that I would answer that we would have detected his method of departure. He should have left something unfastened behind him, unless he had a confederate in the house. That the doors and windows in every instance were fast proves that this must be the case. Fuller nodded his head. That's so, said he. Now, let us take the members of the household one at a time. Miss Corbin. Fuller waved his hand. Oh, she's out of it, said he. Very well, said Ashton Kirk, his white teeth showing in a smile. Then let us take up Nanon. Here we have a severely religious woman, one who evidently detested her employer, but who served him well and had been many years in the family. It looks as though we'd have to pass her, too, said Fuller. There is no reason why she should murder Dr. Morse that I can see. Again, the other smiled. In this you agree with the newspapers, at any rate, said he. None of them have found occasion to associate her with the matter, either. I also agree with the papers in the matter of Warwick, said Fuller. I know that it's best to start without preconceived notions, but I can't help thinking that if he's not exactly the man, he knows quite a bit about it all. That he has unaccountably disappeared is a bad point against him, admitted Ashton Kirk. And that someone resembling him was seen stealing away in the night, carrying a handbag, is another and most damaging one. However, as you say, it is best not to start with preconceived notions. And until we are sure that the unknown was Warwick, and that the bag he carried was the missing bag, we'd better not accuse him. There was a pause. The secret agent looked at the stained blood smear for a moment, and then continued. There is still another person, the fourth and last. This person possessed the marked symptoms of a common complaint. Chills followed by fever. To this person I know Dr. Morse gave quinine. Well? asked Fuller, eagerly. Chills and fever are indications of malaria, 
quinine is the invariable remedy for that complaint. And the light blue spots which you see in that smear of blood, pointing to the microscope, are the germs of that same disease. For a moment, Fuller stood as though transfixed. You have the man, he cried at last. You have him beyond the shadow of a doubt. To think, in great admiration, that he should be found out in such an unusual way. Why, it is one of the... Here he paused. The enthusiasm died from his face, and he added, slowly, But suppose that blood clot was not left upon the drawer pull at the time you think. The man may have been in the library during the afternoon upon a perfectly legitimate errand. But Ashton Kirk shook his head. No, said he. It happened last night about the time of the murder. If it had been earlier, the blood would have been dry and hard to the core. I see, said Fuller. I recall that you were surprised at its having retained any softness even at that. But there is something else. If Miss Corbin is sure that Drevenoff did not descend from the third floor, after once going to his room, how do you account for his presence in the library at that time? Miss Corbin was in position to see Drevenoff as he ascended the back stairs. She did not see him descend, and so concluded that he could not have done so. As a matter of fact, he could have gained the first floor without any trouble by passing through some unoccupied rooms upon the third floor and using the front or main staircase. Then that's it, declared Fuller. He came down that way while the old servant was in the kitchen seeing to the coffee, did his work, and went back to his room by the same route. But, with a puzzled look upon his face, what in the world ever drew your attention to Drevenoff in the first place? That is, what made you think it might be his blood upon the handle of the drawer? Do you recall that while I was examining the desk, I stopped to listen? Yes, and told me to put out the lights. The sound that I heard came from the room in the rear of the library. When I asked you to switch off the lights, it was because I wanted to open the door between the two rooms, without the knowledge of the person who may have made the sound. You saw no one? No. But I heard something like quick footsteps going down the hall, and then the soft closing of the street door. By George, I heard that too, said Fuller, remembering. Someone had been in the room in the rear of the library, said Ashton Kirk. What I heard in the first place was perhaps some sort of sound made as he was stealing away. Drevenoff was the last person I had seen in the hall, and naturally he was suggested to me as the cause of the sounds. But you had told him to go to the police station. Told him, yes. But, if you will remember, he had not yet gone when we entered the library. He said that the police station was a matter of four blocks. If he had gone at once, he would have reached there long before I heard the sound in the back room. I at once went to the phone, which I had noticed in the back hall, and called up the station in question. No, he had not yet reached there. Would the sergeant kindly make a private note of when he did? The sergeant would. And did he? He whispered it to me as I was leaving the house later. Drevenoff reached the police station less than ten minutes after I called them up, just about the length of time it would take him to get there, if it were he who had been in the rear room. Ah! The man's actions seemed suspicious even before I received this apparent verification. Also, I had not forgotten the intelligence we had gathered concerning his father. So, when I came upon the blood clot, I naturally had him in mind. The symptoms of malaria and the quinine came back to me, and I at once determined upon this test, on the chance that it would turn out as it has. I think you have sufficient evidence to have him taken at once. But Ashton Kirk shook his head. It would be enough to hold him on, at any rate, protested Fuller. 
and if he's not arrested now, he may escape, and Dr. Morse's murder will go unavenged. The secret agent took up his big German pipe. The murder of Dr. Morse, said he, is a most frightful crime against society. I am perfectly willing to do what I can to trace the criminal. But don't forget that the important matter with us is another thing entirely. You mean the document, or whatever it was, which was stolen by Drevenoff's father? Which may have been stolen by Drevenoff's father, exactly. The murder of Dr. Morse is only incidental to this. Here the pipe was lighted, and heavy clouds of smoke began to rise. And even though young Drevenoff should prove to be the murderer, I don't think we need fear his attempting to escape. No? No. For some little time, at any rate, it will be perfectly safe to give him a free foot. Indeed, it may prove to be of great advantage to us to do so. He has not yet found the thing of which he is in search. That is plain. If he had, he would have been off before now. So, for a time at least, it will be highly interesting to watch his movements. For who knows but what it is through him that we are to save the government much embarrassment. Fuller regarded his employer, the huge pipe, and the smoke clouds which rose lazily above both. There was much speculation in his eye. You have not lost sight of the Japanese, said he. The Japanese? Ashton Kirk took the amber bit from his mouth, and his white teeth gleamed as he laughed. Oh, no. I have not forgotten them. Mr. Okiu and his friend Mr. Humadi interest me exceedingly. End of Chapter 7《Chapter 8 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent》by John Thomas McIntyre This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 8 The House on Fordham Road It was a few hours later that the big car drew up at the house on Fordham Road. There was a crowd of loiterers at the gate, open-mouthed and marveling at everything they saw, and these at once gathered about the car, scenting a possible sensation. But Ashton Kirk, followed by Fuller, pushed his way unceremoniously to the gate, and a few words to the policeman on guard there admitted them to the lawn. One of the first persons they saw at the house was Osborne, the burly central office man, who stood upon the porch smiling expansively and talking with a couple of alert young fellows who listened with interest. "'I see that friend Osborne has the ear of the reporters,' said Ashton Kirk, amusedly. "'And to all appearances he is not losing any advantages which the situation might have.' "'He looks good-natured enough to have had some luck,' commented Fuller. When Osborne caught sight of them, he broke into a laugh. Hello! cried he. He came forward and shook the secret agent by the hand. I rather thought you'd poke your learned head above the horizon this morning. It pleases me to be borne in mind, smiled Ashton Kirk, good-naturedly. But what are the developments? Oh, several little things have taken occasion to occur replied Osborne, his broad face beaming. One of them is that we have nailed the man with the bag. It was Philip Warwick, beyond a doubt. Ah. He was seen a block from here, walking rapidly along the road, the bag still in his hand, by a market gardener driving into the city. The gardener knows Warwick very well by sight, having been in the habit of selling greens to the Eastbury people along this way. He says he spoke to the young man in a friendly way as he went by, but Warwick paid no attention. The gardener says he went right on without even turning his head. That seems to be definite enough, commented the secret agent. 
But that's not all, stated Osborne, with a widening of his already broad smile. You see, I got to thinking over what the market man said, and an idea struck me. Warwick was going north, while the Eastbury station is south from here. I asked a question or two, and learned that Hastings is the next station north, and a much more important one than this, by the way. A timetable told me that a New York train stopped at Hastings at 11.15. It was about 10.35 that Warwick was seen on the road. Suppose he was making for this train. I called up the Hastings stations and found that that's just what he was doing. The night operator sold the ticket to a tall young man in a light suit who carried a big leather bag and boarded the 1115. That, said Ashton Kirk, sounds rather neat and complete. I congratulate you. Osborne coughed self-consciously. I thought it was rather good myself, he said. The New York police have a detailed description and are out looking for him. I'm trying to dig up a photograph or two to send them because they're a little shy of picking people up on a description alone. Here, one of the reporters stepped up to Ashton Kirk. Pardon me, said he. My name is Evans, and I represent the Star. Oh, yes. Ashton Kirk looked at him with attention. I have noticed your work, as you are permitted to sign it. Your specialty is the comic aspect of things. Are you not somewhat out of your way on a murder case? It is unusual, but then it might not be altogether barren in results. If I can pick up a few points that will bear distortion, I might produce a novel column. He put his hands in his trousers' pockets and swayed backward and forward. I understand that you were here last night before the police arrived. Perhaps you could tell me... But here, Osborne interrupted him with a laugh. If you listen to this fellow, said he to Ashton Kirk, he'll have you saying things you never meant to say, and he'll be attaching meanings to them that you never meant to give them. Now just for that, said Evans, unruffled, I'm going to give you a panning. All right, my boy, said the big man. Go ahead, I'm used to all that. Then Osborne drew the secret agent into the hall. I'm glad you've come, said he, his face more serious than it had been all along. There's a little thing in connection with this case that has me winging. It's all right to put on before them paper fellows out there, with a nod toward the porch, because it don't do to let the people think the police can be put up a tree. It makes them lose confidence, you see. Ashton Kirk nodded. And then, if the department people show a sign of not being as well up on a subject as they might be, went on the detective, the press gets onto them and maybe puts in pictures and all that. The funny fellows like that Evans are the worst of all. I make believe I don't mind him. But honest, I'd rather go against a second-story worker with the swag on and a gun in his fist than that same young man. There was a pause and Osborne began shooting the heavy bolt of the hall door backward and forward. This is the thing that I can't get, he proceeded after a little. These bolts and locks and window fasteners, every one of them was doing business last night. The whole place was tight as it could be. Are you following me? Go on. That this young secretary fellow did for Dr. Morse, I'm positive. But whom did he have in with him? Which of the other three in the house helped him in the job? One of them did, sure. For somebody had to lock the door or window behind him when he left. That is a compact little problem in itself, said Ashton Kirk, and the solving of it might be of interest. But why devote so much attention to young Warwick? Don't forget that there may be other aspects to the case. Osborne stared at him in astonishment. "'Well, say,' spoke he, "'you do beat all sometimes. "'Of course there's other sides to the case, "'but Warwick is the center, "'and my attention is going to stick right there all the way. "'Once I nab him and get his why and wherefore, 
all the rest will be plain sailing. We have discussed methods before now, smiled Ashton Kirk, and I scarcely think there would be anything gained by going over the ground again. However, I will say this, nothing is gained by riveting one's attention upon one phase of a matter. The only effect it has is to blind one to everything else. Keep your mind open, then you will be ready to accept facts, no matter from what point they come. Osborne smiled broadly. You sound good anyway, said he. I always did like to listen to you. It's like as if you were reading out of a book. But just the same, I'm going to stick to Warwick. He's the fellow for my money. The things that we've got on him don't happen just by accident, as you'll find out when the case comes to trial. The secret agent remained in conversation with the headquarters man for some little time longer. He learned that a deputy coroner had viewed the body, and that the inquest was to be held later in the day. And say, said Osborne, as they once more went out upon the porch, which was now clear of the newspaper men, don't think because I don't hold to your way of looking at the matter that I ain't glad to have you in this. The fact is, I'm just as tickled as can be. Because you've really got some moves that are rather smooth. I know because I've watched you work them. But don't waste the good gifts by chucking them all around. Get after Warwick. There's the profitable end of this hunt. Take it from me. Osborne then went to speak to the policeman at the gate. And with Fuller, Ashton Kirk made his way around upon the north side of the house. Holding to the hedge, they slowly skirted the lawn. After a little, the secret agent paused. So, said he, and Fuller fancied there was a note of surprise in the voice. Our friend Okiu was not drawing entirely upon his imagination. Here, pointing to a ragged place in the top of the hedge, evidently only recently made, is where Warwick leaped over the fence. His foot caught, and he almost fell. See there, pointing to the opposite side. The soil is bare and soft, and his feet sank deep as he landed. The lawn was smooth and hard at the front and sides, and the grass cut very short. No trace of any sort was to be seen upon it. But at the rear, and especially close to the house, there were a number of bald places. Servants are never so careful as the family, said the secret agent. Here there were numerous tracks, one upon the other. After only a glance, Ashton Kirk passed on toward the south side of the house. Away from the rear doors, the confusion ceased, but some of the footmarks continued. Osborne has been looking about, said Ashton Kirk, pointing to a broad, blunt-toed impression. Here is his track, apparently coming from the rear door. But he did not put in much time, as the track halted and doubled upon itself. His coming out at all was merely perfunctory, I suppose, for the fact that the doors and windows were fast before and after the crime was done is enough for him. They drew nearer to the window which opened from the room in the rear of the library. Then Fuller heard an exclamation and saw his employer bend close to the ground. What is it? he asked. A woman, said Ashton Kirk. Fuller examined the ground. Sure enough, there were the tracks of a slim, delicately shod foot, the high heels having sunk deep into the soft earth. There's a man's track, too, cried Fuller, as he noted a series of heavier prints. But Ashton Kirk made no reply to this. A few rapid steps took him to the window above mentioned, and he searched the low sill. It may mean nothing after all, said Fuller. Curiosity probably induced some people to venture into the grounds this morning in order... 
A man and woman entered the back room by this window, said Ashton Kirk. I don't like to put myself in an attitude of continued protest, said Fuller, but these low windows are commonly used that way. You see, it's only a step to the lawn. Ashton Kirk nodded. As you say, he agreed. These low windows are commonly used in that way. But only when the rooms into which they open are also in common use. I see what you mean, said Fuller. This back room is private. Old Nanon said the door was always kept locked. He remained gazing at the other for a moment, apparently pondering the new aspect which this discovery gave the situation. Well, what do you think it means? A woman and a man entered this room by the window. The latter had been left unfastened, because it shows not the slightest indication of having been forced. And when they departed, the window was refastened, perhaps not at once, but as soon after as possible. You think... Fuller paused, his eyes wide. If you heard a slight noise in the back room while you were in the library, some time after the murder, what would you think? Why, we discussed that this morning, returned Fuller. It was Drevenoff, beyond a doubt. He waited in the hall after you told him to go to the police station. Then he stole into the rear room and replaced the window catch. And this being so, it was he who admitted the woman... And the man? Ashton Kirk smiled as he asked the question. The man? Fuller's face grew blank. Why, the man must have been Warwick. And if it was, after a moment, why did he require to be admitted to the house by a side window when he could have gone in by the front door? If Ashton Kirk intended to reply to this, he had no time to do so, for at that moment they heard a step behind them, and looking around, they saw the well-knit figure and expressionless face of Okiu. End of Chapter 8《Of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent》by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 9 Okiu Once More. The Japanese nodded and smiled in his peculiarly meaningless fashion the black, intent eyes going from one to the other. "'I was getting a breath of air,' said he, "'and reading a favorite book, when I happened to see you here. "'I trust you are well?' "'Quite well,' returned Ashton Kirk, with equal politeness. Okiu laid a heavy book upon a bench, patting it gently as he did so as though it were a living thing. The old books, smiled he, and his voice was soft and purring, are always hard to handle. The ancient makers did not know their trade as well as these of modern days. But, and the gracefully flexible hands gestured a pardon, they had something to put into them. The old poets told of wonderful things in most wonderful ways. Every age has its own excellences, said the secret agent, and perhaps mechanical efficiency is the high mark of our own. I fear that it is, said Okiu, in a gentle, regretful tone. Even in my own country, once so peaceful and content with the old things, this fierce desire to perform wonders has taken root. Everywhere you see the sign of the times. In the people, 
in the schools, in the governments, and... Here Ashton Kirk saw the heavy lids quiver over the intent eyes. In the army and navy. Ah, yes, said the secret agent. The army and navy. We have heard of them. And Russia, said Okiu softly, has also heard of them. Fuller, a flush staining his cheeks, was about to reply to this, but a look from his employer restrained him. And after a moment's pause, Okiu went on in another tone. Last night I offered my services if they were needed. Today I repeat the offer, sir. You are very good, said Ashton Kirk. But the police have the matter in hand, and they resent interference, as I have found. I have read the morning papers with great attention, said the Japanese. The matter as a whole is a most singular one. But, no doubt, the arrest of this young man, Warwick, will shed a light upon a great deal that is now shadowy. It will explain some things, no doubt. Some things? The Japanese bent his head forward inquiringly. Then you do not think it will explain all? What I personally think, said Ashton Kirk, is of no great consequence. The other laughed quietly. You are modest, remarked he. And sometimes, if the real truth were known, the knowledge of the man who says little is of great value. He stood back a trifle, the yellow, finely kept hand softly clasped, the round, lineless face beaming like that of a child. And for all I know, he added, purringly, you may know a great deal. You are very kind to think so, said Ashton Kirk, and the tone was so open and pleasant that Fuller wondered if he had been at fault when he had fancied that he had caught a second meaning in the words of the Oriental. I am only a student, resumed Okiu, but I may be of assistance here. And since there is nothing that I can do for you, Perhaps the police would... A gesture finished the sentence. Mr. Osborne, who has charge of the matter, is at the gate, or was a few moments ago, returned the secret agent. Thank you. I will speak to him. With a nod, the Japanese left them and walked around to the front of the house. Ashton Kirk without a word of comment upon him or his sayings, bent down and once more studied the footprints. One spot in particular seemed to attract him. It was about five feet from the window, and the ground seemed a good deal scuffed and trampled. Just here, said the secret agent, the two who were within there spent some little time in talk. There may have been some sort of an altercation between them, at least the indications are that they stamped around more than is usual in an ordinary talk. After a space, the man went around by the rear of the house, for here you see his prints lost in the confusion. But the woman went the other way, as these three sharp impressions indicate, pointing. However, the grass becomes thicker here and the sod tougher, and the signs fail. We can judge that she continued in that direction only by the fact that we failed to find any returning impressions. They continued here for a little longer. Then they made their way to the rear door and entered the kitchen. Old Nanon was busily scouring some pans. By the range sat Drevenoff. Good morning, said the secret agent as he entered. Good, Good morning. morning, they both returned. Drevenoff arose and stood, as though at their service. But the old Breton woman was as severe and erect as ever. Her thin-lipped mouth was set firmly. Her keen gray eyes looked out from under the thick gray brows. "'I am going to go over the house once more,' said Ashton Kirk. But, to the old woman, 
I shall not ask you to accompany me this time. You are not like the regular police, then, said she. They had me up and down with them for hours. And the other? The coroner's man, suggested Dravenoff. Yes, that is the one. He was even worse than the others. And the questions! Mother of God! I never heard anything like them before. As the two young men passed through the kitchen, Drevenoff spoke again. Is there anything new, gentlemen? He asked. Nothing as yet, replied Ashton Kirk. I have read the papers, said the young Pole. And I am sorry for Mr. Warwick. He was a good-natured man. Good-natured, said the old woman in a tone of contempt. Ha, yes, good-natured. I knew, said Drevenoff, that he quarreled very often with the doctor toward the last, but I never thought it would come to this. Here the pan slipped from the old woman's fingers, upset the scouring powder, and fell to the floor. Muttering angrily, she stooped to pick it up. Quarreled, said Ashton Kirk. He paused in the doorway and looked at the pole with interest. It was about Miss Stella, I think, said Drevenoff. To be sure, I know very little about it, and... You know nothing about it, Drevenoff, said the Breton woman. If you knew Simon Mills, she continued, turning upon the secret agent, you would not wonder that anyone had words with him. Uh, no, perhaps not, said Ashton Kirk, carelessly. I understand that his temper was not of the sweetest. He was about turning away when he asked of Drevenoff. How are you getting? I am better today than I have been for a week, was the answer. But it won't be for long. Before I came here, I worked in a construction gang for the Virginia and North Carolina Railroad. And the worst of the line was through low country. Sickness is thick down that way. I hope I shall not disturb Miss Corbin, said Ashton Kirk to Nanon. She gestured in the negative. She is sitting with Simon in the room opposite the one where he died, said the woman. She has been there for hours. She does not pray, and she does not cry. She just sits and stares. The secret agent and his aide reached the second floor by the rear stairs. As they paused by a window which overlooked the house occupied by Okiu, Fuller said, There is something which I have been turning over in my mind for the past hour. It occurred to me as soon as we reached here this morning. Do you recall that first drawing which Warwick showed you? It was the one which looked like this. With his forefinger, the young man drew upon the dust of the window glass the design of a long white rectangle with a shaded square at either end. From the very first, said Fuller, that thing struck me as being a sort of ground plan, so to speak. As you stood talking with Osborne a while ago, I got looking about, it seemed to me that Okiu's house and this one were very much of a size, and that the connecting plots of ground were very long and very narrow. Here, and Fuller indicated one of the squares at the end of his drawing, might be Okiu's house, and here, pointing to the second square, might be that of Dr. Morse. The intervening space might be the adjoining lawns. Ashton Kirk looked at the speaker, a curious light in his eyes. "'I wonder,' said he, "'how far you are from the truth.' Fuller entered the bathroom to remove the dust from his fingertips, and as he was toweling briskly away, he caught a glimpse, through the partly open door of a closet, of a pair of soiled shoes. In an instant he had them out. By George, he breathed. Here's a find. The shoes were light, 
and made upon a slim, well-shaped last. The heels were high, the instep arched. Except for a caking of yellowish-looking soil about the edges of the soles, they were the quintessence of feminine elegance. That is the color of the soil outside there, said Fuller, and the only person in this house to whom they could belong is Miss Corbin. Ashton Kirk took the shoes in his hand and examined them carefully at the bathroom window, which stood open. Fuller, watching him expectantly, saw his lips forming the first words of a reply. But it was never uttered. Something without attracted him, for he put down the shoes and protruded his head from the window. The latter overlooked the north side of the house and the secret agent leaned from it motionless for some moments. At length, however, he drew in his head, and Fuller was surprised to see a perplexed look upon the keen face, a baffled eagerness in the singular eyes. "'What is it?' he asked. Ashton Kirk indicated the window silently. In turn, Fuller looked out and what he saw almost made him cry out. Okiu stood below, from a window of the room in which Ninon had said she was watching the dead, leaned Stella Corbin, and the two were engaged in a low-pitched, earnest conversation. End of Chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter Ten Some Startling Intelligence. The conversation between Okiu and Miss Corbin was too low voiced for Fuller to catch any of it and in a few moments he also drew in his head. Well, said he, here's a state of things. First we find tracks which might be hers, then we come upon the shoes which she might have worn when she made them, now we see her engaged in secret conversation with a man whom we know to be... But Ashton Kirk, with an impatient gesture, stopped him. Indications are not proof, said he, as he went into the hall. Don't forget that we, ourselves, have also made tracks round about the window below. Our shoes are also more or less caked with earth, and we have both spoken to Okiu. Of course that's so, said Fuller, but nevertheless, the facts are peculiar. He followed the other along the hall, and into a room at the front of the house. But for that matter, everything having to do with this case is peculiar. I never saw a trail so snarled and crossed and recrossed. First, you get the idea of a Japanese. Then Warwick is plunged into the thing so deep that I fail to see how he's ever going to extricate himself. Thirdly, we have enough proof as to Drevenoff's complicity to put him behind the bars. And now, the probabilities are that the girl is also concerned. Ashton Kirk moved slowly about the room. It was one evidently used by Dr. Morse as a sort of lounging place, for there were sofas and big chairs and many books. At one side, near the front window, was a narrow antique desk of polished wood. It was open, and its contents had been tumbled about by the police. Ashton Kirk sat down before it, annoyed and frowning. After an Osborne and a deputy coroner have been over the ground, one could drive a herd of mules over it without causing any appreciable difference in its aspect, said he. They are as heavy-handed as draymen. And while he proceeded with a careful inspection of the contents of the desks, Fuller continued, in a complaining tone, I'd like to know what we are to make of the whole business. Is it a sort of general conspiracy against Dr. Morse? 
Are Warwick, Miss Corbin, and Drevenoff in league with the Jap for some particular purpose? Are there factions in the matter, each working for its own advantage? Or is every individual laboring for him or herself and against all the others? Mostly correspondence of a private nature, said Ashton Kirk as he ran through the papers. Contracts with publishers, notes as to lectures, and negotiations for the delivery of the same. There were some bits of jewelry of no particular value, a few small books of accounts, and various odds and ends. After some further search, he lifted the writing bed of the desk, which was also the lid, and was about to close it. Something seemed to draw his attention, and he paused. Were you ever handed a bulky book, and were surprised to find it extremely light? said he to Fuller. That oddity of thickness combined with lightness applies also to this lid. The tip of the long, inquiring finger ran along the edge of the lid. The quick, observant glance followed close behind. Instantly, Fuller caught the suggestion. That's so, said he, eagerly. It may be hollow. On each side of the lock, said Ashton Kirk, there is an inlaid strip. Look closely, and you will see slight marks at the end of each, where the point of a knife has been inserted from time to time. As he spoke, he brought his own knife into play. Out came one of the inlaid pieces, disclosing a shallow opening. But it was empty. However, the second one revealed a number of sheets of paper. With the aid of the knife blade, he managed to work these out. Then, spreading them upon the desk, the two men examined them with attention. "'Hello,' said Fuller. "'Here is that thing which I said a while ago looked like a ground plan. "'And here are the variously colored versions of the same, just as Warwick described them,' said the secret agent. "'They are precisely alike, but some are in brown, others in black, still others are in red.' while some again are in blue. And here are the ones done upon neutral paper, in white. Is it possible, do you think, questioned Fuller, that anything was meant by the differing colors? There is nothing to convince me that such is not the case, replied Ashton Kirk. Chance seldom rules in a matter of consequence. Could the change in color not be ascribed merely to the fact that the draftsman used the one that came first to his hand? It may be. But see here. The design which you say resembles a ground plan differs in color, but is always the same in shape. But here are the other drawings. First, there are a number of the crowned woman, all of which are done in brown. Then, here are several duplicates of one which I saw the first time we came here. It is a cross, and in each case the down stroke is red, and the cross stroke blue. Here the selection of color never varies, and that there was a reason for clinging to these particular colors seems pretty evident. And that there was an equally good reason for changing the colors in the first design seems to me reasonable. Yes, it would appear so, admitted Fuller, but doubtfully. Then another sheet caught his eye, and pointing to it, he inquired, But what is that? Ashton Kirk was reaching for the drawing when the question was asked. The squares of paper were exactly the size of the others, but the design upon it was totally unlike, however, and was done in heavy black. It was a picture of a human heart, and transfixing it were a number of pointed weapons resembling stilettos. "'What a murderous-looking thing!' observed Fuller. "'Much like a black hand design as illustrated in the evening papers.' Ashton Kirk did not reply. He bent down over the drawing as though inspecting it closely. Then there was a considerable pause, in which he did not stir, and Fuller, watching, noted the glaze of introspection in the singular eyes. However, this was not for long. He suddenly straightened up, 
the other design slowly passed through his hands once more. Then he arose, a smile upon his face. More than likely, that is it, said he. Is what? asked Fuller. But the other allowed the interrogation to go unheeded. Away somewhere in our memories, said he. There are many little bits of information, all ticketed and ready to the hand of the person who cares to reach back for them. Those people who go through life with their eyes open possess more of these items of recollection than those who refuse to look beyond the confines of their own affairs. But the impressionable person, the one who makes no conscious effort to retain the things that buzz like bees around him, and yet catches them all much like the record of a phonograph, has the greater resources to draw upon. I would not call you one who made no effort, said Fuller, and things must be more or less proven to make an impression upon you. I make my effort in the particular line along which my interest runs at the time, said Ashton Kirk, and it is true that the things which I then accept must be more or less solidly supported by facts. But a newspaper casually picked up, a novel read as a time-killer, a spoken word, the gesture of a stranger in the street, or the unstudied action of a child, may convey us something that will stay with us for life. And just now, said Fuller, curiously, you came upon one of those little incidents, a sort of unattached thing which throws some light upon these. And he pointed to the drawings upon the desk. Ashton Kirk nodded. Placing the sheets of paper in his coat pocket, he closed the desk. The police will have little use for these, he said. Nevertheless, I suppose I had better call Osborne's attention to them. He spent another half hour in the upper part of the house, but nothing of interest met his eye. Then they descended to the first floor, and as they did so, met Miss Corbin upon the stairs. As she saw them, a startled look came into her face. "'Good morning,' said Ashton Kirk. "'I did not know that you were here,' she said. "'There were a few trifles which I knew only daylight could show us,' he returned. "'We came more than an hour ago.' "'I did not see you go upstairs,' she said. And to Fuller there was a sort of confused resentment in her voice. "'We took the liberty of using the back stairway, that being the nearest,' explained the secret agent. There was a pause. The slim, girlish figure blocked their way. The great dark eyes were fixed upon them observantly. "'You were in my uncle's room?' she asked. "'Yes, we fancied that there might be something there of interest.' Ah, no doubt, she replied, and again Fuller's attention was called to a peculiar something in her voice. However, she said nothing more, and then, as they stood politely aside, she passed on up the stairs. The telephone bell was ringing furiously as they reached the hall. Osborne hastened from somewhere in the rear to answer it. There followed the usual one-sided and enigmatic telephone conversation, but this one was interspersed with high-pitched questions, amazed ejaculation, and wondering adjectives upon the part of the headquarters man. At last he hung up and turned to Ashton Kirk. "'Well, what do you think of that?' he cried. "'What is it?' "'That was the chief. He's just had a wire from New York.' They got on Warwick's track an hour after hearing from us, and traced him to an uptown hotel. Ah, and have they taken him? Two plainclothes men went in and a couple more stood outside. The clerk said yes, he was in his room, was registered under the name of Gordon. They went up and knocked. No answer. Knocked again. Still no answer. They broke down the door and found... What? asked Fuller that Warwick was gone. On the floor lay a traveling bag like the one he took from here. 
slashed open and empty, and beside it lay an unknown Japanese, stabbed through the heart. End of chapter 10「Eleven of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent, by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter Eleven, A Ray of Light. The late editions of the evening papers ran riot with this latest feature of the Morse case. The New York police by happy chance, had pounced upon the warm trail as soon as the young Englishman stepped from the train. What followed was so totally unexpected by the authorities that it sent them into a violent state of agitation. This they at once communicated to the ever-receptive yellows, and then the public received more than its due share of the developments as served upon scores of front pages. Who the Japanese is, is a mystery to the police and the hotel people, declared the star in triple-leaded feature type. How he got into the hotel and up to Warwick's room is as yet a thing which, so they claim, has baffled the best efforts of all concerned. But what he meant to do when he reached the room is, in the opinion of this journal, a matter that will prove infinitely more taxing upon the wit of the detective department. Fuller read column after column of such comment. The various people who had figured in the matter were separately interviewed, and their ideas were given much space. The railway porter, who had sprung into fame by recognizing Warwick, and who had had the awesome experience of carrying the much-spoken-of leather bag from the day coach to the cab outside, related his feelings when he later became aware of his patron's identity and told of his hunt for the policeman who had given him the young man's description. The cabman also talked thrillingly, as did the clerk and the bellboy who led the detectives to the door of Warwick's room. As for the police, they appeared to have maintained an attitude of much wisdom. What utterances they condescended to make were of a peculiarly Delphic character, and, as is usual, they hinted at astonishing revelations which limited periods of time would bring forth. "'They are now deep in the case,' stated the standard, hopefully. "'And a little time may work wonders. A half-dozen experienced man-hunters are running out the various fine threads which stretch away in as many directions. Each of them has a hopeful outlook, and is confident of ultimate success.' And this intelligent force has been recruited by Osborne, a local man of acknowledged parts, who is handling the parent stem, so to speak, of this exotic crime growth. Mr. Osborne will familiarize himself with this new phase of the case, and will then be ready to take up his task here with renewed vigor. For experienced people, commented Fuller, as he cast the sheets from him, I think the publishers of newspapers are the most gullible in the world. Day after day they apparently stand for the same old explanation. Day after day they seem to be taken in by the same old conventional lies. A short man, with a bulging chest and surprisingly broad shoulders, sat opposite the speaker. He stroked his prominent jaw as he remarked, They are as wise as anyone else and they feed that sort of pablum to the public, because they think it wants it. They know how the regular police work, but they say nothing, because they don't think their readers are interested in hearing about it. The fellow who takes an evening paper home to read after business would much rather believe that Osborne is a remarkable detective than just a fair mechanic who was dragged away by ward politics from his natural job of gas-fitting. I suppose you are right, Burgess, replied Fuller. There is more interest in the first, I admit. But between you and me, I don't think Osborne ever cleared up a case yet that he didn't get the rights of just by sheer luck. And he knows it, said Burgess. And what's more, he is firmly convinced that that is the only way a case can be cleared. He trusts to luck in every instance. I expected that you would be sent to New York to look up this hotel matter, said Fuller. 
as he sat back in Ashton Kirk's lounging chair and stretched his legs out in luxurious comfort. Oh, I've been looking up that fellow Karkowski, said Burgess. The boss sent O'Neill over on the Warwick end. O'Neill is pretty smooth, you know, and is just the fellow to get along with the regular police and work all they know out of them, if there is anything. How does Karkowski look? questioned the other. I haven't got sight of him yet. Seems to be a queer sort of bird, and flies only at night. And now that the police have got so interested in looking for him, he's apt to get more difficult to outguess than before. Have they muddled up the trail? In the usual way, with a disgusted wave of the hand. Brass band methods, you know. They follow him with drums beating and then wonder why they don't catch him. At this moment, there was a step at the door, and Ashton Kirk entered. He wore evening clothes with an overcoat over them. A silk hat was on his head, and he carried his gloves and stick, as though he had just come in. There was only one light burning in the room, and it threw his gigantic shadow upon the wall. "'How are you?' he said to Burgess. "'Anything to report?' There it is in the envelope as far as I have gone, replied Burgess. But there is nothing very vital. Karkowski seems as elusive as anyone that I know of. Ashton Kirk nodded. He took up the envelope and opened it. There were several closely typed sheets, and his eye ran over them quickly. The report was as follows. Notes on Karkowski. The keeper of the harness shop at 4th Street and Corinth Avenue is of the name of Andrew Breckling. He is a Pole and has been in this country for five years. Karkowski was unknown to his landlord in every way, save that of a lodger. He rented a third-story room and lived in it almost a month. He had few callers. The harness maker does not remember anyone of the name of Drevenoff and is quite sure that no young man of the description which you gave me of Drevenoff ever came there. I made a great many inquiries in the neighborhood, but learned little. A grocer told me that Karkowski purchased many articles from him, and appeared to have plenty of means. He also said that while the pole was voluble upon most things, he never spoke of himself or his affairs. Then I found from the harness maker that Karkowski had spent a good bit of his time at a branch of the city library, which was no great distance away from his lodgings. Thinking this might, on and off chance, turn some light on the matter, I went there. The young woman in charge recalled Karkowski perfectly, although she did not know his name. He had always been good-natured and smiling, and always read the one kind of books— scientific philosophy of the most modern type. Once, he told her that all the other books in the place should be burnt. Having reached the end of the report, Ashton Kirk took off his coat and hat and laid the report upon the table. "'Have you made any further attempts?' he asked of Burgess. "'I've been hunting for some trace of him all day,' replied the man. "'But it's tough work.' He went off without anyone seeing him, and I haven't a thing to dig a claw into. Was there nothing left in his room? Nothing that would indicate what his intentions were? Not a shred of anything. You see, he had rented the place ready furnished, and the police were there ahead of me. Take the matter up again tomorrow. If nothing develops, let me know, and we will make a fresh beginning over the same route. Mr. Karkowski has been, so it appears, an important figure in this matter, and it would be just as well to know where we can put our hands upon him when we want him. After a brief conversation relating to the details of the work that Burgess had done, that gentleman departed. Ashton Kirk rolled a cigarette and sat down in the big chair which Fuller had vacated. Then he drew toward him a number of books which lay upon the table. These, said he, were kindly loaned me by Father O'Leary of the Church of the Holy Redeemer, and the information they contain is quaint and most valuable. They are rather out of your line, are they not? questioned the other, 
as he took up one of the volumes and looked at the title. It was a Life of St. Simon Stock. Nothing is out of my line, said Ashton Kirk. I have, as you know, seized some of my most helpful assistance from what might be regarded as a most unpromising source. He took the little book from his aide's hand and ran over its pages. In what way, asked he, can a biography of St. Simon Stock help me to save the United States from an international embarrassment and, incidentally, give me more information upon the subject of the murder of Dr. Morse? Fuller shook his head. I don't know said he. But, if you say it will do so, I'm perfectly willing to believe it. The other smiled. You have been with me for several years, Fuller, he said, and your clerical work is very complete. Your investigations, when you are given a definite point to work upon, are also satisfying. But you stop there. I should think that by this time, you would have begun to weigh the different problems which come up and reason them out for yourself. Again, Fuller shook his head. I've got a pretty good kind of a brain, said he. People who know have considered me a first-class accountant, and I'm a perfect storehouse for certain kinds of facts. But it's not your kind of brain. For ages of effort would pass, and not once, would I dream of trying to gain information as to the death of a resident of Eastbury from a parcel of books like these? I suppose you are right, my boy, said Ashton Kirk. Different types of mind have different tendencies. He continued fluttering the leaves of the book, the pale smoke of the cigarette drifting formlessly about him. Then he went on, Perhaps it does seem rather an extraordinary thing to expect a monk of the 13th century to aid in solving the present problem. But let us go further into the matter, and we may possibly get some light. He laid the burnt end in the shell upon the table and rolled another cigarette, and while he did so, he talked. Simon Stock was an Englishman and was a native of Kent. At the age of twelve he is said to have left his home and lived in a hollow tree. The Oriental idea had penetrated the West, and Europe was filled with anchorites. Some monks of the Order of Mount Carmel entered England from the Holy Lands, and Simon, now a man of mature years, joined them. There is a legend that he was directed to do so by a supernatural agency, but Catholic scholars seem to pay little attention to this. At any rate, time passed, and the Kentish man, famous for great piety and virtue, was finally made General of the White Friars, a name by which the Carmelite order was known. Again, legend plays its part. As he knelt one day in prayer in his monastery at Cambridge, the Virgin Mary is said to have manifested herself to him and presented him with the scapular. I have a sort of hazy notion as to what that is, said Fuller, but not enough to work on. It was originally a sort of habit which the monks wore over their other garments, replied Ashton Kirk. But from St. Simon Stock's day, it altered in appearance. It became two squares of cloth fastened by two pieces of tape and was worn around the neck by those persons who desired to benefit by its privileges. When stretched out on a flat surface, its appearance, went on the speaker, as he took up a pencil and drew a few rapid lines upon the margin of a newspaper, was something like this. Fuller's eyes opened in wonder. Why, he cried, that is exactly like the drawing sent so frequently to Dr. Morse. Ashton Kirk laughed quietly. Already, said he, you are beginning to see the use of Father O'Leary's books. And perhaps, as we go on, your vision will become wider still. There was a moment's pause. 
Then the speaker continued. There is another scapular besides that of St. Simon. It is the Trinitarian, which was brought forward by an order of that name, founded by John de Matha and Felix de Valois for the redemption of captives. These religious wore a white habit with a cross upon the breast. A theatine nun named Ursula Benincasa originated still another scapular, that of the Immaculate Conception, which is of light blue. An Italian order, called the Servites, introduced another, this time of black, and the Sisters of Charity of Paris brought forward still another of scarlet. Ashton Kirk's pencil tapped upon the drawing which he had made upon the margin of the newspaper. Dr. Morse had this design sent to him in all the colors named. First came the brown, then there was blue, white, black, and red. When the gamut, so to speak, of colors had been run, he received the picture of the crowned woman, done in brown. This is now very easy to explain. The sender, for some reason, had called attention to the various sorts of scapulars, and was beginning all over again. The Carmelite scapular is of brown, and bears a picture of the Virgin Mary, hence the woman wearing the crown. Then came the cross which I was shown upon my first visit to the Morse house. Its downstroke of blue and crossstroke of red is the same as the device upon the white scapular of the Trinitarians. But, however, all this would never have been dreamed of by me if it had not been for the third picture as found by us in the secret drawer of Dr. Morse's desk. With the pencil, Ashton Kirk sketched a human heart, transfixed by numerous daggers. When this caught my eye, he continued, I could feel the stirring of a memory, one of those which I spoke of as being ticketed and ready to hand with a smile. Was it the heart which awoke this dim feeling of familiarity? No. Was it the daggers? Again, no. Then it must be the general idea, a heart pierced by daggers. At this, I felt the memory struggle desperately in the brain cell. Then, suddenly, it broke out. I had seen the design upon a bit of laced card in the show window of a religious goods store when a boy. I recalled the title printed at the bottom of the card perfectly. It was the Seven Dollars. The memory of this was specially keen, for I had not known what was meant by dollars, and had gone to a dictionary and found that they represented sorrows or pangs. This all came back like a flash and instantly I counted the daggers transfixing the heart in the drawing. They were exactly seven. I was now convinced that the whole matter of the drawings had a religious aspect and looked at them with a different eye. The cross was self-evident. The crowned woman could be none other than the Virgin Mary. However, it was not until I had consulted Father O'Leary that I got to the bottom of the matter. With the other things made plain to him, he instantly recognized this as the outline of the scapular, tapping the marginal sketch upon the newspaper. For a few moments, Fuller was silent. Then he said, That was a clever stroke, and it might go a long distance toward making some other things plain. But, and he shook his head in a rather hopeless way, I confess that I don't see the reason for all these things being sent to Dr. Morse. In fact, there doesn't seem to be any sort of reason in it. Ashton Kirk arose. There is seldom any reason in things which we do not understand, said he. But it often happens that when we do come to understand them, we find the reasons behind them solid and far-reaching enough. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 12. Karkowski Gets Some Attention. The next morning, contrary to Fuller's expectations, Ashton Kirk did not start out on a fresh trail. The discovery, as developed the night before, was so curious that the young man was quite sure that it would immediately lead to more surprising revelations. So he was greatly astonished when he reached the old-fashioned house to learn from Stumpf that the secret agent had gone into the country. He took his fishing rods, explained Stumpf, and went to Jordan's mills. He said he'd be back tomorrow. He's gone down there to think things out, Fuller told himself other occasions of the same sort fresh in his mind a pipe a green bank under a tree and a painted float to watch are fine things to make thoughts run they just seem to drift along with the current sure enough the next afternoon ashton kirk came back there was a keen vigorous look about him that told of a freshening such as his aide had pictured he heard what Burgess had to say regarding his hunt for Karkowski as soon as he arrived, for the man was waiting for him. "'He's gone completely so far as I can make out,' the broad-shouldered man informed him. "'There's not a trace to be found in any direction. I've questioned everybody I could find in the section who was acquainted with him, but they knew only his name and thought him a pretty good sort of fellow.' Ashton Kirk said little in reply but his manners showed that he was far from satisfied. After dinner, he smoked and walked about his study. Then he went to his room. A half hour later, a tall, cadaverous-looking person, in a black coat and with a silk hat, the nap of which was well worn, came down the stairs. To Stumpf, he said, I shall be back in a few hours, perhaps, but should anyone call, say that I will see him in the morning. Very well, sir, said Stumpf gravely. It was just fading from the late twilight to the early shadows of evening when the cadaverous man turned the corner and headed toward Fourth Street. His shoulders were bent and his gait was shuffling. The thread gloves which he wore were broken in places here and there, and the black coat was a trifle short in the sleeves. But he attracted little or no attention, for in that neighborhood shabby characters were frequent enough. When once he got into his stride, it was astonishing to see how he covered the ground for all the shuffle. At Fourth Street and Corinth Avenue, he halted and looked about. It was now dark. The street lights were throwing their pale blue rays into the hidden corners of the dirty highways. Upon stoop and cellar doors, throngs of soiled-looking men and women were congregated. Hordes of children were all about, and their cries were shrill and incessant. Breckling, said a man with a peddler's cart. Oh, yes, his place is there on the corner. A yellow gaslight burned dimly in the harness shop when the man in the worn top hat entered. There was a heavy smell of leather and oil. The floor was littered with scraps, and the broken parts of many sets of harness were stacked up in the rear. A small man with round spectacles and a dirty apron came forward. He had been reading a Polish newspaper under the dim light. "'Well, sir,' said he inquiringly and with a marked accent. What can I do for you this evening? You have rooms to rent, I believe, said the other in a shaky sort of voice. Instantly the small man was all attention. He put down his newspaper and beamed through his glasses at the stranger. I have one room, said he. It is on the third floor, but it is a good room and well furnished. Will you look at it? Yes, if you please, quavered the man with the bent shoulders. The little harness maker lighted a candle and led the way to a staircase at the side, which opened into the street. 
A troop of children had possession of it, and their shrill outcries as they ran up and down were deafening. Like a fury, the pole ran among them, scattering them right and left. But they are good children, he told the prospective tenant, and they make very little noise. The room was small and had a window opening upon a court. The furniture was scant and the floor was bare. Once, confessed the little harness maker, I had the carpet for it, but there were so many holes in it at last that I took it up. Some day, hopefully, I will get another. The other gave a glance about. I shall take it if it is not too much. Six dollars a month is not too much, said the tradesman landlord. It is worth more. I'll give you five, stated the other in his shaky voice. The pole gestured his despair. The candle went up and down, and the two huge shadows jigged grotesquely upon the wall. It is worth six, he said. The last tenant paid that much without a word. He was rich, suggested the other. No one but a man of means would pay that. He was not rich, protested Breckling. He was poor as a rat. I know that, for he was a countryman of mine, and there are no rich poles. The man with the bent shoulders counted out five dollars in small coin upon a table. I will pay a month in advance, said he. The little man looked at the pile of silver for a moment. Unable to resist, he said, Very well, I will take it, but the room is worth more. He scraped up the money and put it away in his pocket. The other took off his hat and laid it upon the table and looked about with the manner of a man at home. Have you any other lodgers? he asked. There are three families on the floor below, and then there are a few mechanics on this. But they are all decent people, earnestly. Sometimes they take a little too much, but not often. You will find that they are quiet enough. Then, after a look at his new tenant, you will move in at once? Tomorrow. And now, if you don't mind, I should like to be left alone. Of course, said the little harness maker. Of course. And so he went out and down the stairs to his shop. If he had been a curious man and had loitered on the landing and put his eye to the keyhole, he would have witnessed an unusual sight. For the door had no sooner closed behind them then the cadaverous-looking man altered in appearance like an enchanted prince in a fairy tale. The bent shoulders disappeared. The tread as he moved swiftly about the room was firm and noiseless. The face became keen and resolute, the eyes alert and eager. He drew off the long black coat and with sleeves tucked up began a searching examination of the room. The closet the bureau, the washstand came first, then the edges of the floor. The contents of a small sheet-iron stove were dragged out. Amid the coal ash was much burnt paper, but apparently nothing that brought the searcher any reward. After about an hour, he stood in the center of the room, defeated. Friend Karkowski is a careful man, he muttered. There is not a scrap of anything. He put on his coat and hat and left the room. Once outside the door, the shuffle reappeared in his gait. The cadaverous look returned, and the shoulders bent wearily. In the shop, the harness maker was once more engaged with the Polish newspaper. He looked up as his new tenant came in. Your last lodger was not careful, complained the latter in his shaky voice. The room is in quite a state. But I will fix it, announced the Pole accommodatingly. I always treat my lodgers right, never as one complained. But I often had to complain. Now that same man, the one that had your room last, gave me much trouble. 
Would you believe it? The police came at last. Ah, uh, yes. He was a disturber. No, no. Indeed, he was very quiet. Even when the other lodgers made the noise, he did not get mad. The only person he ever quarreled with was Jackson. And who is Jackson? He is the postman. It was something about letters that they fought over. Once Karkowski called the letter man a dunce, but Jackson only laughed. An hour later, in his study, Ashton Kirk took down the telephone receiver and asked for a certain number. When he was connected, he asked, Is that Postal Station 7? It is, came the reply. Can you give me the address of Postman Jackson attached to that station? No, but I can tell you where you can get him if you want him tonight. I'll be obliged to you. Call up Wonderly's place. He's sure to be there at this hour, playing pinochle in the back room. The number's 3579 Parkside. In a few moments, the secret agent had Mr. Jackson on the wire. I want to speak to you about Karkowski, lately on your route, said he. There was a laugh at the other end. Then the postman answered. This ain't the police. Not exactly, but something of the sort. Well, I've kind of expected that somebody would ask me about that old scout. They seem to have asked everybody else. Would you mind telling me about the trouble you had with him regarding some letters? Oh, that! Sure. You see, Karkowski, for the first while that he lived at Breckling's place, received a letter a couple of times a week that always got my attention. It was in a woman's writing, kind of a foreign writing that was mighty hard to make out. It was always a brown square envelope, and it was always postmarked at Central Station. I couldn't tell you all this about most of the letters I handle, but this one gave me so much trouble at first finding out what the address was that I knew it by heart. One day, I handed one of them to Karkowski, and he threw it back at me. That's not for me, he said. And sure enough, it wasn't. It was for another party a couple of blocks away, a party that was new to my route. This same mistake happened a couple of times, me being so used to the letters that I never looked at them twice. And every time, old Karkowski got his back up. One day, I kidded him about losing his girl and said I guessed some other fellow had won her out, seeing that he was getting all the letters. And Karkowski swore. He called me some hard names that day, and threatened to report me. So I cut out the jokes. When the letters began arriving for the second person, they ceased for Karkowski? Right away. He never got another one. There was a moment's silence. Then the secret agent asked, can you recall this other person's name? Oh, yes. It's Kendrick. He lives on the top floor of 424 Low Street. After Ashton Kirk had hung up, he sat for a few moments, a peculiar expression on his face. Then he pressed one of the row of buttons. While awaiting a response, he penciled a few lines upon a tablet. When Fuller came in, he tore off the sheet and handed it to him. Give this to Burgess, he requested. Have him look this person up quietly. Tell him to work undercover as much as possible, and to especially note if he has any women visitors. Very well, said Fuller, and turning, he left the room. End of Chapter Twelve Chapter 13 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent, by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 13. Old Nanon Speaks. Ashton Kirk was at breakfast next morning when Fuller entered. I beg pardon, said the assistant but I've just had a call from Burgess, and I thought you'd like to hear what he had to say. Good. Let's have it. 
He went to 424 Low Street last night, after I gave him your instructions. It's a large building, once used as a factory, but now rearranged as an apartment house. There was a gas-lighted sign over the door, which said rooms might be had. Burgess took one on the fourth floor, and in a conversation with the caretaker, mentioned that he had a friend, a Pole, who had lived there. Do you know Kendrick, says the caretaker? He's right across the hall from you. But Burgess says no, that's not the name. And when the man went away, he waited a while, and then knocked at the door opposite. The person who opened in answer to the knock was a middle-aged man, stout and with grayish hair. Burgess said he was enough like the description we had of Karkowski to be his twin brother. Ashton Kirk set down his coffee cup, a smile upon his face. It is Karkowski himself, just as I expected, said he. But, glancing at Fuller, what happened then? Burgess merely asked if he could bother him for a match, which the stout man provided willingly enough, and then promptly closed his door. Nothing more? That is all so far. What do the papers report that is new? Nothing, except that Osborne has returned, and will now plunge into the intricacies of the case with renewed zeal. They seem to suspect him of having made wonderful discoveries of some sort. Have you heard anything from Purvis? Yes. He reports that no one but Drevenoff has made any movement away from the house in Fordham Road, Eastbury and that he has merely walked about a little, apparently for exercise, or gone to the nearest post-box to mail some letters. Dr. Morse is to be buried today, I believe. Yes, at about noon. It was at that hour that Stumpf entered the study. There is a woman below, sir, said he. She is quite old and quite remarkable. She wishes to speak to you and says that I am to inform you that she is from Dr. Morse's. Bring her up. Old Nanon came in a few moments later, grim, erect, and angular. Her keen eyes seemed somewhat sunken, and her wrinkled face more gaunt. But her glance was as sharp as ever, and her mouth was set in the same stern line. You are surprised she said, when she had seated herself and studied him for a moment. You thought that because Simon Merce was being carried to the grave that I, an old servant of his family, would remain near him to the last. It's the sort of thing that's usually expected, said the secret agent. No one who knows would expect it from me, said the old woman. No one who knows would expect it from me, she repeated, her lips forming the words slowly, and her gray head swaying from side to side. I knew him from a child. He was evil, possessed of evil. And what he was in the last days of his life? So he was always. Ashton Kirk said nothing. He remained gazing at the old Breton woman, his hands clasping his knee and his head tilted so as to rest upon the back of his chair. There was never any other in the family like him, she continued. Not one. I have known them for four generations. His great-grandmother it was who employed me first. I was a girl then and she was good to me. They were all good to me, and I remained with them and served them as well as I could. There must have been something wicked in them somewhere, something hidden and black, and in this sun it showed itself. Here her voice lowered, and she leaned toward the secret agent. In Brittany there is a belief that there are those gifted with a strange vision. Have I that, I wonder? Sometimes I have thought so. For it was I alone who saw Simon Merce entirely as he was. To be sure, 
Others have heard him blaspheme, and still others have read his books. But I alone knew him for what he was. The secret agent still sat attentively silent. If he wondered what all this would eventually lead to, he made no sign. I have always been thankful, proceeded Nanon, that only one of the family was so cursed. All those who had gone before were mild and religious and gentle. And because of this, I felt I should not desert this tainted one, but remain and strive with him, even if it did no good. She paused for a moment, and the bony old hands, with their thick blue veins, were locked tightly together. Yes, she resumed, I was always thankful that only one of them was evil of heart. But now, whisperingly, I am not so sure that I have even that to be thankful for. A faint wrinkle showed itself between the eyes of Ashton Kirk, but other than this, he made no sign that he was disturbed. Love, said the old woman, after a few moments, is the one thing which is thought to be the character of what is bad. Through love, I have heard it said, the fair-hearted influences the wrongdoer. It is as a bridge between them over which is passed the saving grace. That is what everyone says. But, and there was a note in her voice which was almost savage, is it true? And if it works one way, why should it not work the other? If good passes between two people because they love each other, why should not evil? And, very slowly, Simon Merce and his niece were much attached to each other. Through the open window, the roar of midday arose from the street. The throaty voices of peddlers, the grind of wheels, and the warning cries of drivers were ceaseless. And below all this was an undertone, a subdued, murmurous undertone, such as is made by cautious creatures, each with a private design. Sometimes, said the old woman, things are expected, and when they come, they create no surprise. And again, there are others, which are so unexpected that they all but crush one to the earth. Ashton Kirk nodded. Something unexpected has happened, he said. You shall hear all for yourself, said the old servant. It was for that purpose that I came to you. She settled herself rigidly in her chair, upright, unbending, full of purpose. I have read the newspapers, she said. I have heard the police and the coroner's deputy. They have all said much, and in the end their talk comes to this. Philip Warwick murdered Simon Merce. Perhaps, and her gray eyes searched his face, you too think so. But no matter. I tell you, and I know, that he did not do this thing. There was a moment's silence. Then Ashton Kirk said, quietly, Then who did? She gestured with both hands. Because I say that I know that he did not, she replied, does it follow that I must know who did? She waited for an answer, but as none came, she went on. You have heard that Philip Warwick and Stella Corbin were to be married? I thought so. He is a very boyish fellow. He was proud of her, and told everyone. I was glad when I heard it, for I thought them well mated. 
but Simon was not pleased. The young man perhaps would not follow where he led. At any rate, he disliked him. They quite frequently had high words. But Mr. Warwick never allowed himself to go too far in his resentment. At least never until lately. The day that you first visited the house, they almost came to blows. And on the night that Simon was killed, he actually struck his secretary. This was not told to the police, said the secret agent. Why? I was the only one that saw it, said the old woman. And I did not tell of it, because I knew that it would only make them suspect the young man all the more. Go on, said Ashton Kirk. This is how I came to be a witness to what passed between them. I had gone to the front door to answer a ring, but it was only a person to inquire about someone who had lately left a house across the street. As I closed the door, I saw that of the library ajar, and through the opening I saw Dr. Merce and Mr. Warwick standing facing each other. Very well, then, Mr. Warwick was saying. It shall be done in spite of you. And with that, the other lifted his hand, and I heard the sound of the blow even where I stood. Did Warwick return it? I think not. I did not wait to see, however, but went on along the hall. I turned, though, as I reached the end, and saw Mr. Warwick step out of the library and walk toward the stairs. He had gone up perhaps three steps when he stopped and was about to turn back. But though he was fairly shaking with anger, he thought better of it and went on up to his room. At what time was this? Immediately after dinner. If such a thing were possible, the old woman sat more erect than ever, the craggy brows bent over the sharp eyes, and the voice sank a tone lower. And as Philip Warwick went up the stairs, I saw Miss Stella come out of the room opposite the library. She stood looking after him, and on her face was a look which I had never noticed there before. She had seen what had happened, and for some reason was glad of it. There was nothing more, until I left the front door some time later and went to the kitchen to make the coffee. Then I heard something on the back stairs. Thinking it might be driven off, taken bad, I opened the door. But it was Miss Stella and Mr. Warwick. They stood on the landing and were talking in low tones. I could not help overhearing what they said, and I remember it, because I have repeated it over and over to myself a thousand times since then. Is it possible? Mr. Warwick said. Have you really got it? I did not hear what was said in answer, and then he spoke again. But how in the world did you manage it? I know he thinks a great deal of you, but I never dreamed that he'd give. Here she must have stopped him by putting her fingers to his lips, the way that she had. Don't stop to talk, I heard Miss Stella say. You must go at once, and no matter what you hear, do not return until I send you word. Then I closed the door softly as they stole downstairs, and after a little again came the soft footfalls, this time going up the stairs. There was a pause, and then the old woman crossed her hands in her lap, her eyes looking sternly into the face of Ashton Kirk. It was only a few minutes after that, she said, that I found Simon Mouse dead in his chair. End of chapter 13
Chapter 14 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 14 Okiu Writes a Letter. Ashton Kirk, a short time after the old servant woman left, rang for Fuller. When the latter entered, he found his employer writing a telegram. "'Have you heard anything from O'Neill?' asked the secret agent. "'This morning, yes. He merely said that he was still trying to strike the trail of Philip Warwick.' Ashton Kirk held out the telegram. "'Send him this,' said he, briefly. Fuller glanced at the yellow sheet, and then whistled amazedly. However, he said nothing, but instantly left the room. The morning mail lay neglected upon the table. Some were sharp, business-like envelopes, bearing downright statements as to the sender's identity. Others were big and square, while a number were small and dainty. A few were remarkable after the same manner that an oddly-dressed man is remarkable. And to one of these latter, the eye of the secret agent was first attracted. It's hardly to be wondered at, he mused, as he held up the envelope and studied its characteristics, that the postman should have mentally marked the letters received by Karkowski. There seems an individuality about each piece of mail that must almost unconsciously impress the person handling it. A strange style of handwriting is like a strange face, the very manner of sticking on a stamp might give very clear indications as to another's mental process. He cut open the flap of the envelope. When he unfolded the sheet and closed, he glanced at the signature. Then he lay back in his chair, a smile upon his face. Okiu, he murmured. I was beginning to wonder what his first move would be. Still smiling, he held the letter up once more, and read, My dear Mr. Ashton Kirk, I was most happy to meet you upon several occasions recently. But, believe me, I had no actual realization of what you were, or I should have been overcome. To think that you know my own language, that you have studied the literature of Nippon, that you have even written a most delightful appreciation of it. And all the time I was ignorant of this. It grieves me to think that you might consider me amiss in this, and so I try to make amends. May I not greet you at my house? I can show you some Japanese and Korean manuscripts which no Caucasian has ever laid eyes on before. And also I have rare books which may afford you some pleasure to see. I should be gratified to have you call tonight. If it can be managed, have someone telephone me. And, in the formal way of my country, I am, most honorable sir, at your feet, Okiu. For some time, Ashton Kirk lay back in his big chair, the smile still on his lips. Then Fuller came in. O'Neill will be astonished when he gets that wire, he said. Ashton Kirk tossed him the letter. Answer this, said he, lazily. Say that I'll come. Fuller read the letter through without comment. Then he went to the telephone and did as directed. When he had finished, he turned to the other. The Jap has made up his mind to something, he said. He made up his mind upon our first meeting, replied Ashton Kirk. He has now decided what he will do. Fuller shook his head. Look out for him, he warned. He's dangerous. Ashton Kirk yawned. The bird or beast of prey is marked by nature, he said, and there is no movement they make that is not in itself a warning. There was nothing more said for some little time. The secret agent read his mail, and indicated upon each letter back what his answer was to be. 
These he passed to Fuller, who read them over and arranged them for answering. But after finishing his work, the young man did not retire at once, as was his custom. He hesitated for a few moments, and then said, Don't think that I'm taken with the idea that I can run this case better than you. But last night after I left here, I got to going over the matter, and there are some things about it that troubled me. Ashton Kirk nodded. You are not exactly alone in that, he answered. Several times I have seen what I fancied must be the bottom of the affair, but in almost the next breath something happened which changed my mind. This morning I was ready to indicate to Osborne what steps to take to secure the assassin of Dr. Morse. But again I received information that brought me to a standstill. You found that you were mistaken as to the guilty person? asked Fuller curiously. But the other did not reply to this. Just what are the things which you say troubled you? he asked. First of all, the fact that this fellow Drevenoff has the free run of the Eastbury house. Suppose Warwick did not, after all, make off with the state paper you are seeking. Very likely, it is still in the house. You know that the Pole is searching for it. At any moment he may find it. And if he does, how easy it would be for him to slip it in an envelope and mail it to a confederate. There is very little danger of his coming upon it now, said Ashton Kirk quietly. Fuller looked at him swiftly. You have learned then that it is not in the house? He said. Ashton Kirk shook his head. As to that, said he, I am not sure. But, and the singular eyes half closed as he spoke, perhaps it does not make a great deal of difference. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent, by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 15 Almost After dinner that evening, Ashton Kirk looked over the last edition of the papers. About eight o'clock, he arose stretched himself contentedly, and then went to a stand, a drawer of which he pulled open. From this he took several black, squat-looking pistols of the automatic type, and one by one balanced them in his hand. Selecting the one which struck his fancy, he slipped it into his pocket, and prepared to go out. "'Shall you leave any word, sir?' asked Stumpf, in the lower hall. The secret agent paused for a moment. Then he scribbled something on a card and gave it to the man. If I do not return by morning, get Fuller on the telephone and read this to him, said he. Very good, sir. At the station, Ashton Kirk was forced to wait some little time for a train. And when, finally, he rang the bell at Oakview's door in Eastbury, it was a trifle past nine o'clock. There was a delay after he rang. The house was gloomy, and not a light showed at any of the windows. From all indications, it may have been deserted. But through the tail of his eye, he caught a slight stirring of a curtain at a window upon the lower floor. They seem to be very careful, mused the secret agent. I am much favored, as, apparently, they do not admit anyone who is not thoroughly convincing. After another brief space, the door was opened. Ashton Kirk saw a dim hall and a short man of enormous girth. Mr. Okiu, asked the secret agent. He is at home, replied the fat man. Who are you? The secret agent gave his name and at once the man stood aside. "'I will tell him that you are here,' said he, as Ashton Kirk entered. "'Will you sit down?' 
he indicated a hall chair with much politeness. But Ashton Kirk nodded and remained standing. There was a single incandescent lamp burning in the hall, and its yellow rays barely lit up the dark corners. At the end was a railed stairway which led to the rooms above. And along the hall there was a dark array of tightly closed doors. However, these things got but a glance from the secret agent. The Japanese who had admitted him attracted his notice. This latter had a huge round head and a fat, brutal face, and his immense body gave him the appearance of an overfed animal. His skin glistened with a high-smelling oil. When he moved, its scent was particularly heavy and unpleasant. Everything about him seemed to promise inertia, ponderous movements, shortness of breath. But this promise was not kept, for he passed down the hall with a light, quick step. Then he sprang at the staircase and went bounding up like an enormous rubber ball. There was something in this so unexpected, so utterly tiger-like, that Ashton Kirk felt the nerves of his scalp prickle. Rather a formidable sort, he murmured, and as he spoke, his hand went to the outer coat pocket, as though to assure himself that the squat black pistol was still there. One might hold him off and hit him to pieces, but let him break down a guard and come to grappling and he'd afford astonishing entertainment. In a few moments, the fat man reappeared. He paused halfway down the stairway, and the light rays were reflected in his slanting eyes as he fixed them upon the secret agent. "'You will come with me, please,' he said. Unhesitatingly, Ashton Kirk followed him up the stairs and along a hall upon the second floor. A door at the rear stood open, and at a round table, under a powerful light, sat Okiu. At sight of the visitor, this latter arose, a welcoming smile upon his placid face. "'Sir,' said he, "'you are too good. I am delighted beyond measure.' Ashton Kirk shook the outheld hand. "'I am pleased to be asked here,' said he. I could have hoped for nothing that would have agreed so well with my inclinations. The heavy lids partially veiled the black, searching eyes of the Japanese, but the bland, childlike face was as expressionless as before. "'You are polite,' smiled Okiu, still shaking the secret agent's hand. "'But I knew you would be so. All persons of real parts are kind.' and ready to place the stranger at his ease. Then, turning to the other Japanese, who remained waiting in the doorway, he added, Sorokicha, give the gentleman a chair. With rapid, soft, tiger-like steps, Sorokicha advanced. Lifting a high-backed chair, he placed it at the side of the table opposite where Okiu had been sitting and when the secret agent walked around the table, he came face to face with the man as he was about to leave the room. Sorokicha, said Ashton Kirk, I think you have been a wrestler. The brutal face became a mass of yellow corrugations. A set of broad, well-worn teeth shone whitely. I have been a champion, said he proudly. Ashton Kirk nodded, and critically, his keen eyes ran over the monstrous form before him. "'You are strong,' said he. Then, darting out one of his slim hands, he grasped the thick wrist of the wrestler. Instantly the man caught the meaning of the act, and his huge, blubber-like body grew rigid with effort. There was a pause full of striving. The eyes of the two were savage. The teeth shut tightly, the breath swelling in the lungs. Then, slowly, the thick arm of the Oriental bent upward, until the clinched hand touched the shoulder. And at this, Ashton Kirk released him, 
and stepped back. For a moment, the amazement which the wrestler felt was plain. But again, the fat face broke into yellow corrugations. You too are strong, said he, but it was a trick. The proper use of strength is made up of tricks, answered Ashton Kirk, simply. Okiu had witnessed this little incident with a smiling calm, and now he said to his countrymen, And so, my friend, you have met your match at hand grasps? I told you it would be so. But, and he turned to Ashton Kirk, I did not expect to see it in a man like you. There was a curiously speculative look in the half-closed eyes as they examined the tall, well-built form of the white man. But, he went on, experience is knowledge, is it not? And to profit by experience to Sorokicha, gently, is the sign of wisdom. So remember, my friend, and he smiled as he spoke, remember that Mr. Ashton Kirk is strong. I will not forget, replied the wrestler, his well-worn teeth shining. And with that he left the room, the door shutting quietly behind him. Ashton Kirk sat down, as did his host. The latter fluttered the pages of a great, uncouthly made book which lay before him. His yellow, beautifully shaped hands touched the leaves with careful gentleness. It were as though the volume were a child which he was caressing. Again, said he, I will tell you that I am greatly favored by your coming. I had not hoped for so much when I wrote you, for I knew, and here his voice grew even softer than before, that your time was greatly occupied just now. We all have our occupations, replied Ashton Kirk, suavely. But even when one is interested, one can always find a little time to devote to others. I suppose that is so said Okiu, thoughtfully. However, I, who am a mere idler, so to speak, know very little of the value of time. Day after day, night after night, I spend wandering in the ancient gardens of Nippon. There are no singers like these. And one pointed finger indicated some shelves filled with books and scrolls. There are no written words quite so full of beauty. The poets of one's own nation are always the most touching, said Ashton Kirk. This is especially so of the old poets. Sometimes we take down a dusty, musty old fellow from a top shelf where he has long lain neglected, and being in the humor for it, we are startled by the sweetness of his vision. There is a fragrance about ancient memories, which is irresistible. The distance, perhaps, has something to do with it. Yesterday has no perspective for the most of us, but yesteryear is deep with it for all. Okiu nodded. The ancient peoples had their prophets and their oracles, said he, and their gods spoke through them. But the shades of the old Nipponese speak to me through the messages of the poets. The virtue of the dead is here accumulated. The wisdom of my holy ancestors leaps up to me from the pages of my books. Caressingly, the wonderful hands touched the faded pages of the volume upon the table. There are no thoughts so reverent as these he went on. There are no gardens so still, so full of quiet odors, so slumberous under the stars. And there is no moon so silent or so wan and soft in searching out the secret paths beneath the flowering trees where the shadows walk hand in hand. 
But, said Ashton Kirk, the great bulk of your countrymen have forgotten these dreams of a past time. Modern progress seems to interest them more than anything else. Again, the Japanese nodded. Progress was forced upon them, said he. And then with a smile he added, It would be strange, would it not, if they should outstrip their teachers. It is a thing which has happened before now. Napoleon, I have read, once declined to molest the Chinese, because he feared to teach them his own great art, and so put the power in their hands which might eventually crush him and his nation. Okiu laughed softly, and his polished nails picked at the edges of the book. The Corsican, my friend, was not quite so venturesome as your merchants. Your history will point out to you the fact that soldiers are seldom so daring as those in quest of trade. In most cases the trader is first upon the ground, and the troops come later. In any event, replied Okiu, your merchants desired the trade which the Dutch possessed, and that desire in the end made Japan a nation to be reckoned with. The more imitative the people, say your own philosophers, the greater their future development. And no one, gently, can say that my countrymen have not kept their eyes open. Ashton Kirk smiled. It is a way they have, said he, and people who keep their eyes open learn much. But not all, said Okiu. The eyes will not tell us all. He arose and walked to the window. The starlight was but dim, and there was no moon. Much as I might desire to see what is passing out there, said he, after a moment, I cannot do so, and it is so with other desires. Many things which we might wish to know are hidden from us, some in one way, some in another. Ashton Kirk said nothing in reply to this. There was a marked pause. Then the Japanese went on. The other night as I stood here I saw... He turned upon the secret agent. You recall what I told you? Very clearly. I saw moving shadows. Then I saw a man hurrying away. I should have liked to have seen more, but I could not. And so I went to the house over there to see what a closer look would do for me. And to tell Dr. Morse what you had seen. As you say, of course. And then I saw you, a friend of the family of... Was it two days' duration or three? Two only. Thank you. Okiu looked out into the night. His arms were folded, his legs very wide apart, his back turned toward the secret agent. Usually there is something peculiarly disconcerting in a squarely turned back. It is so blank, it tells so little. However, this was not so in the case of Okiu. His bland, lineless face told nothing. Whereas in his attitude there was a purpose which Ashton Kirk read easily. And, reading it, he looked carefully, but swiftly, about the room. The table was between himself and the closed door. A pair of heavy curtains hung behind him. To all appearances, these protected some open bookshelves. But a rapid swing of his light stick showed the secret agent that their real purpose was to conceal a doorway. Calmly, he sat back in his chair, nursing his cane, his keen eyes upon the figure at the window. I think, now resumed Okiu, that I remarked at the time how short a space there was between your forming the acquaintance of Dr. Morse and his death. You meet him one night, and he dies the next. The tongue clicked against the roof of the mouth pityingly. It were as though the coincidence excited his grief. 
I have always understood that you Americans were an impatient people. You have the reputation, whether deserved or not, of forcing things which do not happen as promptly as you would have them. This, in itself, is an excellent trait at times, for it saves one from imposition of many sorts. But it does not always serve. Here, Okiu turned and faced the secret agent. His face was as bland and meaningless as ever, and his voice was low-pitched and gentle as he proceeded. No, said he, it does not always serve. As it has resulted in this case, Dr. Morse is dead, and you have not benefited in the least. Ashton Kirk looked at him with steady eyes. There was not the slightest surprise in the secret agent's face, and his tone was unruffled as he replied, I think I understand. I am quite sure that you do, replied Okiu with equal suavity. He resumed his seat at the table, and once more he began lovingly to flutter the leaves of the ancient book. That the methods pursued in this case should be resorted to by a barbarous nation, said he, and a gleam of mockery appeared in the slanting eyes, would be the expected thing. But that a Christian government should so stoop is something of a surprise. Oh, you were surprised, then? Only mildly. You see, I have been employed upon many international occasions and know the requirements of a secret agent. When the case demands it, he does not hesitate. But, and here the smooth hands gestured their disapproval, this case did not demand it. Nothing was to be gained by the mere death of this Englishman. Ashton Kirk nodded. In that, said he, I agree with you. I do not know, continued Okiu, what put you upon the scent, but that a person possessing sufficient acumen to strike it at all should, at the same time, be so great a bungler as to do that. And one leveled finger indicated the Morse house, the lights of which could be seen through the window. Astonishes me. Ashton Kirk bent the light cane into a bow across his knee. His expression was that of a man waiting for an expected something to be said or done. There was now a pause of some duration. Okiu studied the man before him in the same impersonal fashion with which a man studies a mounted insect. Then he resumed, I have heard of you very favorably, and had counted upon one day having the pleasure of testing myself against you. But now... Again, the remarkable hands gestured, this time to complete the sentence. I'm sorry you have been disappointed. You are not nearly so sorry as I, believe me. The heavy lids drooped over the piercing eyes, in a way which Ashton Kirk had already come to regard as a warning of something ulterior. You have been searching the house? he asked. Ashton Kirk laughed lightly. Who has not? he inquired. Okiu joined in the laugh. It has all been labor wasted, said he. Dr. Morse was not the man to leave valuable property lying about. Again, he regarded the secret agent intently and once more resumed. I suppose by this time you have not so much hope of coming on anything as you once had. Ashton Kirk allowed the cane to spring back straight. With a look of unconcern, he made reply. On the contrary, said he, I was never quite so sure as I am just now. Okiu stared, and then came slowly to his feet. You have found it. No, 
and Ashton Kirk yawned contentedly. But I could place my hands in a very few moments upon the person who has. At this, the palms of the Japanese came together softly. Why, said he, and his voice was full of gentle surprise. Perhaps I have been mistaken in my opinion of you after all. Perhaps, answered Ashton Kirk. But for all the secret agent's seeming ease of manner, at the soft slap of the Oriental's hands, his every sense had grown alert. And now his ear caught a rustling behind him which said plainly that someone had stepped quietly into the room. An instant later, a peculiar high scent, as of an eastern oil, reached his nostrils. And though he did not turn his head, he knew that the newcomer was the wrestler, Sorakicha. End of Chapter 15、Chapter、of Is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter Sixteen In the Dark. Though Ashton Kirk was as sure Sorakicha stood behind him as he would have been had his eyes rested upon him, he did not turn his head. The man's entrance had been effected almost without sound. The rustling of the curtains had been no louder. Than a lightly drawn breath. And now, reflected the secret agent calmly, he is waiting behind me until he is told what to do. I trust that I shall be sufficiently fortunate as to catch the signal. But he continued to lounge back in his chair with crossed legs, balancing the stick lightly between his fingers. Okiu stood regarding him with careful attention. Yes, he continued, I now see that it is probable that you are what I have always understood you to be a man of exceptional talents. No one, with a slow smile, cares to admit that he is dull of perception, but I confess, sir. That in this matter, in which I have been judging you, you may have been more successful than I have imagined. It is more or less difficult to follow the workings of a mind, the owner of which is not under one's immediate observation, returned Ashton Kirk, philosophically. So, looking at the matter from that point of view, you have nothing to chide yourself for. But Okiu paid no attention to this. Apparently, he was grappling with a more concrete matter. What you have said interests me, he said. And so, putting his hands upon the table and leaning across to the other, the paper has been found? You might call it finding it, if you were at loss for an expression, replied Ashton Kirk. Though on second thought, I confess I should apply another term myself. We will not discuss terms, said Okiu gently. Let us call the matter of getting the desired thing what you please. There are more important matters to think about just now. He still bent forward, his hands resting upon the table. His expressionless face was held close to that of the secret agent. And so, said he, you could place your hand upon the person who now has the paper, could you? That is interesting. And still more interesting is the fact that you could do it in a very few moments. Ashton Kirk nodded and smiled. It gives us all a certain satisfaction to learn that we are interesting, said he. This is so almost at any time, but at a moment like this, 
when interest is created in a person who had utterly lost confidence, it is doubly pleasing. Perhaps, said Okiu, and the purr in his low-pitched voice was more pronounced than the secret agent had ever heard it before. You have occasion for satisfaction, and then, perhaps, you have not. Ashton Kirk met the black, heavy-lidded eyes squarely. Will you be more explicit, he said. I can see no harm that it will do now, said the other, and the secret agent quietly noted the emphasis which he laid upon the last word. So the facts are these. Though I regard you as a sort of fellow workman, and though I have a very definite admiration for your talents, still your interests are arrayed, so to speak, against mine. And this being the case, here he paused. The glittering eyes lifted and darted a look over Ashton Kirk's shoulder to the waiting Sorakicha. But even then the other maintained his lounging attitude, and his manner remained unruffled. Well, said he, inquiringly. This being the case, said Okiu, smoothly, I have thought it best to... One of the supple hands began to rise. As it stirred, Ashton Kirk launched a kick at the table, which threw it against the Oriental and drove him back several steps. At the same instant as he delivered the kick, the secret agent bent low and leaped forward. The great arms of the wrestler closed above the chair upon empty space. Then the light cane swished through the air. The globes of the cluster of lights which had hung over the table fell in a shower of fragments, and instantly the room was plunged into darkness. Softly, and with the cat-like quickness of Sorakicha himself, the secret agent gained the door. He had fixed its location in his mind and so had no trouble finding it in the dark. It opened as he turned the knob. The hall, too, was dark, and he slipped into it, closing the door behind him. Carefully, but with some speed, he passed along the hall, his hands outstretched like the antennae of an insect. From the room which he had just left came the sounds of stumbling feet and the confused outcries of angry men. Just as the door was thrown open, Ashton Kirk felt his hand touch the stair rail, and he softly descended as the feet of the two Japanese sounded in the hall behind him. The lower hall was also dark, but through a fanlight he caught the gleam of a street lamp. The front door, he told himself, as he carefully made his way toward it. But it was fast. Up and down its edges ran his fingers, but there was no bar, chain, nor catch. The bolt of the lock was shot, and the key had been removed. He turned with his back to the door and listened. The Orientals were stealing down the stairs. For the second time that night, his hand went into the outside coat pocket in search of the pistol. But this time, when the hand slipped from the pocket, the weapon came with it. Silently he stood there in the shadows that lurked beneath the fanlight. The creeping sounds from the staircase continued, and then paused. There was complete silence. They are listening, was Ashton Kirk's thought. They think that the fanlight may have attracted me, and desire to make sure. At any moment he expected a flare of light, but none came. Neither did he hear any further sounds. He held the pistol hand close to his body, the muzzle commanding the hall. The fact that ten grim copper-clad servants of death stood between him and his foes was reassuring. 
and he continued to await the development of the situation. For a long time, there was silence. Then he heard the creeping resumed. His jaw tightened, and his grip upon the pistol butt grew more rigid. But another instant told him something else. The Japanese were not advancing as he had expected. Instead, they were retreating along the upper hall. They have made up their minds to the situation, was Ashton Kirk's explanation. And as facing a stream of bullets does not enter into their calculations, they are about to try something else. This latter, of course, would be based upon his remaining where he was. And at once, he took steps toward the confusion of things, by also moving along the hall in the same direction as the others. He had noticed upon his entrance to the house that the hall was almost bare of furniture, so there was small danger of his colliding with anything. Little by little he went on. Now and then he paused and listened intently. But there was no sound, however slight. At length his hands touched a smooth surface. It was a door. Cautiously he turned the knob and opened it. The room before him was as dark as the hall, and he halted, with the door only a few inches ajar, peering within. It's a room on the north side, and well toward the rear, passed through his mind, and it's only natural to suppose that there are windows in it. The blinds must be tightly drawn, for I can't make out even a glimmer of light. He waited a little, his pistol held ready. Then he stepped into the room. The first thing that attracted him was a thin, bright line, which apparently lay upon the floor at his right. He studied this for a moment, and then it occurred to him what it was. There was a light in an adjoining room, and the rays were seeping under the door. Again he waited and listened. It had been his purpose to locate a window, unfasten it, and so make his way to the open air. But the light in the room beyond indicated the presence of someone so close at hand as to make this proceeding perilous. But, as no sound came from the lighted room, he made up his mind to venture nearer. He had taken but one step, however, when a board creaked behind him in the darkness. Poised for the next step, he halted and again stood listening. Nothing followed, and the breath slowly exhaled from his lungs. His flexed muscles relaxed, and he settled back upon his feet for another spell of silence. He had just about made up his mind that the creak had been caused by himself. When he became aware of another and barely discernible sound, it was soft and hissing, a sort of rubbing, as though one smoothly surfaced thing were drawn across another. Like a flash, the secret agent realized what it was. Someone stood in the doorway with his hands outstretched, as his own had been, and it was their contact with the door frame that made the sound. Then there came a step, slow, careful, light. A pause followed, and then the unknown's breathing could be distinctly heard. Another step followed, cautious, muffled, secret, and again came the pause. The grip of the secret agent tightened upon the pistol. He faced about softly to meet the newcomer, whom a few steps would bring to his side. But now the steps ceased, and though he listened with eager ears, Ashton Kirk failed to note their resumption. This struck him as odd, 
There had been no sound, nothing that could have startled the other into a longer pause than formerly. And yet, that he was standing stock still somewhere in the darkness was unquestionable. Then, like lightning, it occurred to Ashton Kirk why this was. Judging from the footfalls, he stood between the unknown and the door under which crept the line of light. And the break in this line, caused by his intervening feet, had caught the other's attention. Gradually, the secret agent became aware of the unknown's breathing. At first, it was scarcely discernible, but little by little, it grew in rapidity and harshness. It became labored, straining and drawn with increasing difficulty. As plainly as words could have done it, it spoke of mounting excitement and a quickly forming purpose. The automatic pistol began to lift, but too late. Like a wild beast, the unknown leaped through the darkness, and a pair of long, powerful arms enwrapped the secret agent. The pistol fell to the floor, and there began a desperate struggle for the mastery. By a few swift twists and the free use of his knee, Ashton Kirk managed to free his arms, which had been pinioned at his sides. Then he drove one elbow into his opponent's neck, and they went reeling blindly about. There was a moment of this. Then the attack of the unknown abated. It were as though he had felt his adversary out and found him rather more than a match. And with this discovery came new tactics. Ashton Kirk felt the rugged grasp grow still slacker. One hand slipped away altogether. This could mean only that it was feeling in unseen pockets for a weapon. And upon this the secret agent began to fight silently, swiftly, desperately. A series of short, jarring blows drove the other back. A short, powerful lock lifted him from his feet. But with a frenzied wrench, the man broke the hold, and as he did so, they both fell with their full weight against the door under which the light was shining. It gave way with a crash, and a flood of illumination poured upon them. And with the first flash of it, Ashton Kirk saw a hand armed with a billy lifted to strike him, and behind it was the white, desperate face of the man who had followed him into the room. The face of Philip Warwick. And as recognition came, the wrist bent with a quick, practiced jerk. The leather-covered lead descended, and Ashton Kirk fell prone upon the floor. End of Chapter 16Chapter 17 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent, by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 17 The Silhouettes. When one wakes from a heavy, unsatisfying sleep, it is with a vague memory of flitting shadows, of empty spaces, of strange deeds and peculiar sayings. There is also a painful sort of lethargy and an odd sense of personal defeat, which is peculiarly annoying. It was with some such feeling as this that Ashton Kirk opened his eyes. The first person whom he saw was old Nanon and she was bathing his head with cold water. Near at hand stood a Drevenoff, and seated by a table was Stella Corbin. So, said the old servant, in a gentle tone that he had not yet heard her speak, you are better. The secret agent sat up. His head felt strangely light, and there was a sharp shooting pain across his scalp. But, for all, there was a smile upon his face. I will not pattern by the young lady in the novel or the play and inquire where I am, said he. But I will ask, and he looked from one to the other, how I happen to get here. The old woman gestured toward the pole. 
Drevenoff found you lying upon the back lawn, unconscious, less than a quarter of an hour ago, she said. The young man nodded. I did not recognize you at first, said he. I thought it was someone who had wandered in and fallen there. But when the known came with the light, we knew you at once. And a good thing it was that he came upon you, said the old servant, shaking her gray head. You might have bled to death. There was a moment's silence. Then Drevenoff asked, curiously, What happened to you? And how did you come to this? The secret agent smiled. I was making a call, said he. And my presence was evidently not altogether appreciated. Though they waited for more, still he stopped at that. And raising his hand, he felt of a wet bandage which was drawn tightly about his head. Stella Corbin, during the above, had sat quite still. Her dark eyes were fixed steadily upon him. Their expression was strange and full of speculation. It is queer how things chance at times, spoke Drevenoff, addressing Nanon. If Miss Corbin had not asked me to go to the city for her tonight, I should not have gone out. And if I had not gone out, I should not have found him. But the old woman paid no attention to the latter part of his speech. She gazed at him for a moment. Then her eyes shifted to the girl. You are sending him to the city then? she said. Yes, answered Stella Corbin. Why? At this question, the girl appeared to stiffen. It seemed as though a curt rejoinder was upon her tongue. But then she changed her mind. There is an errand that I desired him to do, she replied meekly enough. The gray eyes searched her face from beneath the craggy brows. The thin lips were set in their hard, straight line. There will be no more trains back tonight, she said. He cannot return before morning. I know, replied the girl. Can the matter not wait until then? Stella Corbin arose. That I wish him to go tonight should be enough she said, coldly. Then, turning to the young Pole, she added, You remember my instructions? Yes, Miss Corbin. Then go at once. The train will reach here before many more minutes, and you must not miss it. Drevenoff took his hat and went out without any further words. And as the door closed after him, Ashton Kirk arose rather unsteadily. If that is the last train to the city, he said to Stella, I fear that I also must make it. The girl inclined her head ever so little, but said nothing. However, the old servant spoke. It is a good walk to the station, she said, and hurt as you are, you could not get there in time. Another thing, it is much better that you should rest for a little. To exert yourself now might start your wound bleeding once more, as I have not yet properly bandaged it. You may be right, said the secret agent, and his eyes sought those of the girl. But if he expected her to agree with the old servant, he was much mistaken. Her face was set and rather pale, her hands as she trifled with a brooch at her throat trembled there was a pause then as she did not speak the old servant who had been watching her fixedly said miss corbin will be pleased to have you stay until morning of course still the girl's expression did not change and still she said nothing in that case said Ashton Kirk, quietly. I will venture to trespass upon her kindness. I confess that I feel somewhat shaky 
and a night's rest may help me wonderfully. It will, said Nanon, but never taking her eyes from the girl's face. Sleep brings the strength back to one. And then, her tone changing, it would be so much safer to have a man about the place, even though a sick one. Now that Drevenoff is gone for the night, he should have been alone. Again, there was a pause. Then, I dare say we should have managed, said Stella. Her manner had suddenly changed, and her tone was even light. She smiled as she turned to Ashton Kirk and added, Of course we must not turn you away, and you are very welcome indeed. Please do not think me strange, but so many things have happened of late that I am not altogether myself. Here she turned to old Nanon, the smile upon her white face forced and pathetic. Of course we should need a protector. I had not thought of that. But you, Nanon, and the look in the great dark eyes was unfathomable. You think of everything. It is not that, replied the servant woman, meaningly. It is that I do not forget. The eyes of the two were fixed upon and held each other steadily for a moment. And Ashton Kirk, as he sat and quietly watched, smiled and seemed to fall to pondering. After a few more remarks of a general and impersonal nature addressed to the secret agent, Miss Corbin left the room. Old Nanon stood for some moments gazing at the closed door through which the girl had passed. Then she turned to the table and began stripping up some bandages and preparing a lotion for the guest's wounded head. You are not to think how strange, she said in a low tone because so many things have happened of late that she is not herself. The keen old eyes turned on Ashton Kirk, a look of significance, and she nodded her head. Many things have happened of late, she commented. So many that I have often wondered if there were not more of them than I have seen. And who knows if she is now herself or no? Indeed. Perhaps I now see her true self for the first time. She removed the wet pack from his head and carefully cleaned the wound. It is not more than a deep scratch, she said, but it bled a great deal and so weakened you. Tomorrow? It may feel stiff, and you may have a headache, but that will be all. Quickly, and with admirable skill, she put the bandages in place. When it was done, he surveyed himself ruefully in a mirror. With that, remarked he, there is nothing left for me but my room. So, if you will show me there, I shall be obliged to you. She led the way to the stairs, opened a door upon the second floor, and then halted. I beg your pardon, sir, she said, but I shall have to go for a match. I can never remember. He produced a metal safe and struck a match. She took it from him, and entering the room, turned on and lighted the gas. There is no wiring above the first floor, she said in explanation and I find it confusing at times. She went from one thing to another, seeing that all was right. The room is small, she continued, but I think you will find it comfortable. And right behind it, opening another door, there is another room, sir, with fine large windows in case this should get too stuffy for you in the night. You can open the door and the back window, and so get plenty of air and no direct draught. Ashton Kirk thanked her, and she went out. He took off his coat, 
sat down in a big cane chair and leaned his wounded head against a cushion. Rather a night, said he to himself. Things seem to have crowded upon me in a rather unexpected sort of a way. And this knock on the head has not just helped to make it all clear, either. The events of the night, from the moment he rang the bell at Okiu's house, began to pass through his mind in a sort of review. Then, little by little, they grew hazy and indistinct. One seemed to melt into another in an unnaturally complete and satisfactory manner. And he found himself accepting weird conclusions with the cheerful ease of a man falling asleep. He may have remained so in the chair for an hour. It may have been longer. At any rate, he awoke at last, with his head throbbing painfully. He sat for some moments gazing at the flaring gaslight. Then he heard a clock from somewhere in the house strike once. He glanced at his watch. One thirty, he said. Phew, I've got a long night to put in. He got up and looked at the bed. But there was nothing inviting about it. All desire for sleep seemed to have deserted him. As Ninon had suggested, the room had grown stuffy. And so he passed into the rear apartment and lifted the window. The stars still burnt palely in the sky, as they had some hours before, when he looked at them from the window of Okiu's house. Small, swift-moving clouds were shifting across their faces. And all about was dark and still and mysterious. But the night air was cool, and he stood, drinking it in for a time, and gazing down toward the dark loom made by the house of the Japanese at the far end of the open space. No light, no movement came from that direction. It was, for all the world, like a place deserted. At this thought, the secret agent smiled. That is the second time I've thought that same thing tonight. But not a great deal of movement or light is to be expected of any dwelling at this hour, he said to himself. However, I should not be surprised if deserted were now the right word after all. He had closed the door leading into the bedroom, and so all was darkness in the apartment in which he stood. The quiet pleased him, and the cool air felt grateful upon his aching head and so he remained at the window for some time. Then, suddenly, there came something like a dim burst of light. An instant served to show him its nature. Upon the lawn was sharply silhouetted the outline of a window, with a blind but a few inches drawn. Someone in the hall, he said to himself, and he has lighted the gas. Curiously, he gazed at the illuminated square upon the grass below. The sash and even the swinging cord of the blind were sharply outlined. But as he looked, a figure partially filled in the square. The figure of a woman, small, delicate, and exceedingly graceful. Her back was apparently turned to the window and she was waving one hand in a beckoning motion, as though to someone further along the hall. Then a second figure appeared, and the two silhouetted heads bent together in earnest conference. So, said Ashton Kirk softly, I understood that with Drevenoff gone to the city, I was the only man in the house. But I see now that there was a mistake somewhere. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 18 Gone The words of old Nanon, spoken only a few hours before, came back to Ashton Kirk. It will be so much safer to have a man about the place, even though I seek one, she had said. Now that Drevenoff is gone for the night, we should have been alone. The two shadows remained with heads held close together for some little time. It was plain to be seen that the woman was doing the greater part of the talking. The man gestured now and then, as though in protest. She is urging him to do something which he does not fancy, thought the secret agent, his keen eyes not missing a movement. And as his denials constantly grow fainter and her urging more insistent, I think she will finally have her way. Fancifully, the two silhouettes went through their parts within the lighted square as cast by the gaslight upon the lawn. The woman pleaded and demanded. The man resisted with wide gestures and violently shaken head. But, as the secret agent had told himself, the woman proved herself the stronger in the end. Sharp, imperious, even threatening grew her manner, and the man's protests died, his head ceased to shake, until finally his gestures were inquiring only, as of one who consents, and desires only to know the best way of going about the matter in hand. At this stage, the shadow of the woman became still for the first time since it had appeared. It were as though she were endeavoring to recall something, or devise a plan. Then, with an impatient gesture, she snatched at a handbag which hung upon her arm, and seemed about to open it. But with a contemptuous sweep of the hand, the man waved it aside. Again the two began their mute debate. This time it was the man who took the initiative. She had failed when she came to the carrying out of what she desired. Apparently she had no clear conception of the thing she wanted done, and he was reproaching her for it. But in the midst of this she stopped him. Her hand darted out, and from the wall she drew something, the shadow of which was so fine that Ashton Kirk could not, at first, even guess as to its nature. But the way it swung out at her touch finally gave him a clue. A folding gas fixture, said he softly. Once more the girl took the aggressive. She gestured sharply and indicated frequently a point upon her left, some distance along the hall, and apparently a little above her head. The silhouette of the man remained motionless. What he heard was evidently bearing in upon him. His whole attitude seemed to say, Here, at last, is something worth consideration. Then there was a pause. The woman also became still. It were as though the two were measuring each other's strength. At length, the man stepped toward the gas fixture. The woman drew back, and as she did so, her hands went to her face, as though she would shut out something repellent. With a handkerchief, the man brushed away any possible dust from the gas burner. Then he reached toward where the valve should be, and the half-twist of his hand indicated that he had turned on the gas. Then the man seemed to be gathering himself for an effort. He applied his lips to the burner, and remained motionless and tense. Suddenly, the picture upon the lawn dimmed, and then vanished entirely. For an instant, Ashton Kirk remained looking out upon the now inky night. If one could have observed his face, a smile would have been seen but a smile that would not have been an altogether pleasant one. It is not the most comforting thing in the world, he mused, 
to have one person beckon another along a deserted hall in the small hours of the morning, have the couple pause almost outside one's door, and then confer as to the most effective means of taking one's life, and that the one, a woman, should be so urgent in the matter, is particularly distressing. He turned from the window and faced toward the closed door of his bedroom. And a ready-witted young lady she is, he went on. How very quick she was to note that the gas was burning in my room. And what an instant and murderous idea at once took possession of her. To blow into an open gas burner means that every jet upon the same line of pipe will go out as soon as the injected air, instead of the gas, begins to flow through the burners. About now I shall find the light out in my room, and... Here he opened the bedroom door, saw that it was in complete darkness, and stood sniffing the air upon the threshold. Yes, the gas is pouring from the open burner. If I had been asleep... The apartment was thick with the overpowering fumes. He softly raised the windows and closed the valve. It would have seemed natural for a man so circumstanced to have taken some steps to identify and apprehend those who have made so murderous an attempt. But if this thought occurred to Ashton Kirk, he made no attempt to carry it out. However, another idea occurred to him. The old woman said that there were nothing but gas lights above the first floor. If another jet should be open in an occupied bedroom, there is still danger of a life being taken. With this in his mind, he pulled on his coat and opened the hall door. There were no fumes in the hall, and this showed that the burners here had been closed before the two had stolen away. He took out a match and was feeling for the nearest of the hall jets, when a sound from the lower floor reached him. It was a continued, grating sort of noise, as though a cautious person were drawing a refractory bolt. He paused, his groping hand still outstretched, and listened with attention. The subdued squeaking ceased. There was a pause, then the street door opened and closed. He took a step or two toward the main staircase, and again he halted. Another sound came from below, the distinct, heavy sounds of falling objects striking the floor. Then came a shrill cry. Like a shadow, he slipped along the intervening space and down the stairs. The lower hall was also dark, but there was a light in the library, and he gained the door at a bound. Old Nanon, dressed as he had seen her when she showed him to his room, stood in the center of the library. In her hand, she held a large brass candlestick. Scattered upon the floor were a number of articles of bric-a-brac, which had apparently rested upon a shelf at one side. Slowly, the woman turned her gaze from the candlestick to the secret agent. Her face was rigid and a yellowish white. The gray eyes were hard as flint. Ah, it is you, she said, in a sort of subdued monotone. I had forgotten about you. What has happened? asked Ashton Kirk. The eyes of the servant woman once more returned to the candlestick, but she made no answer. I heard someone cry out, said the secret agent, his glance going about the room in its searching way. Nanon nodded her head. Yes, she returned. You heard someone cry out? It was I. What has occurred? Once more the stern old eyes sought his face, and she said, She has gone. Who has gone? Miss Stella. Ashton Kirk thought of the creaking bolt 
and the closing street door, and his voice was pitched sharply when he again asked the question, What has occurred? The old servant placed the brass candlestick upon one of the desks. She rubbed her hands secretively with a corner of her apron while she said, I have told you what I feel. I have been as plain as one can be who has no proof. And as the hours passed, I have grown more and more suspicious. Not one movement did this girl make that my eyes were not on her. Not one word did she speak that I was not seeking behind it for some hidden meaning. Tonight, as you know, she sent Drevenoff to the city. It was something of which I had heard nothing until the young man spoke. What was this urgent thing that could not wait until morning? Why would not the telephone or telegraph do as well as a messenger? I did not understand it. And then she did not care to have you stay here tonight. That was very plain. You must have noticed it. Ashton Kirk nodded. Go on, said he. It does not need a great deal to make me suspicious, resumed the old woman. And her manner tonight aroused me to wonder if there were not something afoot of which I knew nothing. So, when I went to my room, I put out the light, left the door ajar, and sat listening. After a long time I knew there was a light in the hall below. I stole out and bent over the rail and listened. There was whispering, but I could catch no words. Then I heard someone descending the lower staircase, and so I stole down to the second floor. From the head of the stairs I watched once more. Then I saw the light go up here in the library. I had already started to descend when Miss Stella appeared in the library doorway and in her hand she held the speaker pointed at the desk that candlestick here the old woman paused and the secret agent watching her face saw the yellowish white change to gray well said he she looked along the hall as if afraid of being seen said the woman and all the time her fingers were picking picking at something in the socket of the candlestick she was just turning back into the room when she drew something out looked at it and hid it in her glove then the light went out and i heard the bolt being drawn i rushed down the stairs but i was too late the door opened and closed. I turned on the lights. But she was gone. For a moment, Ashton Kirk stood studying the woman's face. Then he stepped quickly to the desk and took up the candlestick. Something in the deep socket of this seemed to attract him, and he turned on more lights. Under a cluster of incandescents, he bent over the candlestick and examined it minutely. Then the magnifying lens came into play, as it had upon the broken knob of the high boy. One glance through this, and he sprang to the street door. The next instant, a piercing whistle shattered the quiet of Fordham Road. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 19 The Taxi Cab. For a few moments, after the shrill blast of the whistle filled the suburban street, the secret agent waited upon the doorstep. 
Then a thought seemed to occur to him, and with an angry exclamation he went quickly in and closed the door. In a moment he was at the telephone, and stood with impatiently tapping foot until he was connected with the number called for. Then the sleepy, dry voice of Fuller said complainingly in his ear, Hello? Who is it? The secret agent made reply, and the aide's voice, now containing an eager note, demanded, What's up? Get O'Neill at once. It's too late for a train. But call Dixon to get out the car in a hurry. Then come to Morse's, Fordham Road, with all the speed you can. All right, replied Fuller. I'll get Dixon first and have O'Neill ready when the machine arrives. Ashton Kirk hung up and then turned to Nanon, who stood but a few yards away, still nervously rubbing her hands with the corner of her apron. You saw no one but Miss Corbin a while ago? he asked. No, answered the woman. You are sure of that? His singular eyes searched her face, but she met the look without flinching. I am sure, she said. There was a silence. Ashton Kirk then walked down the hall toward the library door, and as he reached it, he felt her hand touch his shoulder. You did not see anyone? she asked. He paused and turned his head. What would you say if I answered yes? The sharp old eyes wavered. She swallowed once or twice spasmodically. You did see someone, she said. Then, with intense eagerness, it was not a man? He was about to reply when there came heavy footsteps upon the porch, and then a loud peal at the bell. Ashton Kirk smiled. A policeman, no doubt, said he. Let him in. The woman opened the street door. The hall lights shone upon the buttons and shield of a patrolman. I heard the sound of a whistle said he, with a rich Irish accent. Is anything the matter? Nanon looked toward Ashton Kirk, as though expecting him to answer. He came forward. How are you? said he. Will you come in? The policeman did so. He was a huge-chested and heavy-limbed fellow, and had a head of fiery red hair. He surveyed Ashton Kirk with a grin upon his good-natured face. Oh, hello, said he. So it's you, is it? I noticed you the other day with Osborne while I was keeping the gate outside. Sure enough, said the secret agent. So you were. I was on the corner beyond there, went on the red-haired giant. And devil the thing was I expecting when the blast of the whistle struck me to ears. Sure, there's seldom anything happens in the place. It's like a graveyard, Faith. And to have a thing like that go off all of a sudden fair took my breath. It was a call for a man whom I thought was close by, explained the secret agent, as the old woman left them together in the library. The policeman winked with much elaboration. I see, I see, said he. A friend with a good eye and a careful manner. Sure, it's meself who's seen him often enough of late. But I thought he was a headquarters man put here by Osborne. Ashton Kirk regarded him thoughtfully. You say you were standing on the corner when you heard the whistle, said he. There do be a convenient doorway there, smiled the policeman. And it's often enough I stop there. So the bit of use is there to go pounding about the edges of such a beat as this. A man might as well make himself quiet and easy. How long were you there tonight? The policeman considered. The better part of a half hour, he ventured at last. Did you notice anyone go by in that time? There was one postman, said the officer, 
a couple of milkmen going to the depot, McGlone's barkeeper on his way to open up for the early gas house trade, and, yes, there was a girl. What sort of a girl? Rather a nice sort, dressed well and wearing a veil. And it's a hurry she was in, for she turned the corner almost at a run. In what direction did she go? Toward Berkeley Street. It is not likely that you paid any further attention to her? Well, replied the red-haired policeman, maybe at any other time I wouldn't have. But you see, I had my old pipe going in a comfortable kind of a way, and was rather wide awake. Then the queerness of the hour and the hurry she was in made me step out of the doorway and gaze after her. I see, said Ashton Kirk. When she got to the corner of Berkeley Street, she stopped for a bit, just as a body will who is not just sure of what they are going to do next. And from the way she looked, this way and that, I got the notion into me head that she might be expecting somebody. Ah, and did it turn out so? The man shook his head. Sure, I don't know, said he. But no one come along while she stood there, anyway. She stopped for only a little, though. Then she went on up Berkeley Street. Up Berkeley Street? Do you mean north on Berkeley? I see you do be very exact, grinned the good-natured giant. Yes, it was north she went. Huh. South on Fordham Road and north on Berkeley Street. That seems rather queer. The policeman looked at him curiously. "'What makes you think so?' asked he. "'Of course she may have changed her mind while she stood on the corner,' said Ashton Kirk. "'But it is scarcely likely. Her movements were not left to chance.' He paused, and then asked, "'If a person goes south on Fordham Road, crosses to Berkeley, which is a parallel street, and then proceeds north, what does it mean? The policeman pondered the matter deeply. Then a light appeared upon his face. I get you, he said. The woman was for stopping somewhere on Berkeley Street. That's certain. If she were not, she'd have gone north before Fordham Road, and so saved herself the walk of a full block. The two remained in conversation for some time. But the policeman had nothing more of an interesting nature to impart. After about half an hour, he went away, and Ashton Kirk began to prowl from room to room on the lower floor. Though he passed old Nanon frequently, as she sat under a light, her lips muttering over a book of fine print, she did not speak to him. Indeed, she scarcely once lifted her eyes. If the secret agent discovered anything in his mousing about, he made no sign, and when there came the strident hoot of a siren in the street, he threw open the door. "'This way, O'Neill,' he called. A smoothly shaven man of middle age came up the walk and stepped upon the porch. "'How do you do?' said he. Then his voice pitched two tones higher as he added, "'Good heavens! What's the matter with your head?' A little affair in the next street, said Ashton Kirk. It is of no great consequence, so we'll not speak of it. I want you to stay here and keep track of everything that goes on. You will be relieved before noon tomorrow. Very good, said the smooth-faced man, as the other led him through the hall. This man, said Ashton Kirk to the old servant, as they came upon her still poring over the book. We'll remain here to see that everything is well while I am gone. She merely glanced at O'Neill, and then nodded. Bending close over the book, one gaunt finger following each line of the tiny type, she went on reading and muttering in a husked sort of way that made the newcomer stare. Rather a queer old party, I take it, he said, as he followed his employer to the street door. Yes, but then, 
and there was a frankly baffled look in the secret agent's eyes. All the people of this house appear to be of that kind. I fancied that I had them pretty well gauged. But now I'm beginning to find out that I've been somewhat off the track. With this, he hurried out to the car and gave a quick order to the chauffeur. Fuller, who sat with upturned collar and down-pulled hat, exclaimed solicitously at the sight of the bandaged head. And the investigator, in as few words as possible, told him what had happened. The eyes of the aide grew round with amazement. Warwick! he cried. Well, now that's one ahead of me. I felt convinced from the first, as you know, that he had a good bit to do with this affair. But I wasn't sure that he was connected with the Jap. And so he is back, eh? With a knowing nod. Back and crawling about in the dark, knocking people on the head. At a word from Ashton Kirk, the driver halted the car at the corner of Berkeley Street. And this is where Miss Corbin stood, as the policeman told you, said Fuller, looking about. And then she went northward, northward, with much significance in his tone, toward Okiu's place. His employer was looking about, and said nothing in reply. So Fuller went on. And what we sought for was hidden in the socket of one of those candlesticks all the time, and... Here he halted, and his hand slapped sharply upon his knee. But no! By Jove, it was not, for I distinctly recall that you examined all the candlesticks very carefully on the night of the murder. Ashton Kirk nodded, rather absently. His eyes were traveling the length of Berkeley Street. Then, cried Fuller, the paper was placed there since that night. The murderer fearing to keep it in his or her possession, placed it in one of the candlesticks, knowing very well that they must have been already searched, and feeling that they would not be molested again. You said you were sure that none of those who sought the document had found it, he continued. But it seems that in this you were mistaken, unless, as though a fresh idea had come to him, it should turn out that, after all, it was not the state paper which Miss Corbin took. But Ashton Kirk shook his head. I wish I could think so, said he, gravely. If I could, I should not at this moment be classing myself as a blithering idiot. I hardly think I understand, said Fuller. Not many hours ago, said Ashton Kirk, I told Okiu that I could place my hands upon the person who was possessed of the paper and to have found the assassin of Dr. Morse would have been no more difficult. Well, somewhat bitterly, if I had taken a leaf from Osborne's book and done these things when they became plain to me, I would not at this stage of the affair be circling about like a hound that's lost the scent. I see what you mean, said Fuller, and I scarcely think you could have acted otherwise than you have. The entire Morse household is so entangled in this matter that it was the best plan to arrest no one until you had learned the extent of the guilt or innocence of all. That was my idea, of course, said the investigator. But I am not sure that it was not entirely the idea of a gambler too confident of his luck. I fancy that I allowed the stake to lie too long upon the board and now I find myself in a fair way to lose it entirely. But, and Fuller came back to the idea which he had expressed a few moments before, are you quite confident that the object Miss Corbin took from the candlestick was? But the other stopped him. I have very excellent reasons for being confident. Listen to me. His gaze was still searching the street before them but the brain behind the eyes seemed to be not at all concerned with what he saw. Colonel Drevenoff, the commander of the regiment in which Dr. Morse served during the Russo-Japanese War, was a Pole. Most Poles are Roman Catholics. Drevenoff was one, and he wore the scapular. Ah, said Fuller, a light beginning to come into his eyes. 
the paper for which we are searching. Here, Ashton Kirk seemed to hesitate. And which Colonel Drevenoff stole from the Russian secret embassy, suggested Fuller. We are not at all assured that he did so, returned Ashton Kirk. However, it was in his possession, no matter how it came there, and he had reasons for desiring to conceal it. The scapular which hung about his neck was a most likely place for this, being but several thicknesses of cloth stitched together. He cut some of these stitches, laid the paper between the layers of cloth, and sewed them together once more. And, said Fuller excitedly, when he came to give the paper to Dr. Morse, he gave the emblem and all. Exactly. And judging from Dr. Morse's lack of light afterward, the elder Drevenoff said nothing about the paper itself. Of course, he had an object in entrusting the scapular to the Englishman. This was, doubtless, that it be handed on to some third person, unknown to us. Then the Japanese government somehow got wind of the matter, and Okiu, their most acute agent, was assigned to secure the document. Like most artists, Okiu believes, so it seems, in preparing his material before he sets about using it, and this process in his hands has had a peculiarly oriental tinge. True to his racial instinct, his methods took an insidious, indirect form, a sort of preliminary torture, as it were. And this accounts for the series of enigmatic sketches with which Dr. Morse was persecuted during the last weeks of his life. But, said Fuller, somewhat at loss, just how does all this assure you that Miss Corbin now has the paper? I am coming to that, said Ashton Kirk. You recall, I suppose, what I told you regarding the scapulars, their different origins, devices, and colors. Yes. There is one made of scarlet cloth, the scapular of the passion. This is the one affected by Colonel Drevenoff, for it was one of this type which Miss Corbin took from its hiding place. My lens showed me some fine scarlet strands, adhering to some fragments of wax at the mouth of the candlestick. And as if this were not enough, I also saw the impression of a row of stitching, such as runs along the scapular's edge, upon a deposit of wax at the bottom of the socket. It seems incredible to me, said Fuller, that a girl of Miss Corbin's sort should have a hand in an affair like this. But then, with a shake of the head, I suppose her love for this fellow Warwick accounts for it. Many a man has been ruined by love of an unworthy woman, and many a woman, no doubt, by love of an unworthy man. But to all appearances, the secret agent did not follow these moralizings with any great attention. The big lamps upon the car threw their long white rays along Berkeley Street, and while his mind was apparently engaged upon other things, the eyes of Ashton Kirk followed the stretch of illuminated space to the end. Now he got out and said to the chauffeur, Move ahead very slowly. With eyes fixed upon the dusty asphalt, the secret agent walked ahead of the car. The lights of the ladder threw everything they fell upon into sharp relief. At the curb before Okiu's house, Ashton Kirk held up his hand, and the car halted. "'What is it?' asked Fuller. "'I caught the tire tracks of another car below there. They were so clear and uncut by other marks that I fancied that they might have been made late at night. "'Do you now think they were?' "'I can't say. But they lead up to this point. A halt was made. Then the machine turned.' and doubled on its tracks. Some distance up the street on the opposite side, a flare of red and green light caught the speaker's attention. It came from a drug store, and with Fuller he crossed the street and entered. 
A white jacketed clerk stood behind a marble covered counter and served them with the cigars which they asked for. Ashton Kirk lighted his at a swinging gas flame near the door and drew at it with enjoyment. Rather out of the way for an all night place, isn't it? he asked. The clerk shrugged his shoulders. It's not a big payer after about nine o'clock, said he. But you see, it is one of a chain of stores, and the company's policy is to keep open all the time. I see. We do some business by not closing, but not enough to shatter any records. This isn't the swiftest place on earth, you know. I suppose not. Your car will make some talk tomorrow, smiled the clerk. They'll all be wondering who is up at such an hour as this. And those who heard you will feel that they have something on those who did not. I shall be a thrilling sort of a person then, smiled Ashton Kirk. I suppose, after a moment, that you do not have many automobiles pass through Eastbury at night? Not after early evening, but yours is the second tonight, or rather this morning with a look at the clock. Fuller darted a rapid glance at the secret agent, but the latter displayed no eagerness. Placing his cigar upon the edge of the counter, he began carefully rearranging a frayed end of the bandage about his head. Two, eh? was all he said. I didn't see the other myself, said the drug clerk, but it stopped over at the Japanese, too. So old Patterson, the watchman, told me. That was a couple of hours ago. Ashton Kirk had finished with the bandage and surveyed it in a mirror with an air of satisfaction. Then, taking up his cigar once more, he remarked, Stopped there too, did it? Huh. I wonder if anyone got in. Patterson said there were two persons came out of the house, but only Mr. Okiu got into the taxi. The other one walked up the street. But, and the clerk wagged his head in humorous appreciation, that's not the funny part of the thing. No. It was the girl, said the clerk, a broad smile upon his face. Again, Fuller darted the inquiring look at the secret agent. But even at this, he did not display any indications of market interest. There was a girl, was there? Was all Ashton Kirk said. The clerk nodded. Patterson is a funny old scout. There's no use talking, said he. He's got such a comic way of looking at things. And where he gets all his expressions is more than I can say. I'd like to hear him tell about it, said Ashton Kirk. He's taking a sleep in the back room, said the clerk with a wink. I'll try and get him out. He disappeared, and in a few moments returned, followed by a short, ruddy-faced old man with a short-clipped white mustache. Oh, the Jap in the taxi, said he, when the matter was explained to him. Yes, that was a queer kind of a little thing. He looked at the secret agent in a knowing sort of way, and then proceeded. You can't keep track of everybody, no matter how hard you try. I've been noticing that Jap, because he was a Jap, ever since he came into this neighborhood. But I never give him credit for this. Have a cigar? suggested Ashton Kirk. The private watchman bit the end off the cigar and lit it with much care. I smoke a pipe most of the time, said he. But I like a cigar once in a while. He puffed it into a glow, and then went on. That taxi tonight turns around and starts down the street and around the corner toward Fordham Road. And just as it turns the corner, I notices a chicken standing there, a regular broiler with a veil on and a little bag in her mitt. She starts up Berkeley toward where I'm standing, but before she gets halfway, I heard the buzzing of the taxi once more. Around it came again into Berkeley, and shot up to the curb abreast of the girl. 
she stopped like a flash. The Jap threw open the door, and she gave a little yelp as though she was just about as glad as she'd ever been in her life. Then she jumped into the taxi, the door shut, and around the corner it whirled and was gone. "'There's no use talking,' said the speaker, and he shook his head in a way that convulsed the drug clerk. "'You can't never tell anything about human nature.' Ashton Kirk buttoned up his coat. "'In that,' said he, "'I thoroughly agree with you. "'Human nature is a thing which we can base little upon with safety.' Then to Fuller he added, "'Come, I think we have some work ahead of us.'" End of Chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter Twenty Fresh Developments. On the following morning, Ashton Kirk entered his study. A few moments later, Stumpf followed him bearing a cup of coffee. And while his employer sipped this, Stumpf gravely remonstrated. You should not work. You have had too little sleep. Has Purvis come in? asked the other, heedlessly. Yes, he is waiting. Then, not to be deterred, the man added, glancing at the patch of white plaster which covered the wound on his employer's head. You will be ill. You should rest. There is work which must be done, smiled Ashton Kirk. You don't always lay up yourself, Stumpf, when you are out of sorts. No, sir, replied the man, gravely. But this... Ask Purvis to come in. A few moments later, a young man with a prominent nose and a long chin came into the room. Good morning said he. I understand from Fuller that you wanted me last night. It did not matter as things turned out. My orders, said Purvis, were to follow any of the household. When Drevenoff left the place, I got after him according to instructions. But, with a disgusted air, would you believe it? I lost him. If Ashton Kirk was annoyed at this, he did not show it. How was that? he inquired. He boarded the train at Eastbury, explained Purvis, and I did the same. For the life of me, I don't know how he did it, for I thought I had my eye on him all along. But when the train reached the city, he was not on it. Perhaps he noticed me and took a desperate chance while the train was moving. O'Neill is at the Fordham Road house, said Ashton Kirk. I want you to relieve him at noon. Very good, said Purvis. Any instructions? Nothing more than that you are to keep track of anything that may happen. O'Neill is to relieve you again at midnight. When Purvis had taken his leave, Ashton Kirk rang for Fuller. That young man entered. In spite of his loss of sleep, he looked as brisk as ever. "'What about the motor cab?' asked the secret agent. "'I looked up the various stations. "'The nearest to Okiu's house is on Collingwood Avenue. "'I called them on the telephone, but could get no satisfaction. "'Then I paid them a visit, with better results. "'Okiu called a cab about midnight. "'Its driver's name is Freeman, and he lives on 19th Street. "'Having gone off duty, I thought he would probably be at his boarding house.' So I went there and was lucky enough to find him at home. Yes, he recalled the trip to Eastbury, and remembered perfectly that he had run his fare all the way to the city and to the railroad station. Then I went to the station. Again I was fortunate. A Jap, answering Okiu's description, had been sold two tickets at just about the time the taxi driver said he had reached the station. 
You inquired to what points the tickets were bought? Yes. And here Fuller's face expressed great satisfaction. They were for Washington. The secret agent arose to his feet, his singular eyes shining with excitement, his nostrils dilating like those of a thoroughbred facing the barrier. After a few turns up and down the room, he said, This looks like the last stage of the chase. We must win now or never. Washington, said Fuller, is headquarters for such things as that secret document. The embassies just yawn for them. There was a short pause. Ashton Kirk halted at a window and looked down at the eager, grubbing horde in the street. What have you heard from Burgess? he asked. He sent in a long written report this morning. It would seem that the flurry on Fordham Road was not the only one last night, or rather this morning. Fuller handed the other a number of folded sheets. They ran... I am sending this by messenger. Can't leave the job myself. About an hour ago, Karkowski got a call on the telephone. A man came to his room door and began hammering to wake him up. The phone is on the first floor. Karkowski hurried down to answer, and I followed him. He went into the booth. I couldn't hear what was said, but I could see him through the glass door. And if ever a man listened to anything with attention, he was that man. As I watched him, I could see that he grew more and more excited. Then he hung up and rushed out of the booth. The first thing he did was to snatch down a timetable from a rack. Skimming it over, he threw it aside and then was off upstairs. I managed to get possession of the timetable. It was a schedule of Washington trains. Just now, it looks as though my man were going to jump out for Washington. If he does, I'll call you. Burgess. So, said Ashton Kirk, as he laid the report upon the table. Our friend Karkowski also shows an interest in Washington. Has Burgess called as yet? Yes, I had a short talk with him a while ago. He was then at the station waiting for the train which Karkowski was to take. And, continued Fuller, he told me of something more. It seems that while he was waiting at the Low Street place for Karkowski to make a move, he thought he'd like to know who had the pole on the phone, and put him into such a state of mind. So he called the operator. This is such and such a number, he says. What number was that who just called me? It was so-and-so number, says the girl, after a little. All right says he. Give me that. Well, said Ashton Kirk. It was a tavern on Fordham Road, about a block from Morse's, said Fuller. The barkeeper answered. The only person he'd seen using the telephone was a young fellow who talked a foreign language, a Pole who lived at Morse's, the place he said where the man was killed a few nights ago. That was enough for Burgess, so he thanked the man and hung up. Drevenoff has heard something, smiled Ashton Kirk. Altogether, he seems a marvelously well-posted young man. There was some further talk between the two. Then Fuller went out, and Ashton Kirk continued to stand by the window, gazing down at the thronging, chaffering, noisy crowd. Large horses drew small loads, while small men staggered under large ones. Heady cries summoned those at a distance to the spots where bargains in faded vegetables or decaying fish were to be had. The stone steps of the houses were filled with men in hard hats and upturned coat collars. Women with their heads wrapped in knitted shawls peered out between the folds in stolid wonder. At length, he turned from the window, sat down in the wide-armed chair, 
and lighted the German pipe. Clouds began to gather above his head and to curl into the outer air. The rumble of wheels, the outcries of the drivers and hucksters, the undertone of those cautiously sparring for the advantage in a trade, stole into the room. However, he smoked on, oblivious. But when his pondering seemed at its deepest, and the corrugations between his eyes the most prominent, he suddenly struck the table a blow with his palm and leaped up. That's it, he cried. That's it! What an idiot I was not to think of it before! Putting aside the pipe, he took down a directory and began turning the pages rapidly. Now and then he made a rapid note upon a block of paper. Then he pushed the book away, descended the steps two at a time, and in the lower hall put on his hat. Stumpf, hurrying to be of some service, reached the hall just as the street door slammed, and through a window he saw Ashton Kirk with eager tread hurrying up the street. End of Chapter 20《Chapter 21 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 21 The Man with the Decoration It was rather late on the afternoon of the same day that Ashton Kirk accompanied by young Fuller, entered a government building at Washington. Apparently the secret agent was expected, for he was ushered into the same superbly appointed office as upon his former visit, and the same ruddy-faced, white-haired official greeted him. So, said the latter, the hunt has brought you here. Ashton Kirk tossed his gloves and hat upon the desk and shook hands. That, said he, is now the status of the affair. It's a hunt. And the pack is an assorted one and in full cry. We received your wire yesterday, and the department's agents at once went to work. Is there any result? Nothing marked. But surely they have located the girl. Oh, yes, of course. She did not make the slightest attempt to hide. As soon as she arrived in the city, she went to the Tillengast and placed her own name upon the register. And since arriving there, she has not once gone out. Any visitors? No. But about noon, a message arrived for her. And our man recognized the messenger as one connected with, curiously enough, the German Embassy. The German Embassy. A peculiar expression came into the face of Ashton Kirk. He sat looking at the secretary for a moment, and then the latter saw a slow smile gradually creep about his mouth. He took a notebook from his pocket and glanced at some memoranda. Of course, said he after a moment, you have the names and biographies of the various persons attached to the foreign embassies. To be sure. If it is not too much trouble, I should like to see a list of the German officials. The secretary touched a bell. An attendant heard his wants, disappeared, and in a few moments reappeared, placing a small book upon the desk. The secret agent took it up, and his long, inquiring finger ran down a column of names. Von Mark, he read. Stelsner, Koenig, Dietz. Then the finger paused. Von Steinmetz, said he. Page 29. He turned the pages until he came to the one indicated, and what he found there he read with attention. When he had finished, he laid the volume upon the desk. 
To have Germany drawn into this matter, said he, will, of course, complicate matters. You expect that she will be drawn into it? And the secretary looked at him inquiringly. The secret agent nodded, and the secretary continued. To have a certain document fall into her hands might lead to nothing, and then again it might lead to a great deal. He sat pondering for a moment. Then his ruddy face lighted up, and he said, Pardon me a moment. He called for a number on the telephone, and chatted with Ashton Kirk while he waited. When the connection was made, he said into the receiver, Did I understand that you have Stelsner for tonight? There was a pause while the answer was being made. Then he proceeded, evidently well satisfied. Very well. Then you may expect an additional guest. Goodbye. He turned from the telephone and settled back in his chair. My wife is giving a dinner tonight, said he. I do not know all her arrangements, but I can promise you an excellent dinner and a most distinguished company. Also, and there was a significant look in his eyes as he said it, there will be a person present who will interest you a great deal. I shall be delighted to eat your dinner and meet your distinguished company, laughed Ashton Kirk. But above all, I am desirous of meeting the person who will interest me. At their hotel a little later, Ashton Kirk discussed the situation with his aide. Fuller listened with amazement. But, he cried, when the other had done. This sounds preposterous. Why should Miss Corbin desire to deal with the German embassy in a matter which she planned with Okiu? Before we make up our minds that she did plan with Okiu, said Ashton Kirk, let us look further. As it stands, we are not at all assured of it. Assured? Fuller stared in astonishment. Have you forgotten her secret conference with the Japanese that day at the window? Have you forgotten the talk Ninon heard between the girl and her lover on the stairs? Have you forgotten the presence of that lover in Okiyu's house when you were all but trapped in his desperate attempt upon your life? And surely the girl's own attempt in the matter of the communicating gas pipe has not escaped you? I'd say the girl's own attempt because it was she who urged the man on. And above all, the matter of the taxicab must still be fresh in your memory. As soon as she was possessed of the paper, she made at once for Okiu's. And he was waiting for her. Did she not get into the cab with him? Did they not drive to the railway station? Did he not buy two tickets for Washington? Is she not here? Fuller was tense with excitement. His eyes snapped as he made each point. And for all, he added in amazement, you seem to doubt that she was concerned in the matter with the Japanese. I merely asked if we were assured that she was so concerned, said he, quietly. No case is built upon appearances alone. They merely point out things which should be examined. The results of this latter are the threads which, when woven together, make the case complete. An hour or two later, the secret agent was set down at the handsome residence of the secretary, and upon entering found that genial gentleman in the midst of a knot of his dinner guests, and was warmly greeted by both he and his wife. As soon as he decently could, the host drew Ashton Kirk aside. That round, rosy little man with the decoration upon his coat is your interesting person, suggested he. We shall put you as close to him as we can. The secret agent examined the little man, who was possessed of a gleaming bald head, a cheerful manner, and a pronounced German accent. And while he was so doing, the secretary went on. As I said this afternoon, I am not always acquainted with my wife's arrangements. And now I find that we are also to have Matsadi, and Matsade, if you are not already aware of the fact, is the Japanese minister's right-hand man. I have heard him mentioned, said Ashton Kirk. 
and I understand that he is clever. He has a wonderful touch, scarcely perceptible and unusually successful. At the table, Ashton Kirk found himself near to Matsadi and opposite the rosy little German. The Japanese was spare and narrow-faced. He wore glasses, talked little, and ate less. But he seemed keenly alive to all that was said and done. His diffident smile approved of everything. The little German ate a great deal, and drank quite a bit more, and he talked ceaselessly. As the dinner progressed, he grew rosier than ever. His eyes and his bald dome seemed trying to outshine his decoration. There was a chuckle in his voice when he addressed his host, which was often, and his head nodded humorously over what were evidently intended as thickly veiled allusions. But as the secretary paid little attention to his sayings, the German began to direct his remarks to Matsadi. The latter replied with a courteous reserve, which seemed to amuse the German vastly. Sometimes he shook, like a portly mold of gelatin. Ach, Himmel, said he, nodding to Ashton Kirk, whose eye he happened to catch. Some the sense of humor have not. As for me, always do I laugh, whether the joke is on me or not. You are to be envied, replied the secret agent. The little man cocked his eye at Matsadi in a most knowing manner. I have heard it said that the race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, he said. Was it a psalmist, a prophet, or a poet of our own time who so spoke? But no matter, it is very good, but not complete. One might add that the reward is not always to the industrious. Observing that he was being spoken to, the Japanese leaned forward. I beg your pardon, said he, inquiringly. There is philosophy in the vine, observed the German. And he added to the luster of his brilliant scalp by rubbing it with a handkerchief. Then with me, its wisdom stays upon the tongue. The Japanese smiled sedately. I have noticed that, said he. The other laughed and quivered with all his round little body. Good, said he. I was in hopes that you would wake up. Then he went on in a sort of musing tone, but with dancing eyes. Many a man has toiled early and late to make a plant fruitful, and the result of his work is that some idle one who laughs and drinks and snaps his fingers at labor, has the ripened fruit fall into his lap. Matsadi seemed not to grasp the meaning of this. At any rate, he smiled in a vague sort of way, and contented himself with nodding his head. Very little passed between them after this, as the Japanese had his attention taken by the lady beside him. But later, in the coat room, Ashton Kirk heard him say to the German, Your simile of the industrious planter and the vagabond was a very excellent one. And it frequently happened so. I was much struck with it. A young man, wearing a number of Austrian orders, said, as he was being helped on with his coat, Are you going to von Stunenberg's Matsadi? Perhaps I could give you a lift. Thank you, said the Japanese. Yes, I had thought of going. I'll wait for you, said the other, as he went out. Matsadi took up his gloves and hat. He paused before the laughing German. Yes, said he, and there was a thoughtful look upon his face. Your parable was a good one. But does the story always end so? as the idle one lifts the fruit to his greedy lips. Do I not see the patient toiler reaching out to snatch it from him? And as Matsadi hurried after the Austrian, the portly little man chuckled.